I just really just want to get up and get it. Because I think we'll be warm if I have to like run a protest. And sitting kills me. Power is already in kitchen. Although a heating pad might be up. It's a blanket around the heat pad.
But we're here today because George Floyd is not here. Tens of thousands of Americans have taken to the street for more than a week of nationwide unrest. I believe the evidence available to us now supports the stronger charge of second degree murder for the death of George Floyd. A person charged with a crime has a right to a fair trial before an impartial judge and an impartial jury. We are watching the Hennepin County Courthouse in Minneapolis for the high-profile murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. This is a Washington Post special report. I'm Rhonda Colvin. Libby Casey is off this week. Opening statements start at the top of the hour for a case that ignited a global discussion about race and policing. Chauvin was filmed with his knee pinning George Floyd's neck to the ground for nearly nine minutes. Among Floyd's final words were, I can't breathe sparking international outrage over the killing of the 46-year-old black man. With me this morning, Eugene Scott, reporter for The Fix, James Homan, Washington Post columnist, and Holly Bailey, national political reporter, joining us on the phone from Minneapolis. Let's start with Holly, who joins us from the courthouse. Holly, first, take us through the charges against Derek Chauvin. Um, Derek Chauvin is um, charged with second and third degree murder and uh, second-degree manslaughter in the death of George Floyd. Um, basically, prosecutors are going to argue that his use of force um, was excessive and contributed to George Floyd's death. They don't have to prove that his knee on George Floyd's neck was the sole thing that, that killed the man, but that it contributed to his death. So that is sort of where we're, where we're beginning today. So this is opening statements today. If you can walk us through what we can expect to happen in the courtroom today. Essentially, it's going to begin, um, the first thing that's going to happen this morning is that they're going to finalize a jury. Um, because the, the courthouse is under, under social, social distancing um, requirements, they are going to seat a jury of 14 people. Um, that's 12 people plus two alternates. Currently, they have 15 people. So Judge Cahill is expected to dismiss one of those people this morning and then sort of finalize the jury. And then we're going to be hearing um, from the prosecutors first. Uh, our understanding is that um, Jerry Blackwell, who is a special prosecutor in the case, will speak um, just over an hour presenting, sort of laying out their argument um, to what they're going to try to prove over in the next three or four weeks. Um, that's going to be followed by Eric Nelson, who is Chauvin's defense attorney, and we're understood that he's going to speak for another about a little less than an hour so that's going to take up most of the day but it's you know there's a chance that we're possibly even going to get to some witnesses today now today takes place after a couple weeks of jury selection and i know you were covering that as well um what did you notice about chauvin's demeanor in these proceedings i noticed while i was watching it that he took a lot of notes uh, he was very present when his uh, counsel questioned the uh, potential jurors what stood out to you about how his demeanor has been in the last few weeks well i think one of the striking things about this case is one and you know that we have not heard from Derek Chauvin at all, um, except through for sort of arguments that his attorney has been making in court papers. His family has been silent, and Chauvin himself has said nothing about the case, including after he was released on bail this past fall. Immediately, call. Lauren, um, interrupter. And so, essentially, uh, you know, we're you know, people have been sort of staring at him in the courtroom to try to judge what's been going on. And, and as you mentioned, he has been taking extensive notes. Um, I was in the courtroom last week, and one thing that I noticed is that he is—he seems to be really taking an active role in his defense. Holly, when they I'm were, so you know, sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt you for a, a few minutes. About, we're going to go now to um, uh, outside of the courtroom, where the family's attorney, the Floyd family's attorney, Ben Crump, uh, is there with the family holding a press conference. Four week justice to jur to, to justice—a four-week journey to justice. We have. His cousins, uh, Sharita Tate, Tedra McGee, Kara Brown. We have his nephew, Brandon Williams. We have his brothers, Rodney Floyd and Felonis Floyd. His sister, 
Bridget Floyd is en route. And we know just in his daughter Gianna is also here in Minneapolis today. Today starts a landmark trial that will be a referendum on how far America has come in its quest for equality and justice for all. It will be prima facie evidence this trial of Derek Chauvin regarding the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, right here in Minneapolis, it will be prima facie evidence whether America is going to live up to the Declaration of Independence. Now, I know everybody can quote the Declaration of Independence, but this trial is going to provide evidence of whether we really believe it when we say we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that amongst them are life and liberty in the pursuit of happiness. Well, America, that means black people too. America, that means George Floyd too. And for all of those people, Reverend Al, who continue to say that this is such a difficult trial, that this is such a hard trial, well, we rebuke that. Listen. Because we know if George Floyd was a white American citizen and he suffered this painful, torturous death with a police officer knee on his neck, nobody, nobody, nobody would be saying this is a hard case. Right. And when people ask you that, activists, and the family thanks the activists, when people ask you, well, isn't this a tough case? Because they're going to try to say George Floyd had a trace amount of drugs in his system. You let them know that Ben Crump said that George Floyd was living, breathing, walking, and talking just fine just yeah, until the fine. police put him face down and put him in handcuffs and put a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. So this murder case is not hard when you watch that torture video of George Floyd. Y'all understand? Yeah. This murder case is not hard when you watch that torture video of George Floyd. And we have to call it what is it. It was torture. Even under the Geneva Convention definition, this was torture. And Derek Chauvin should be held criminally liable for the death of George Floyd. You know, we, the civil lawyers, made sure that George Floyd family got their civil justice under the Seventh Amendment, Tony, with the historic $27 million settlement that not only included compensation for the family, but also policy reform, and that is important, but that's only part of the justice. George Floyd, just like any other citizen, his family is deserving of whole justice, full justice. That means that the state and the agents of the government should hold individuals who commit crimes accountable under the 10th Amendment, and black people in America should not only have to get partial justice. We 
have every right to get whole justice, whole justice. civil justice, and criminal justice. Nobody questioned when the Diamond family got a $20 million settlement this time. that that white family should not also get criminal justice. So why is it that we will question in 2021 whether black people in America can get whole justice as well under the Seventh Amendment and the 10th Amendment? We're not asking for anything extraordinary. We're asking for equal justice under the law. And newsflash, newsflash, breaking news. We expect in just a few minutes, you're going to hear opening arguments, and they're going to take the playbook out, Reverend Allen. They're going to try to assassinate the character of George Floyd. For Lonis, they're going to call your brother everything for the child of God. And they're going to talk about as much as they can about his record. But his record isn't an issue. All right. Because this is the trial of Derek Chauvin. Come on. Breaking news. This is the trial of Derek Chauvin. Let's talk about his record. All right. His 19 complaints of excessive force on, by bro. citizens here in Minneapolis. That's what we should be talking about. George Floyd didn't kill anybody. Derek Chauvin was the person that killed George Floyd. So why is it we will allow them to assassinate the character of George Floyd after they assassinated his person? Y'all, they taught me in law school that if you have the facts on your side, then by all means, argue the facts. But then they say, if the facts ain't really with you, then try to assassinate your opponent's character as a way to hopefully distract everybody from focusing in on the facts. Well, everybody, please do not be distracted. The facts are simple. What killed George Floyd was an overdose of excessive force. Come on, bro. The transcript from the autopsies are clear. The manner and cause of death was asphyxiation by homicide. Falona said in the hood, they choked him. It was a knee choke. And so let's remember the facts here. This murder case is not hard. Just look at the torture video of George Floyd. When anybody asks you, remind them, this murder case is not hard. Just look at the torture video of George Floyd, the most viewed murder of a police on a citizen in the history of the world. It has been viewed just in over 50 million times on YouTube and probably as many more times on cable television. Everybody has saw this video. What we want to know is will we see justice? The whole world is watching. The whole world is watching. So you're going to hear from attorney Tony Ramanucci, attorney Justin Miller, and attorney Jeff Starr. And then you're going to hear from the family of George Floyd. And then after that, you're going to hear from our civil rights leader, America's civil rights leader, Al Sharpton. We're trying to time it where we can get it right at 8 minutes and 46, 846. And we're going to try to keep time. And then Reverend Al, after he gives us our call to action, we're going to take a knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And hopefully everybody within the sound of his voice will join us in taking that need to understand what George Floyd went through the last minutes and seconds of his life. Without further ado, Attorney Tony Ramanucci, a great, great lawyer, 
from Chicago, Illinois. That was Benjamin Crump, attorney for the Floyd family, saying a landmark case in the fight for equality starts today. With me this morning, my Washington Post colleagues, Eugene Scott and James Homan. I'd like to get both of you to weigh on uh, what Benjamin Crump just said. One of the things he started off with is saying that this trial is a, a referendum on the judicial system, its treatment of blacks and race in general. Uh, James, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the key line there, Rhonda, was please don't get distracted. And, and I thought the most powerful moment of that was uh, when Ben Crump turned to George Floyd's brother and said, they're going to call your late brother everything but a child of God. And, uh, and then he said, you know, the, they, why should we allow them to assassinate George Floyd's character when they already assassinated him as a person and, and added that it was a, an overdose of lethal force. So this is previewing what we expect to hear from the defense lawyer, Eric Nelson, uh, when he makes his opening statement later today, and and they're trying to preempt that because they they know the defense strategy uh, that was clear from jury selection and from other public statements, which is that they're going to try to put George Floyd on trial, not Derek Chauvin on trial. The Floyd family pushing back aggressively and preemptively. And Eugene, your reaction to this? Uh, I noticed that Benjamin Crump, just as James mentioned, uh, he's trying to get ahead of what we're all expecting to hear, that the defense is going to uh, perhaps assassinate the character of George Floyd, bring in uh, drug addiction issues, bring in his past, and it seems the family's attorney wants people to know, uh, to brace themselves for that. And, you know, with a trial, of course, the only people who have to be convinced of anything are the jurors. But is that argument going to help in the, um, in the realm of public opinion, where this case is going to be so closely watched by people around the world, and uh, it may be found upsetting to uh, listen to uh, George Floyd's character be uh, part of the focus? Well, Benjamin Crump is certainly hoping that is the case. One of the things that became very clear in his opening statement is that not only does he not want people to focus on George Floyd's past and his history, he wants people to get much bigger than this individual case. He made it very clear that this uh, situation was symptomatic of bigger issues in the criminal justice system and in law enforcement in America and maybe even globally. Uh, he made the points that he certainly believes that had George Floyd not been a black man that this would not have happened. Uh, there was some concern about just how early would race be introduced uh, into this uh, situation, into this trial. Uh, and it's very clear that it was going to be introduced very early because uh, George Floyd's family and his defense and, uh, and, so, and so many of his uh, supporters and, and defenders uh, believe that his race played a huge part, if not uh, the primary part, in why he is no longer with us. And so Benjamin Crump wanted people to focus on not just that in this case, but how this is just the latest name, or at least at that time was the latest name, the latest hashtag on social media and a long history of black people being killed by law enforcement. Hmm. Let's go live now to Minneapolis where our reporter Joyce Coe is outside of the Hennepin County Courthouse. Joyce, what are things like on the ground there? Good morning, Rhonda. We are right outside of the courthouse where this trial will be taking place. Um, just to my right here, there are dozens of members of the media that have gathered around um, hearing what uh, George Floyd's family this morning, as well as their attorney uh, and Reverend Al Sharpton, have to say uh, prior to the opening arguments. We heard Benjamin Crump, uh, the family attorney, saying just moments ago that this is, quote, a landmark trial, a referendum on how far America has come on, on its quest for equality equality and justice for all. We also heard from activists and protesters over the course of the last several days as the city is bracing for this, uh, the opening arguments in this trial to begin. Uh, we talked to some protesters who were out over the course of uh, yesterday here in downtown Minneapolis demonstrating. And, and among the protesters and activists that we spoke to, there is uh, I think many would call it a cautious optimism, but even uh, going beyond that, there's almost a reluctance of hoping that this time could be any different from the cases uh, that we have seen in the past. Take a listen to a bit of what they had to say. Hey, hey, ho, ho, say Derek Chauvin has got to go, hey, hey. You know, I really want to be optimistic, but I've been doing this for a long time, and so unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm not feeling like I don't want to hype myself up for justice, you know? The whole system has got I'm expecting to see George Floyd criminalized and potentially the <laughs> officer walk. It seems like the city is expecting the worst or preparing for the worst, so that's what I encourage 
everyone else to be prepared for the worst. Anything better than that comes, that'll be a pleasant surprise. I think what's different now is that the cameras are in the courtrooms. People, attention and eyes are on the injustices that we've been raising attention to. One of the things that the community is very cautious of is the fact that Officer Chauvin is on trial, not George Floyd. Came down here for justice and a conviction. I have my attorney crumb with me. We're here just hoping for the best. You heard George Floyd's brother there. You heard George Floyd's brother there, Philonis uh, Floyd, saying that he is hoping for the best, that they came down here for a conviction. Uh, and as the family speaks, we will gather more information on what they have to say. Uh, and as you heard activists talking about not just uh, bracing for the outcome of this trial, but really listening in to see how George Floyd is characterized. They are concerned uh, that he will be characterized in a way that doesn't um, necessarily reflect him. As, as you heard one of the activists say in that that piece there that it is uh, Derek Chauvin that is on trial, not George Floyd. Rhonda. Thanks, Joyce, for that. Uh, joining me now, Keith Alexander, who has covered courts and crime for more than 11 years here at The Post. Uh, Keith, good to be with you this morning. Uh, first off, you know, a lot of people, they, they think maybe you should tune into uh, the verdict day, that that's the important day. But tell us, as, as a court reporter, why is opening statements day really something to watch? You know, on opening statements, this is the time when prosecutors and the defense, but mainly, mainly prosecutors, because the burden is on the prosecution to prove uh, this case. So it's their time to lay out all of the evidence and to really put uh, a, a, a stamp on what they are trying to prove and what they plan on proving during this trial. It's during this time when they will present bits and pieces of all of the evidence that they say proves that Chauvin actually did go outside the boundaries of his training and killed uh, George Floyd. Um, and that's what they're going to lay out. They're going to show that Floyd went outside of what he was trained to do as a police officer and as a result of failure, of failing to adhere to that training, uh, George Floyd died. And of course, the defense is going to argue, well, no, it was the fact that George Floyd had drugs in his system. Um, he had drugs even back in 2019. And recently, uh, the judge allowed some of that to come in. And when Floyd was stopped in 2019 and, and he was arrested in a, in, a, in a stop and had a, a high level of drugs and paramedics said at that time, his blood pressure and his heart rate was elevated because of the drugs and they were going to show but it was the drugs that led uh, to Floyd's death. And Keith, I just want to point out that uh, on a split screen we have right now is uh, the family's attorney and also George Floyd's family is behind him and we are expecting them to speak shortly. So if I interrupt you, um, uh, please forgive me. But I really want your take on the jury, the makeup of this jury, because that's that's pretty important given that this was a widely viewed event. A viral video is at the base of this trial. So many people uh, saw it, uh, including most of the jurors. So if we could bring up a, a graphic that we have of the the makeup of this jury it shows the uh the num jury numbers and and the race that we uh know and as well as a age range as well so we have uh nine women six men uh nine people are white four black jurors and two multiracial women uh, there's a nurse there's a chemist two of the black men immigrated uh to minnesota nearly a decade ago uh, and then some people also reported that they have family and friends who are officers. So this jury does have a, a lot of different perspectives. But um, the racial makeup of it is interesting because Hennepin County is about 75% white and it's half and half women and, and men. Uh, so that's the gender breakdown. So what are your takeaways when you look at the diversity of this jury? You know, it, what strikes me immediately is that this jury seems much more diverse than the actual community um, for which they are drawn from. And that's very interesting. Um, what we want to see here are a couple of things. You know, the two uh, African men, uh, they are, again, they're immigrants. Um, and when they, when they interviewed as jurors, um, they spoke about having, sounding very pro-police, um, uh, which was something that obviously that the defense really liked to, to hear. Um, what's also very interesting is that they talked about, all the jurors talked about, you know, 
they, they, they saw the video, they heard about the video, but they were able to make a educated uh, uh, decision regarding their verdict once they look at all of the evidence. However, when they talked about whether or not they had any uh, bias against police one way or the other, um, that is when they were dismissed, the jurors were dismissed if they admitted to the fact that they had concerns about police officers or they or their family members or friends had any negative interactions with police officers. And that is striking because moving across this country years to come, you're gonna find a lot of people of color are going to talk about whether or not either they themselves or family or friends have had negative interactions with police. But the, the issue is, can you still put all of that aside and just look at the evidence and decide on a verdict based solely on the evidence, just like if you had seen the video or heard about the case. And that to me was interesting that these people, a lot of jurors were dismissed because they articulate the fact that they or their family or their friends have had negative interactions with police. But in terms of all the racial issues, um, in terms of the, the diversity of the jurors, that is really striking. The fact that this jury pool uh, uh, is much more diverse than the community from which they, they came from. And Keith, if you can hang on one moment, we're gonna go back to Minneapolis where the Floyd family is holding their press conference. You know, we're here from Houston, Texas, Kenny Holmes. Our brother George Floyd represents our embodied third board Houston in any ghetto around America. You know, we, we represent all of them. We are one. And we came to Minnesota to, to better himself. And he had a great, he had a lot of great things going. Like he fell in love with the city. He fell in love with the people. And he was a, he was a trucker school. And um, you know, Minnesota offered so much to him. And so, so George Floyd came to this city to make a better way for himself. And unfortunately. Mr. Sharp, y'all seen the video, eight minutes and 46 seconds, we on our brother's neck. Y'all, please, do not be entertained by the lie that they gonna throw out on them. Do not be entertained by the lie. The truth is, he was killed in the streets. He came to reach to make a better way for himself, and unfortunately, Mr. Sharp, so please y'all keep that in mind he was murdered in the streets. They can't sweep this under the rug. Come on, George Floyd, Philando Castile, they were all killed by officers that were sworn to protect us. Many others who I can't name is so many throughout America. But one thing I can tell you, we will get justice. We will not allow Derek Chauvin, Tal, and his crew to be the judge the prosecutor and the executor. Mm. All right. If we can't get justice for a black man here in America, Tell it. we will get justice everywhere else in America. Tell it. This is a starting point. This is not a finishing point. We will be around the world to get justice for all others, meaning in Brazil, London, Ghana, anywhere we have to go to because the shade of your skin shouldn't be a death sentence. It. America is watching. Just like this press, many shows, court TV, they would display everything. Just like when this man had his knee on my brother's neck 
for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. It was a motion cinema picture. Everybody seen it. You had to be blind if you didn't see it. A blind man heard a man being tortured to death. Thank you all. Now, Brandon Williams, his nephew, who was like a son to him. Every time we come to Minnesota, we've been here a few times since the original day on May 25th. It's never easy. But I think I can speak for us all when I say that this trip was a lot easier. We came here for one thing and one thing only. We came to get justice right. and nothing less. Mm. We came to get justice. Tell it! When you think about May 25th, and seeing my uncle lay on the ground, not resisting the rest, calling for his mother with a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds and never ever did no one think to render aid to say hey maybe this guy's telling the truth he really can't breathe so as being said if this trial is hard we got two justice systems in america one for white america and one for black america and we can't have that Tell it. So, I think today is definitely the starting point. This change is long overdue in this country. This can go all the way back to Roger King. Mm. As my uncle said, a blind man can see this. Yes, sir. A blind man can see that that was murder. Tell it. Despite anything that they say about my uncle, that was murder. Tell it. So either they weren't trained and qualified to do their job, or they intended on taking his life. Either way, we need justice. Yes, sir. And I think throughout this whole trial, that's one word that you'll hear me and my family say a lot. Justice. Somebody needs to be held accountable. Yes, sir. You mean to tell me if he didn't encounter Derek Chauvin that day, that he would have still died? No. No. Tell it. Anybody out here standing here today believe that? It's still a problem in America. Yes, sir. A problem that needs to be addressed and addressed today. You know, we can't get George Floyd back. But what we can do is make sure that no family feels this pain and suffering that we feel. His daughter won't have a father in her life. His brothers won't have a big brother to love and protect him the way that he did. Somebody needs to be held accountable. Yes, sir. And we're going to demand that. Thank you. And uh, the last brother you will hear from. You heard the family of George Floyd in a pre-trial press conference saying that America is watching and that this trial is just the beginning. I'm Rhonda Colvin, and I'm joined by my Washington Post colleagues, James Homan, Eugene Scott, and national reporter Tim Craig now joins us. Tim, good morning to you. Um, you've been doing some reporting on how uh, black people who have experienced police violence, how they're viewing today and, and the trial in itself. What are they telling you? Well, I, I, I think everyone is viewing this trial, especially if you are um, a minority or black or brown, through their own personal experiences in their own life and their own expectations. And in some cases, people have faced what they believe to be their own acts of police brutality um, against them. So they're, they're paying particularly close attention to this trial um, with sort of a sense of anticipation and dread as well about what the outcome is really going to be. Yeah, in your report, you wrote a story about Sophia Satchel, a woman who is now fighting for justice for George Floyd. Tell us what she told you about her experience and why today is really important for her. Well, she was actually in, um, in South Florida five months before uh, George Floyd's death. She had her own encounter with police in um, Miami-Dade County in Miami Gardens, Florida, where she was in a, sm a fairly minor dispute inside a nightclub that escalated to a uh, encounter with a, a police officer who ended up, you know, dragging her out of her vehicle, um, tasing her in her stomach three times, and actually kneeling his own knee into her neck. Um, she, where she felt like she could not breathe. And again, this is five months before the George Floyd situation. In her case, she ended up being the one charged in that matter and was facing some pretty serious charges out of that until her lawyer successfully pushed to get the charges dropped. But that was not till after the George Floyd case went public 
um, in a big way and sparked, you know, Black Lives Matter protests around the country. So she really believes that had this George Floyd case not happened, she could have actually been in jail for something that she believes she was strongly the victim of. And I think that's just an example of how um, African Americans and Black Americans around the country are sort of turning back to their own experiences as they wait for the trial to proceed and also for the verdict, which will be, you know, I wait. think, very consequential to their lives. We heard one of the family members just now reference uh, this trial in relation to the Rodney King trial and verdict and the protests that came after that. Um, also in your article, you talked about um, how criminal justice experts are viewing this case. They say it's a, a pretty historical case right now. Tell us more about that. Yeah, many, crim many um, criminal justice experts do also cite back to at least the Rodney King verdict in 19. 92 as sort of a, a bellwether for how this um, trial will uh, compare. But others go even farther. They go even back to the 1950s, 1960s to some of the, the hot um, or the consequential civil rights uh, cases in that era as sort of a bellwether for what they view this case could be uh, judged against. Um, there was the Emmett Till trial, the 14 year old boy who was lynched um, by a, a white mob that all got um, released or not convicted. And some have eventually even gone back to that case in the 1950s as sort of, you know, where this case could compare historically. I'd like to bring Eugene Scott in on this as well. Um, Eugene, a headline in our paper said that many view the case as a barometer of racial change in the United States. Uh, to you, is that a, a fair and correct assessment? And, and specifically, this is putting a lot of burden on these 15 jurors right now that they're sort of holding up, uh, you know, racial inequality uh, in America on their shoulders right now. Well, I believe it's pretty fair to say that there has been no uh, situation in the last few years since uh, the origin of the Black Lives Matter movement that has attracted as much attention. Um, as George Floyd in as short amount of time. I mean, we saw last summer uh, streets just filled all over the country and not just in cities that have large black populations. There were protests uh, against police brutality following uh, the killing of George Floyd in, in places like Wyoming and, and Utah and North Dakota, places that have not had uh, large numbers of people advocating against police violence against black people. And so uh, it is a belief that perhaps this could lead to some type of reckoning uh, that goes from the streets into the judicial system. Um, and whether or not that would actually happen, uh, depend, it's going to happen, depends on your level of optimism or cynicism or hope or your view of past history or your assessment of the facts or, or just so many other factors. But this was a situation that most people looked at as changing uh, the outlook of quite a few individuals who perhaps previously were not engaged on this issue and whether or not this will actually lead to something as far uh, as a conviction remains to be seen. And uh, Tim, back to you, I'd like to ask you how local communities are taking this all in. You went to Miami Gardens, uh, you spoke to the woman you just described to us, but that's also the home of Trayvon Martin, which we all remember that being a very closely watched case as well. Um, how are local communities bracing themselves right now for this trial and what it could mean once a verdict comes out? Well, I think, I think that you have to sort of separate local communities versus the, the local population. I think many, uh, and uh, people are just now focusing on this trial. They, they know very well about the George Floyd case. Everyone has seen the video from last summer or last spring. But I think now people today and tomorrow, they're going to start really focusing and, and realizing that, oh, this trial is starting. And then the next question becomes is, what is the outcome of this trial? Um, and what does that mean for the, the sort of what we saw last summer when we saw a protest? Um, I and I think they're looking, everyone's looking sort of as the, the model of what happened in 1992 as a possible, you know, outcome if the trial would go a certain way. I don't know, though, if anyone's sort of taking steps yet to actually prepare for something like that. But I think that's something in the back of everyone's mind is, does this in some way reignite the racial injustice protest that we saw last uh, summer? I think at the very least, you could see problems in Minneapolis where this all took place. Now, the question remains, though, would, could there be some sort of national, national wide um, protest or violence if the officers are acquitted? 
Yeah, and James, uh, Tim is bringing up an important point about we may see protests in Minneapolis, and you are from Minneapolis. Uh, you understand uh, the ground there and what's happening. How are people taking this all in, the magnitude of this case happening in their backyard and the potential for a lot of protests in the next few weeks? Yeah, the, the city is certainly on edge and deeply riven over this. The consequences continue to reverberate. Uh, the area around what's now called George Floyd Square, uh, where this happened, uh, the, the police have essentially stopped policing there because uh, there are barricades put up and, and there's confrontation. They've been trying to de-escalate. But the result is that there actually has been a pretty significant uh, increase in crime since last summer. Uh, that has, has made the quality of life in the city less good. Uh, and then more than 200 members of the Minneapolis Police Department have actually left. So the city charter in Minneapolis allows there to be 888 officers, and it's now down about 650, uh, about two about 650. And that's because uh, a lot of police officers are going and taking jobs in, in the suburbs uh, and leaving the city. So the, the, this is all happening against the backdrop not only of Rodney King and Philando Castile, who was also mentioned by George Floyd's brother, but also against the, the very tangible uh, changes in the city over the last nine months. Mm. And Tim, given your reporting, uh, what are some things you're going to be watching for today as this starts? Well, I think everyone sort of, the, the one thing I hear when I was out talking to people was they wanted to see it, make sure that the jury was fair. And I think that's, especially from African Americans' perspective, I think they saw during the jury selection that I think they feel more comfortable that the jury is going to be fair. But I think that's what people want is they want a sense that this is going to be a fair proceeding. Um, at the heart of it, there's plenty of skepticism within the you know United States, especially minority communities, about um, criminal justice issues and trial issues and policing issues. And I think at this time they just want to see a fair trial and believe whatever the outcome is that they believe that you know, they got a fair shot um, and believe in what they believe should happen here. And uh, Tim, uh, I noticed that the woman that you spoke to, uh, there was video present of her encounter. Uh, video, of course, changed everything when it came to the George Floyd uh, situation. Um, what are you thinking about it in terms of how important video has become in cases of police violence? Well, I mean, I think it's obviously cr crucial. And I mean, I think that's also sh shaping, you know, I think a lot of people think if it wasn't the video, would this case, would we even be here today with as we are um, getting ready for a, a historic trial? And I think the answer is probably quite possibly no. So I think, I mean, it's clear in, in these high profile cases that video has sort of reshaped not only the legal consequences for those caught on video, but also I think the public image and public relations con consequences for actions and how the public sees this thing. I was surprised when I was in Miami Gardens, for example, that you know you, you kind of expect to hear a lot of cynicism and a lot of skepticism about whether um, there's gonna be a conviction. But I was surprised at how many people said, no, this time they think there will be a conviction. They saw the video, everyone saw the video, and they say to, to, that, to them, you know, um, they believe that the video is overwhelming evidence that there's no way he will get off. So that, that may set up unrealistic expectations when you look at, you know, the, we all know how the criminal justice and the legal system works, but I was surprised that so many people see the video and they say to them, it's a sign that there will be a conviction. All right, thank you so much, Tim, for joining us and sharing your reporting. Um, James, one important point that I don't think we've mentioned today is that this is the state against Chauvin. This is not the Floyd family against Derek Chauvin that we are going to be watching soon. Um, and, and the state attorney general is going to be leading the prosecution's case, Keith Ellison. He's a former congressman. Uh, he's now the uh, top lawyer there in Minnesota. What do we know about him? And also, what does that signal uh, that Minnesota is using its attorney general to take on this case? Yeah, Rhonda, Keith Ellison, a major national figure, he was a candidate for chairman of the Democratic National Committee uh, a few years back. He uh, was a, a very prominent Bernie Sanders supporter. Uh, he's very much on the liberal side of the Democratic Party. Uh, he narrowly won his, his attorney general's race, uh, left Congress just because he didn't see a, a path uh, to rising into leadership there. Uh, so he is a, a very high profile figure. His son is actually uh, a leader of the defund the police movement on the Minneapolis City Council uh, as well. And, uh, and, and it's not just Keith Ellison. 
uh, who has been involved, who's been in the courtroom. Uh, there are uh, s kind of several, uh, I, I think that by one count, there were 14 different lawyers uh, who were kind of lawyers of record for the prosecution. There's only two lawyers of record on the defense side. And part of it is that people like Neil Cattell uh, from Hogan and Lovells, which is John Roberts' former law firm, big uh, white shoe DC law firm, uh, a bunch of their associates are helping pro bono with the prosecution. And then the partners at the biggest law firms in Minneapolis are helping too, uh, again, for the prosecution. So it is sort of a role reversal. Uh, when you think back to a year ago, Derek Chauvin was the representative of the state. He was there, uh, you know, with with his badge uh, and and using the force of of the government against uh, George Floyd. And now, very much the force of the state, the state of Minnesota, is uh, is is marshaled against uh, Derek Chauvin. So it's a it's a it's a dramatic role reversal. Everyone in Minnesota is watching this trial. Uh, Keith Ellison is up for re-election next year, so he knows that this has huge consequences for him. Okay, we are going back now to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Reverend Al Sharpton is urging protesters to kneel for eight minutes and 46 seconds to show solidarity with George Floyd, who was seen internationally on video being pinned to the pavement by Derek Chauvin for that amount of time. Down in the front. Slow down. Down in the front. Hey, down! Hey, get down! Relax, man. Down! Still photographer. Still Hey, your buddy's in the trap, Brad. I'm gone. Still down. Down, guys. One, two shots, and your buddy's in the trap, Brad. Come on. Hey. Still photographer standing up. Can you get out of the shot? Please. Thank you. Could you sit down, sir? One minute. Thank you. I know you're listening. With me this morning, Eugene Scott, reporter for The Fix, and James Homan, Washington Post columnist. We have just been watching uh, Al Sharpton, as well as members of the Floyd family, take a knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And you certainly see how long that is when you see uh, that they are only are about uh, two minutes in at this point. Um, Eugene, when you see this type of demonstration that the family is doing right now with the uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, and we saw a lot of kneeling, of course, over the, the summer protests, too. What comes to your mind? I'm initially reminded of some of the conversations I had uh, with people who became more sympathetic to the complaints of black Americans in relation to their interactions with law enforcement after seeing this video, the, the image of the cops knee on George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds was alarming to individuals who in the past had been uh, more critical of the Black Lives Matter movement or just more blindly even defensive of law enforcement. The details of the interaction uh, were largely unknown to many of these individuals, many of them former uh, Republicans or still Trump supporters, but what they knew was that a knee on a neck for 46 seconds and eight minutes, eight minutes and 46 seconds, was hard to justify. And they had many questions and they started listening to uh, some of the arguments being made by people that they uh, usually did not lend their ear to when trying to engage issues related to social justice and law enforcement. 
And so this tactic right now that you see uh, these lawyers, these civil rights activists, these family members using uh, is in part to remind people who may have forgotten about where we were last June uh, when so many of the protests really started uh, just increasing across the country and even the world uh, in, in response to the outrage that many people felt about this particular incident. Yeah, Eugene, that's a, a good point uh, that we kind of have forgotten, perhaps. It's been uh, several months, almost a year actually, since this happened and some of the protests we saw. James, I, I also want to get your reflections here as well as we watch the family uh, kneel for this length of time. What are, what are you thinking about right now? Yeah, Rhonda, you know, thank God for video, uh, right? That, that if there was not video of this incident, uh, you look back at what the original Minneapolis Police Department press release said uh, in May of last year about what happened, and it it you know made Floyd sound like he was resisting arrest, and um, you know if not for this bystanders video, uh, the, we would never be in this position today. And we're going to actually see that video. They're going to play it uh, during the trial, and it, it it really is remarkable in this age of you know camera phones and YouTube and everything else. Uh, you think about all the other times, the other incidents where. Uh, there was injustice, racial discrimination that was not captured on video and that there was no justice or accountability for those involved because there wasn't tape. Thank you, both of you, for those uh, insights. Let's go back to Minneapolis, where our reporter Joyce Coe is outside of the courthouse. Joyce, what is the mood outside right now? Well, Rhonda, we are um, right outside of the courthouse on the side that the um, Floyd family, as well as their attorney, Benjamin Crump and Al Sharpton, um, are gathering. I believe you can see that. Um, and that's just to my right here, where dozens of members of the press uh, are gathered to hear their remarks and what they have had to say this morning. And now um, protesters, as well as the family and uh, their attorney, have all taken a knee and they are doing this for, uh, they started it at 846 and uh, they are doing this for eight minutes and 46 seconds to represent uh, the amount of time that Derek Chauvin, the former police officer, had on George Floyd's neck uh, in that video that James was just talking about that will be played in court. Um, one of the things that Al Sharpton said prior to doing uh, this demonstration is that they have done this very thing before. And uh, one thing that he said was that people have remarked at how difficult it is to actually be on your knee for eight minutes and 46 seconds, that people get tired doing this around the three minute mark. Um, and I just want to include a quote of what he said. Um, he said, at what point does humanity kick in? At what point does the letter of the law kick in? He, he went on to say that, um, quote, it was intentional and deliberate. So you see this demonstration taking place. Uh, we also heard from the Floyd family uh, just before this uh, with his nephew speaking, uh, Floyd's brothers speaking about um, what their brother George George meant to them. Um, we heard from Floyd's nephew, Brandon, Brendan Williams, who said, uh, quote, we came to get justice. If this trial is hard, we have two different systems in, of justice for black people and white people in this country. Um, and, you know, you can really hear and feel the pain of this family. Um, we had a chance to actually speak to um, Philonis Floyd, uh, George Floyd's brother, yesterday at the tail end of one of the protests that took place um, here in downtown Minneapolis. And, and you could just feel that, you know, not only is this city on edge, but the family who have come here to uh, hear the arguments in this trial are really on edge as well there. There is a lot of emotion here this morning as members of the family are really just trying to keep their emotions together as they speak about uh, their brother and their uncle um, and their family member, George Floyd. Uh, one other thing I, I wanted to mention is that there has been a consistent message, um, not just that we heard from Felonis yesterday, but also today there's been numerous mentions of the, the significance and the importance of protesters and the demonstrators that we have seen, uh, not just here in Minneapolis, but across the country, across the world. Uh, Al Sharpton today saying that that is um, the, the reason why the family is able to seek um, this level of justice. Let me see if I can get the exact quote. Um, he said that 
you know, this is a starting point of the pain. And he said that it, it's the reason why there's a shot at justice because of the demonstrations that have taken place, because of the uh, people that have come and taken to the streets to protest that Black Lives Matter uh, and that they want justice for George Floyd. Rhonda. Thanks so much, Joyce, for uh, that reporting. Uh, national reporter Nicole Ellis joins us now from Houston, where George Floyd is from. The world witnessed the national outcry over how Floyd died, but what was that loss like, Nicole, for his hometown and uh, his childhood neighborhood? Absolutely, Rhonda. Uh, George Floyd is from Third Ward, a historic black neighborhood here in Houston, and coincidentally where I also grew up and where I am right now. And it's a neighborhood that's steeped in the state's black history, dating back to the 1870s, when four newly freed enslaved, uh, enslaved people here put their money together to, uh, to create an emancipation park to celebrate their emancipation from slavery. One of those people was Jack Yates, the namesake of George Floyd's high school. And Jack Yates High School is actually 95 years old. So I'm in a neighborhood, and George Floyd is from a neighborhood that you'll have multiple generations of people who went to the same high school as him. And he was a well-known football star. So you'll have multiple generations of people who came to his games, watched him play, saw him play in the Astrodome, Houston's biggest stadium back then. Uh, so for the community, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty considerable loss and a part of an experience of of the black American experience here in Texas and here specifically in Houston, that that's hard to deal with and hard to grapple with, particularly for people who also who went to high school with him. I've spoken to, to several people who, who either attended Jack Yates High School when he was there or remember those moments when he was a football player and, and know him from his from his sort of subdivision, the CUNY homes, where you know, I spoke to a few people who who say that, you know, George Floyd can come outside and the whole block comes out and is ready to engage him. And there's there's videotape of him sort of talking to people from his community. Uh, so so for Third Ward specifically, where George Floyd is from, it's a really grave loss. And it's a, a really sort of heartbreaking moment to see someone from their own high school, their own neighborhood, someone that, that in many cases, a lot of young people looked up to um, lose his life the way he did and 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 it's it's it hits very close to home here back to you Rhonda. thank you so much nicole for that uh, local insight there from houston uh eugene and james uh that was a long time now uh they have ended their demonstration the eight minutes 46 seconds and we see uh what length of time that that actually is what that feels like i think for me over the summer i remember uh, how uh, members of Congress took a knee for that length of time on marble floors, and, and many of them are older in age, uh, and it just continues to bring home um, how long that is. Uh, we haven't yet talked uh, a lot about the defense. Uh, Eric Nelson is the lead attorney for the defense. Uh, Chauvin's whole defense team is uh, provided by a legal defense fund for uh, Minneapolis officers. Uh, James, does that also bring that argument into this, the argument that police officers are very uh, well protected uh, legally, that they have support? Is that something, too, that's going to be part of the discussion as we watch this trial unfold? Well, it's, it's going to be one of those things that's fascinating to watch. You know, obviously in that press conference, Rhonda, there was so much talk about race, you know, talking about Rodney King and Philando Castile. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see whether the prosecution brings up the, the obvious racial element here. Similarly, it will be interesting to, to what extent the defense brings it up, because obviously it is such a factor, uh, and, and it's not clear that Eric Nelson will talk about it, but it would be sort of odd for him not to acknowledge it. And, and you're absolutely right that there are these strong legal protections for police officers, uh, the qualified immunity. Uh, you know, the, in this particular case, you know, it, the state clearly believes that they can bring charges successfully, including for third degree murder. Uh, but but it certainly is hard to convict police officers of misconduct. And that's uh, one of the reasons it's so rare. 
And Eugene, um, this goes into the idea of police reform. We've seen it discussed at the federal level, although I know I've talked to sources recently on the Hill who say this is not a, a front burner issue right now. Do you think that this trial, once it begins, once we start hearing eyewitness reports uh, of uh, how George Floyd died, that that will reignite the calls for police reform, whether at the federal level or at the local level? It certainly will have to. You, you would have to think that the amount of attention that this trial is going to uh, receive, at the very least, is going to lead to lawmakers in the state of Minnesota commenting on it and making headlines in local media there, if not national media. But this is a case that people across uh, the aisle and across the country were paying attention to. And so now that it's back uh, before us, um, I, I cannot help but to believe that lawmakers will be paying attention to it once again. And as lawmakers, there will be pressure on them from people who uh, sent them to Washington and people who don't want them in Washington to reform policies or double down on existing uh, policies that make communities safer, depending on what side of the issue you fall upon. And so uh, I, I certainly believe that police reform, something that got national attention during uh, the 2020 presidential campaign, and it's likely going to get attention uh, in next year's midterms, it's also uh, going to be before us right now as we look at this issue and this case and try to figure out what is right in policing in America, what needs to be uh, reformed, and, and what is still yet to be determined. Yeah, that's a really good point because uh, we all remember that when George Floyd's death happened, it was during the 2020 campaign season. So everyone who was running for an office quickly responded. So uh, there were politics involved. I remember uh, the House came with a bill very quickly. The Senate Judiciary Committee had a, a quick uh, hearing on the issue of policing. Um, James, I want to throw the politics question to you, too. Uh, we haven't yet heard uh, Joe Biden uh, speak on uh, this trial at all. Should we expect the president to weigh in at all on, on what we're about to see? I, I wouldn't expect him to be out there. It's just not his style. Uh, obviously, he visited uh, the family of George Floyd. He went to Houston last year during the campaign, uh, right where Nicole was just speaking to us from. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I would expect some statement maybe afterwards, uh, but it, I think that Biden is a traditionalist in the sense that he doesn't want to weigh in on an active criminal prosecution while it's still going on uh, and that he would be inclined to be cautious in that regard. Uh, while we're waiting, we're uh, probably minutes away from the start of this opening statement day of the Derek Chauvin trial. I just want to make some uh, points here for the viewers on what they might expect. Uh, we may see the judge start with some procedural motions. He's done that in the last few weeks of jury selection. So those will be uh, procedural motions before they uh, get into these uh, opening statements. You also will not see the jury. Uh, that is for their protection. Uh, the judge, as we mentioned earlier, uh, has not released their names. He does not plan to until uh, this trial ends at some point when he deems it appropriate. This is for their security, of course. Uh, but there will be a camera from behind them so you will be able to see their vantage point. Uh, you will mostly see, uh, well, yeah, there is the judge right there, uh, Peter Cahill. So let's go now to the Hennepin County Courthouse in Minneapolis where uh, the judge uh, will get started. You prefer that for trial. So um, I think if you could use the podium for our first motion that we have today, uh, then we'll, we'll Proceed to openings at 9.30 according to schedule. We have all 15 jurors are here, so we're kicking loose number 15, the last one chosen. And so we'll go with the four, 14 others. We have a seating chart that Mr. Schaefer will put them into their seats to start with after we're done with the motion. So we have one motion on for this, after, or for this morning. And I believe, uh, Mr. Frank, are you going to argue that? Good idea to move the podium, but for now it's a little off. I apologize, Ron. We filed this motion um, just to clarify some points, particularly in light of opening statements. Uh, the court's ruling we thought uh, you know, was clear and we understood it, but uh, just wanted to make sure that in opening statements the parties stick to the court's ruling as well so that something isn't said that's contrary to the court's ruling and you know, could be heard and by the jurors. 
So we really, I think our motion is self-explanatory. The, the statements about Mr. Floyd have to be based on the objective reasonableness standard rather than the subjective intentions of Mr. Floyd and, and reasonable officers uh, uh, analysis of that situation. That's the relevant And can you issue. give an example of what you think should not be said? That Mr. Floyd was trying or wanted to resist arrest, that he was trying to um, uh, fight with the officers intentionally, that he was um, faking or malingering his medical distress. Uh, those are the types of things that relate directly to his subjective state of mind. Mm -hmm. And we've written our motion um, in a way that you know, we realize those strictures apply to both parties. You know, we're, we acknowledge that, certainly. But it's really to clarify what we see as um, a potential problem with opening statements. And so I think it's rather self-explanatory. Wanted to bring it to the court's attention so we could deal with it here this morning and just be clear about it. And the other part of that being, uh, as far as uh, Mr. Chauvin's intent or knowledge or vis-a-vis -vis that uh, policy that you attach to your motion. Right. Again, it's an objective officer standard about um, his perceptions uh, and how they would be dealt with by an objective officer. What he intends to do, right, is relevant um, in term because, of course, there is an assault charge and other you know, intent are is an element of some of these crimes, and so his intent is relevant, but it's his conduct is still judged by an objective, reasonable standard. All right. Mr. Nelson, anything you want to add? No, Your Honor. I mean, I essentially agree. As long as we can. Hold on. I got to get you. Okay, go ahead. Again, Your Honor, just simply stating the objective observations of the police officers and of the people who were there, I, I don't have an issue with that. It's, I agree that, um, at, per the court's ruling, that Mr. Floyd's subjective internal process is off limits. All right. Um, and maybe I can give an example, because like most of the judges on this bench, I'm fairly strict regarding no argument in opening. Uh, as far as Mr. Floyd, obviously description of appearances. Uh, I think uh, even to the point of saying he appeared to not be complying, I think that's permissible because someone will testify to that, but they cannot say he was resisting. He was, especially in opening. Uh, those are conclusions, those are inferences drawn from his behavior. Uh, so when witnesses are testifying, expect that they will talk about what they observed as far as appearances. Sometimes it has to lapse into it appeared to be resistance or noncompliance. But to say that he was is an inference from the behavior. I know this is a fine line, but just so you know kind of where I would draw it. As far as uh, Mr. Chauvin, at the scene, there's this policy in place. Certainly it is permissible in opening to talk about the policy and how an officer on the scene has to follow this policy, make an assessment. And I think if you get to the point of saying the word should is where you get into inferences. For example, if in opening you were to say, Mr. Chauvin should have made this evaluation, that's argument. But to say this is the policy, this is what every officer on the scene should do, that I think is objective and it is, uh, and then you can talk about the behaviors on the scene. It sounds like I'm splitting hairs a little too thinly, but uh, I think you kind of get my, the gist of it. Uh, any inferences you draw uh, are argumentative and so that shouldn't be done, but a description of the policies that were in place that bound any officer who's out on the street responding to an arrest, all that is appropriate. Uh, in opening and as far as testimony. Anybody need any clarification beyond that? Okay, a uh, couple things. We are going to try and stick as much as we can to the 9 to 9.30 is going to be to argue any legal issues that come up because invariably legal issues come up. 
Um, I don't want to move up too much the jury start time because of the process of getting here into the building is a little complicated. So I'd prefer that we continue with the nine o'clock. Plus we will go to 12.30 each day in the morning. And if you do the calculations between our argument on legal issues from nine to 9.30 and that with our 20 minute break, that allows for essentially two hour and a half blocks of time in the morning. And in the afternoon, obviously, I'll tell the jury that we'll be going generally from 1.30 to 4.30, possibly 5 o'clock. Um, if it's possible to keep a witness from having to come back the next day, I would prefer to go later in the day than to have them come back the next day. But we can talk about that and we can have chambers conferences. Generally, uh, I'll be here by 8.30, at least by 8.45, if you just want to have a Chambers conference about logistics, nothing substantive on the record. So I'll be here if you want to come back at that time uh, during the daily schedule. Other than that, since we have our jury waiting, um, we might start today at 9.15. <laughs> now having said, I want to stick at 9.30. Since we have all 15, we're going to be cutting one loose. I think we can get started around more 9.15, but I'll give you all a break until, let's say 9.20, and then we'll see if we can get the jury set and get rolling. All right, we're in recess. Okay, we uh, have just seen the uh, judge in this case, Judge Peter Cahill, uh, begin uh, this trial, this opening uh, statements day for the trial of Derek Chauvin. Uh, the beginning of today uh, looks like it's uh, procedural motions that they're going through right now, some of the language that can be used in the statements that we will see. Uh, so this is sort of that laying out the groundwork for uh, what is likely to be a, a really uh, pivotal day, the beginning of the Chauvin trial. Uh, I'd like to bring uh, James Homan back into uh, this Oh, I'm sorry, we'll bring in Eugene Scott uh, to discuss what he heard. Eugene, it seems like they're trying to establish what type of language uh, that they can use in the opening statements. What was your takeaway from that? And that was fascinating to see, but not that surprising because of the power of language in terms of how it will influence a juror's perspective of what actually happened especially compared to perhaps what they have heard happen previously or what uh, maybe they uh, assumed happened based on what they have consumed um, in their own media coverage, uh, you know, over the past nearly year. And I think the judge made it very clear that he wanted to not uh, make assumptions about intentions in terms of uh, the actions of uh, George Floyd and also of Derek Chauvin and it'll be really interesting to see how uh, that's honored and how that goes about uh, determining how those uh, involved hear everything and, and receive all of the information and the facts of the case and what decisions they make as a result. It seems to Eugene that the judge there, Peter Cahill, also laid the groundwork for how he wants this trial to be approached. He has also made mention in the jury selection process that he wants this to be straightforward. He wants it to be only about four weeks. Uh, so what does that tell you about how a judge is approaching this case? I think there's some concern about this being becoming a bit of a media spectacle. He knows there's a lot of attention. Uh, that means the, the possibility and potential for this to be drawn out um, uh, is it, great. Uh, there will already be uh, quite a bit of media coverage. You've seen, you saw during the earlier opening statements, there were moments that it appeared that there was many members of the press as there were uh, individuals there from the family and the legal team. And, and so I think the judge is just making sure, wants to make sure that this really does focus on uh, the case and making sure that justice is served and that this doesn't end up uh, becoming something way bigger than what it is actually set out to, to be. Um, and, and perhaps also an awareness that there are other topics and issues and cases that everyone involved uh, needs to uh, give their attention to in terms of going about um, their responsibilities as people devoted to, uh, you know, criminal justice reform and, and law and, and, and the legal uh, fields and, and that this situation uh, should not uh, go as far as to take up way more time uh, than is necessary. Let's bring on a clip from earlier right now. Uh, listen to the Floyd family attorney, Ben Crump, urge the jury and the public to not lose sight of the facts. Everybody 
Please do not be distracted. The facts are simple. What killed George Floyd was an overdose of excessive force. Come on, bro. The transcript from the autopsies are clear. The manner and cause of death was asphyxiation by homicide. Polonis said in the hood, they choked him. It was a knee choke. And so let's remember the facts here. This murder case is not hard. Just look at the torture video of George Floyd. And again, that was Ben Crump, the family's attorney, the Floyd family's attorney. Um, in, in the civil proceedings of this case. James, I want to bring you in to what we just saw. Uh, the judge seems that he is uh, trying to make sure that they lay the proper groundwork on how this is conducted, these uh, opening statements. Was there anything that he said uh, that stands out to you? Yeah, he, you know, he joked that he was splitting hairs, but the lawyers both seemed amenable to what he was saying, and that is, frankly, putting the facts, uh, doing exactly what Ben Crump just said in that statement. The goal of this trial uh, and, and the reason, you know, what the Judge Cahill said is every day we're going to have half an hour of procedural legal question back and forth because they want to be really careful to only put the facts uh, and what's under the law, what is actually being tried here in front of the jury. The judge, uh, to Eugene's point from a minute ago, does not want this to become a circus. We heard him say, you know, if, if we have a witness, we can make it so they don't have to come back the next day. I'd prefer to go later so that we can wrap it up. Uh, and move at a brisk pace. But he clearly, Judge Cahill, uh, doesn't want this to become uh, what Ben Crump also said at the top, a referendum on policing in America or a referendum on uh, racial equality. He clearly, and you saw that with his, his motion that he agreed to from the prosecution, wants to keep this very focused on the, the facts that are alleged and the standard under the law to convict Derek Chauvin of, of these crimes. You know, James, yesterday the governor of the state of Minnesota gave his state of the state address, and in, in that time he discussed how he wanted Minnesota residents to stay calm, uh, make sure that they, if they are going to demonstrate, do it peacefully. He uh, talked about follow uh, the example of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, security is a pretty big concern right now for the people in uh, Minneapolis. Have you heard from uh, people back home on what they're feeling about uh, the security level that is there? Yeah, the city is absolutely on edge. Uh, there's concern all over the state uh, about potential rioting or violence again, which you know the city experienced last summer. And th there's absolutely concern about that. And the security level's high at the court, not just because of COVID precautions, but we heard Judge Cahill say, you know, one of the reasons that we're not going to start until 30 minutes after the hour is because it's hard for these, it's going to end up being 14 jurors, to just get into the courthouse through the security perimeter uh, and to, to get into the courtroom uh, because security is so tight and there's so much concern. And one of the things, Tim Walls, like Keith Ellison, up for re-election next year, he's very nervous uh, about uh, kind of disorder, chaos, that could make it really hard for him to get reelected. His approval rating is sort of middling. Uh, a lot of people have disapproved of his COVID response. So for him, it's very important for the governor to project kind of calm and order. Uh, but he's also a Democrat, and he, uh, he his, his spoken pretty poignantly in the past about the need for there to be justice for George Floyd. So this is a delicate balancing act for these political leaders who want to make sure that there's safety and that the, peace, the protests stay peaceful, but also don't want to make it seem like they're discouraging uh, activism. Yeah, and thank you for bringing up uh, COVID because, of course, for those uh, viewing this, you'll see that there are a lot of um, partitions between uh, people in that courtroom. The judge has one uh, near him. The lawyers have one in between uh, them and, and uh, Chauvin as well. The jurors from the pictures that I saw from the courtroom, they are socially distant. So COVID is definitely something that's at the top of mind in this courtroom. Uh, Eugene, but COVID also, a lot of people have said, had it not been that we were all in a lockdown or in quarantine situation back last May, that the video of George Floyd's death would not have taken off in the way that it did. What's your thoughts on that? I think the reality of the, that so many people uh, were at home uh, quarantining, uh, consuming media, not interacting with um, a lot of the people that they would in a normal uh, situation, 
definitely did provide an opportunity uh, to pay attention to this case at levels that uh, previously would not have been the case. Um, there were people eager to get out a, of lockdown, and you combine that with outrage, with injustice, and you have protests all over uh, the country and, and cities and with populations um, and numbers that previously would not have been the case. Uh, there was also some frustration uh, as we were looking at the implications of COVID um, and criminal justice as a whole, right? And so there were conversations happening about uh, whether or not uh, COVID, treat, COVID conditions were, uh, for, for those who were incarcerated, were safe. Uh, and so there was just a bigger conversation about how are people suspects, people who have been convicted being treated, uh, their mental health, their physical health, uh, that I think uh, was adding a new chapter to larger conversations about criminal justice reform uh, that we had not yet seen. And there was a level of nuance, I believe, uh, that this case uh, just started and allowed people to engage in that we previously were not engaged in. Um, and I, I think that very much could very well continue as we know that the COVID pandemic is not over um, and that people are still paying attention to how uh, suspects and people who have been uh, convicted and inmates are being treated by law enforcement uh, physically and when it comes to other health areas. And James, I'd like you to weigh in on that as well. Uh, a lot of people said had we not been in a lockdown situation, the George Floyd video would have been yet another just viral moment of uh, police use of force and, and uh, violence with the police. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Rhonda, I think that's absolutely right. I think the kindling was all there and that the, the kind of the powerfulness of that video, uh, you know, which from George W. Bush and Barack Obama, even Donald Trump said he watched the video. Joe Biden said he watched the video. Uh, you know, people, uh, as Eugene were saying, was saying, were glued to their screens. They were eager to get out. It was, you know, this this incident happened on Memorial Day, uh, so it was kind of the unofficial start of summer. Uh, the weather was getting nicer, and and the point of comparison would be Philando Castile, another African American man in Minnesota, shot by police, also caught on video. Uh, his his girlfriend, who was in the passenger seat, live streamed the video. There was a lot of outrage in Minneapolis. Uh, and there were a lot of protests, but it was very kind of regionalized, localized. It didn't become the major national galvanizing story that George Floyd did. Uh, and I think people were eager to turn the page past COVID uh, last May. And, and, and so I think it was kind of a perfect storm of a host of factors that lit the match that caused this major national reckoning on race. James, you mentioned uh, a little bit ago before in our pre-show that uh, the George Floyd, where the area where he died, is become uh, really a community hub. And from what I've been reading from local press, uh, there are all sorts of um, organizations that have made it their home. There's, uh, I think there was at one point a free medical care uh, mobile unit that was there. They, they were also doing drives for the homeless and the hungry. Uh, describe a little bit of what that uh, square has become uh, in yeah. the wake of George Floyd's death. Yeah, so it's all those things. Uh, it's also, you know, it's a, a lot of murals, a lot of street art, and there's a church right there at that corner uh, that's been there for 40 years. And uh, a lot of, um, it was an all black church uh, and a lot of uh, white people from Minneapolis uh, have started going there. So it's become this uh, multi-denomination or multi-ethnic denomination uh, over the last nine months. And, uh, and it's really focused a lot on racial justice. And, uh, and so that's right there, right at the heart of it. Uh, and then, you know, across the street, we'll see in the video, there's a, a Cub Foods, which is the big local supermarket in the Twin Cities. Uh, you know, it's still there uh, and, and kind of basically a shopping center. But the, the underlying heart of, of what's now George Floyd Square is, you know, it's, it's an important intersection in uh, the, this, this section of Minneapolis. Uh, and and the, there's a police precinct a couple blocks away. Uh, it, and, but as I mentioned in the pre-show, Rhonda, they kind of, the police have pulled back there because this is where a lot of the, the most heated confrontations were last summer. Uh, police have basically, in order to avoid escalating things, left it be. And there are some locals who live right there. There are homes nearby uh, who worry that, you know, that there's been more violence because there's not police around to kind of keep order. But you're, you're absolutely correct that there are also groups, you know, that are kind of, there have been a lot of celebrations. There's been a lot of positive stuff to go on there as well. 
And just to remind people who are watching this with us, at 10.30 we will resume. Uh, the jury will be seated and, and we will begin the opening statements in the Derek Chauvin trial. So we're just a, a few minutes away from that. We see, oh, it looks like the judge is back in the seat. So we will go ahead back to the courtroom. We begin the trial. We'll administer an oath to you so that you may take on the important duty of being judges. In this case, you will be the judges of the facts and I will be the judge of the law. I'd ask everyone in the courtroom to stand while the oath is being administered. Please raise your hand, please. Do you swear or affirm that you will be attentive during this trial and follow the instructions of the court so that you may reach a fair and just verdict, that you will not discuss this case with anyone until submitted to you for deliberation and will keep your verdict secret until it is delivered to the court? If so, say I do. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, the trial is about to begin, and it is very important that you, members of the jury, be able to hear and see everything that takes place during the trial. If you suffer from some hearing loss and would benefit from amplified sound, then please raise your hand now, and we'll make sure that you get a hearing assistance device. All right, no hands. If during the trial, at any time, you have difficulty hearing or understanding what a witness is saying, or if a witness or attorney should block your view, please raise your hand immediately so that we can correct the problem. Now during the trial, you are going to hear the testimony of several witnesses. You will have to make judgments about the credibility and the weight of their testimony. Be patient and listen to the testimony of all the witnesses. Keep it all in mind until you have heard all the evidence. As you listen to the witnesses, you should take note of such matters as the witness's interest or lack of interest in the outcome of the case, the ability and opportunity to know, remember, and tell the facts, their experience, frankness and sincerity, or the lack thereof, the reasonableness or the unreasonableness of their testimony in light of all the other evidence and any other factors that bear on the question of believability and credibility. In the last analysis, you should rely on your own experience, good judgment, and common sense. Now, you have been given notepads so that you may take notes during the trial. You should not, however, feel required to do so. The most important thing is that you give full attention to the testimony as you hear it. Now, to protect the privacy of your notes, I would suggest you write your random juror number, which we will keep the same, and put that on the first sheet and then begin taking notes on the second sheet. We also have extra pads if you run out of space. Now we will collect and keep your notes secure at the end of each day so you can leave them on the chair during breaks and at the end of the day. At the end of the, end of the trial, you will be allowed to take your notes with you into deliberation and I will instruct you further regarding the use of those notes at the end of the trial. Keep in mind also that I cannot give you a trial transcript at the end of the trial. No such transcript can be prepared for your deliberation. We count on the jury to rely on its collective memory and the exhibits submitted to you. Now during the trial, an objection may be made to some evidence and I may sustain or overrule the objection. If I sustain the objection, it means that the question may not be answered. In that case, you should simply ignore the question and any answer that might have been given. If no answer was given before the objection was made, you should not speculate about what the possible answer might have been. Similarly, if I instruct you during the trial to disregard some statement that a witness or attorney has made, then you must disregard it. If I overrule the objection, it means that the question may be answered. In that case, you should treat the answer like any other answer. Similarly, if an exhibit is received despite an objection, you should treat that exhibit like any other evidence. From time to time during the trial, the attorneys will need to discuss issues of law or scheduling matters with me. If these discussions are brief, the lawyers and I will use the wireless headsets while the white noise is on. If the discussions are lengthier, I may take a recess. Please understand, we are not attempting to conceal anything from you 
which it is necessary for you to hear. I ask that you be patient when we have these discussions, even though they may interrupt the case. And just as an aside, we are scheduled to have the time between 8.30 and 9.30 every morning set aside for the lawyers to argue legal issues. So hopefully we can handle most of that before we start again at 9.30 each morning. Now, when I turn on the white noise, that's your indication that the conversation is not for you. So please, do not attempt to listen in, and please come to order when I turn the white noise off. And I'm also giving that instructions to anyone who's a spectator here. The white noise is a private conversation, usually about scheduling, nothing exciting, uh, between me and the attorneys. You can use that opportunity, however, if you'd like to stand up, stretch, talk to your neighbor. But if you could, uh, make sure you don't, uh, if there's a piece of black tape in front of you, please don't cross that line. We've taken great uh, care to make sure you are never on camera. And so as long as you stay behind that black line and even stretch in the aisle between, you should be just fine. Now the cameras have been angled so that, as I said, you'll never appear on video. To assist in that, do not cross the black tape. And when entering and departing from the courtroom, please use the uh, aisle between the two rows of seats. And do not get out of your seat until the deputy is at the door waiting to escort you back to the other room. Now, there are things you should not do during this trial. As I said during jury selection, you are not investigators. You are not to go out to do any looking, and you are not to ask people about this matter. You are not to use the internet to look for information about this case, or about the law. You should avoid all news if possible, but at the very least, you should avoid media coverage of this case. Remember, you must not talk to anyone who is involved in the case, the attorneys, the witnesses, or spectators. Do not be offended if they do not speak to you. They know that it would be improper uh, to contact you during trial, and they will confine themselves to a brief greeting. You should not discuss the case among yourselves. At the end of the trial, you will have as much time as you need to discuss it, but that is at the end and not during the trial. You can talk to each other, just don't talk about the case. When you go home during the trial, family and friends will be curious as to what you are doing. You may tell them you are sitting as a juror in a criminal case and that is all you should tell them. I have to be realistic and tell you that you can tell your immediate family in your household what you are doing because they will probably have figured it out by now. But in any case, feel free to share with them, but no one else. As I stated before, since this is all you should tell family and friends, that is all you should tell the general public. So during trial, please refrain from using Facebook or Twitter or any other social media to comment on this trial. You may access such internet apps and tools, but please do not publish any information about this case or your thoughts about this case. Please avoid news coverage, as I said, uh, about this case, whether it's on, in newspapers, radio, television, social media, or any other media. Please disable any new news feeds that might show up on your social media accounts that might report on this case. As I told you during jur uh, jury selection, this case is being televised, but you will not be shown on video. Now, there are certain things you should do during trial. The first of all is to be on time to report for court. We cannot begin unless every participant is present. And while waiting for a court to begin, please wait in the other courtroom until one of my clerks or a sheriff's deputy brings you into this courtroom. As I've said, the time that we have set aside for the lawyers and I to discuss legal issues from 8.30 to 9.30 means that we'll start with you at about 9.30 every morning. Nevertheless, there still might be unexpected delays. Uh, we'll do our best to keep on this schedule, and generally we will go from with the jury from 9.30 to 12.30 with a 20-minute mid-morning break. And we'll take your orders for lunch because we will be providing you lunch uh, throughout. Court will usually start again at 1.30 or 2 p.m. and go until about 4.30 or 5 p.m. with a 20-minute mid-morning or mid-afternoon break. To some extent, this may seem leisurely, but before and after court and during the breaks, the attorneys are preparing uh, for the next session of court. Please turn off all electronic devices such as cell phones and com 
computers while court is in session. You may use such devices outside this courtroom when you are on a break, but please remember to turn them off while in this courtroom. I will allow you to bring water, coffee, or other beverages with you during the trial, but to keep noisy distractions to a minimum, please open any containers before we resume court and not while evidence is being taken. Now, if a problem should arise during trial or you observe what you believe might be improper conduct and you need to bring this to my attention, please contact my clerk or one of the deputies. They will communicate your concerns to me and we will do our best to handle the situation. Make a mental note of the seat in which you are sitting right now and please keep that seat throughout the trial. We'll begin with opening statements. In the opening statements, the attorneys may describe for you what they believe the evidence in this case will be. Evidence is what the witnesses say and any exhibits submitted to you. What the attorneys say, however, is not evidence. Anything shown to you in opening statements is also not evidence unless and until it is actually received in evidence during the trial. You should keep an open mind about all the evidence until the end of the trial, until you have heard the final arguments of the attorneys, and until I have instructed you on the law. It goes without saying that this case is important to all the participants, and you should give your undivided attention to this case while trial is in session. I thank you in advance for your service. In taking on your role as jurors, you provide an important and central service in the administration of justice. Mr. Blackwell, do you wish to open? Yes, sir. You may proceed. May it please the court, counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. My name is Jerry Blackwell, and I apologize for talking to you through this plexiglass, but it's probably the least of the gifts that the pandemic has given us. You're going to learn in this case a lot about what it means to be a public servant and to have the honor of wearing this badge. It's a small badge that carries with it a large responsibility and a large accountability to the public. What does it stand for? It represents the very motto of the Minneapolis Police Department, to protect with courage, to serve with compassion, but it also represents the essence of the Minneapolis Police Department approach to the use of force against its citizens when appropriate. The sanctity, a sanctity of life and the protection of the public shall be the cornerstones of the Minneapolis Police Department's use of force. Compassion, sanctity of life, cornerstones, and that little badge is worn right over the officer's heart. But you're also going to learn that the officers take an oath when they become police officers. They take an oath that I will enforce the law courteously and appropriately, and as you will learn, as applies to this case, never employing unnecessary force or violence. And not only that, I recognize the badge of my office as a symbol of public faith, and I accept it as a public trust to be held so long as I am true to the ethics of police service. Symbol of public faith, ethics to police service, sanctity of life, all of this matters tremendously to this case because you will learn that on May 25th of 2020, Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd, that he put his knees upon his neck and his back, grinding and crushing him until the very breath, no ladies and gentlemen, until the very life were squeezed out of him. You will learn that he was well aware that Mr. Floyd was unarmed, 
that Mr. Floyd had not threatened anyone, that Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs, he was completely in the control of the police, he was defenseless. You will learn what happened in that nine minutes and 29 seconds. The most important numbers you will hear in this trial are nine to nine. What happened in those nine minutes and 29 seconds when Mr. Derek Chauvin was applying this excessive force to the body of Mr. George Floyd. We have two objectives in this trial, ladies and gentlemen. The first objective is to give Mr. Chauvin a fair trial. Mr. Chauvin has a presumption of innocence. He is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. We plan to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Chauvin was anything other than innocent on May 25th of 2020. And our second objective, ladies and gentlemen, is to bring you the evidence, which I'm trying to preview uh, this morning. We are bringing this case, this prosecution of Mr. against Mr. Chauvin for the excessive force that he applied onto the body of Mr. George Floyd for engaging in behavior that was imminently dangerous in the force that he applied without regard for its impact on the life of Mr. George Floyd. So let's begin by focusing then on what we will learn about this nine minutes and 29 seconds. And you will be able to hear Mr. Floyd saying, please, I can't breathe. Please, man, please. In this nine minutes and 29 seconds, you will see that as Mr. Floyd is handcuffed there on the ground, he is verbalizing 27 times, you will hear. In the four minutes and 45 seconds, I can't breathe. Please, I can't breathe. You will see that Mr. Chauvin is kneeling on Mr. Floyd's neck and back. He has one knee on his neck, and the knee on his back is intermittently off and on on his back, as you will be able to see for yourself in the, the video footage. You will hear Mr. Floyd as he's crying out. You hear him at some point cry out for his mother when he's being squeezed there. He's very close to his mother, you will learn. You will hear him say, tell my kids I love them. Uh, you will hear him say, about his fear of dying, he says, I'll probably die this way. I'm through, I'm through, they're gonna kill me, they're gonna kill me, man. You will hear him crying out and you will hear him cry out in pain. My stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts. Uh, you'll hear that for yourself. Please, I can't breathe, please, your knee on my neck. Uh, you will hear it and you'll see at the same time while he's crying out, Mr. Chauvin never moves. The knee remains on his neck, sunglasses remain undisturbed on his head, and it just goes on. Uh, you will hear his final words when he says, I can't breathe. Before that time, you'll hear his voice get heavier. You will hear his words further apart. You will see that his respiration gets shallower and shallower and finally stops when he speaks his last words. I can't breathe. And once we have his final words, you'll see that for roughly 53 seconds, he is completely silent and virtually motionless with just sporadic movements. You're going to learn those sporadic movements matter greatly in this case because what they reflect. Uh, Mr. Floyd was no longer breathing when he's making these uh, movements. You will learn about something in this case called an anoxic seizure. It is the body's automatic reflex. When breathing has stopped due to oxygen deprivation, we'll be able to point out to you when you'll see the involuntary movements from Mr. Floyd that are part of an anoxic seizure. Not only that, uh, you're going to learn about something that's called agonal breathing. When the heart has stopped, when blood is no longer coursing through the veins, you will hear the body gasp as an involuntary reflex. We'll point out to you uh, when Mr. Floyd is having the agonal breathing, again, as a reflex, involuntary reflex to the oxygen uh, deprivation. So we learn here that Mr. Floyd at some point is completely passed out. Uh, Mr. Chauvin continues on as he had, knee on the neck, knee on the back. You'll see he does not let up and he does not get up uh, for the remaining, uh, as you can see, three minutes and 51 seconds. During this period of time, you will learn that Mr. Chauvin is told 
that they can't even find the pulse of Mr. Floyd. You learn he's told that twice. They can't even find the pulse. You will be able to see for yourself what he does in response. You will see that he does not let up and that he does not get up. Even when Mr. Floyd does not even have a pulse, it continues on. It continues on, ladies and gentlemen, even after the ambulance arrives on the scene. The ambulance is there, and you'll be able to see for yourself what Mr. Chauvin is doing when the ambulance is there. You can compare, you'll be able to compare how he looks in this photograph to how he looked in the first four minutes and 45 seconds. Same position, doesn't let up, and you'll see he doesn't get up. The paramedic from the ambulance comes over. You'll be able to see this in the video. He checks Mr. Floyd for a pulse. He has to check him for a pulse, you'll see, with Mr. Chauvin continuing to remain on his body at the same time. Doesn't get up even when the paramedic comes to check for a pulse and doesn't find one. Mr. Chauvin doesn't get up. You will see that the paramedics have taken the gurney out of the ambulance, have rolled it over next to the body of Mr. Floyd, and you'll be able to see Mr. Chauvin still does not let up, doesn't get up. And you will see it wasn't until such time as they start, they want to move the lifeless body of George Floyd onto the gurney. Only then does Mr. Chauvin let up and get up. And you'll see him drag Mr. Floyd's body and unceremoniously uh, cast it onto uh, the gurney. And that was for a total of four minutes and 44 seconds. You can see here that for the first four minutes and 45 seconds, you'll learn that Mr. Floyd was calling out, crying for his life. And ladies and gentlemen, not just Mr. Floyd, you're going to hear and see that there were any number of bystanders who were there who were also calling out to let up and get up, such that Mr. Floyd would be able to breathe and to maintain and to sustain his life. But then for the remaining four minutes and 44 seconds, Mr. Floyd was either unconscious, breathless, or pulseless. And the compression, the squeezing, the grinding went on just the same for the total of 9 minutes and 29 seconds. You're going to learn in this case quite a lot about the Minneapolis Police Department's use of force policy. What you're going to see and learn a lot about is what is the standard for applying force against individuals, the use of force policy you learn that Minneapolis Police Department employees shall only use the amount of force that is objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances. The force used shall be consistent with current Minneapolis Police Department training. What you learn, ladies and gentlemen, is that the use of force must be evaluated from one moment to the next moment, from moment to moment. What may be reasonable in the first minute may not be reasonable in the second minute, the fourth minute, or the ninth minute and 29 seconds, that it has to be evaluated from moment to moment. You'll also learn that the Minneapolis police are precluded, not allowed, to use any more force that is necessary to bring a person under their control. They can't use any more restraint than is necessary. You're going to meet um, an expert. His name is Jody Steger. He's a Los Angeles Police Department sergeant and a use of force expert. He's going to tell you that the force that Mr. Chauvin was using was lethal force. It was force that was capable of killing a human or putting his or her life in danger. The evidence is going to show you that there was no cause in the first place to use lethal force against a man who was defenseless who was handcuffed, who was not resisting, that there's no cause to use that force in the first place. You're gonna hear from Minneapolis Police Sergeant David Pleger, who's gonna come and talk with you. He is going to, he was the officer on the scene, so he arrived at the scene after this took place. He is going to tell you that the force against Mr. Floyd should have ended as soon as they put him on the ground in the first place meaning that the 929 should not have been uh, even a one, much less the 929. 
And that went on for way too long. Uh, he will tell you in terms of the restraint on the ground and the manner of the restraint for Mr. Floyd. You're also going to learn about another very important uh, policy in the Minneapolis Police Department. That's a core principle of policing. You will hear this phrase uh, that police have to live by in terms of how it is they relate to the public. In your custody is in your care. In your custody is in your care. Meaning that if you as an officer have an individual, a subject that's in your custody, it is your duty to care for that person. And you will learn that caring, ladies and gentlemen, is not a feeling. It's a verb. It's something you're supposed to do to provide care for that person. Uh, you are going to hear from any number of uh, police officers who will talk about uh, this duty to provide care. Officer Nicole McKenzie, who is the Minneapolis Police Department Medical Support uh, Coordinator. You'll hear from Sergeant Kerr Yang, uh, the MPD Crisis Intervention Coordinator. In your custody is in your care. You're going to learn that when Mr. Floyd was unconscious, uh, that when he was breathless, when he did not have a pulse, that there was a duty to have administered care, to let up and get up, uh, you will learn. You listen to Minneapolis Police Commander Katie Blackwell, no relation to my knowledge, but you will hear from Katie Blackwell and she's going to tell you about the training that Mr. Chauvin received. Uh, you're going to hear that he was a veteran on the Minneapolis Police Department for 19 years had been trained in CPR multiple times at the time. And you'll be able to see for yourself that when Mr. Floyd was in distress, Mr. Chauvin wouldn't help him, didn't help him. But you're also going to see that he stopped anybody else from being able to help him. You will learn that amongst the bystanders was a first responder, a member of the Minneapolis uh, Fire Department who was trained in administering first aid and emergency care. She's gonna come and talk with you. Her name is Genevieve Hansen. She wanted to check his pulse. She wanted to check on Mr. Floyd's well-being. She wanted him to let up and get up. She did her best to intervene, to be able to act, to intercede on George Floyd's behalf and you'll be able to see for yourself when she approached Mr. Chauvin on top of George Floyd with both of his knees, reached for his mace in his belt and pointed in her direction. So she couldn't help. She'll come and talk with you about that experience. Now you're going to learn that in the aftermath of this, that Mr. Chauvin's last day of employment with the Minneapolis Police Department was on May 26th of 2020. The Minneapolis Chief of Police, Chief Arredondo, is going to come here to talk with you. He was the police chief at the time, he's the chief today. He is going to tell you that Mr. Chauvin's conduct was not consistent with Minneapolis Police Department training, was not consistent with Minneapolis Police Department policy, was not reflective of the Minneapolis Police Department. He will not mince uh, any words. He's very clear. He'd be very decisive that this was excessive force. So ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, what was this all about in the first place? Well, you're gonna learn that it was about a counterfeit $20 bill used at a convenience store. That's all. You will not hear any evidence that Mr. Floyd knew that it was fake or did it on purpose. You will learn from witnesses we will call that the police officers could have written him a ticket and let the court sort it out. You will learn that even if he did it on purpose, it was a minor offense, a misdemeanor. So in terms of the charges that we are bringing, we're going to prove to you that Mr. Chauvin's conduct was a substantial cause of Mr. Floyd's death. We've charged him with murder in the second degree, murder in the third degree, and manslaughter for using excessive force against George Floyd. You will learn that the use of excessive and reasonable force against a citizen is an assault in this case, we will show you that this was an assault that contributed to taking his life, an assault. We're going to show you that putting knees on somebody's neck, Mr. Floyd's, 
putting a knee on his back for nine minutes and 29 seconds was an eminently dangerous activity. And he did it without regard to what impact it had on Mr. Floyd's life. We're going to show you that also. Uh, putting him uh, on the ground, we call that the prone position, on your stomach, face down. Putting him in the prone position, handcuffed like this in the first place was uncalled for and was an excessive use of force, let alone for nine minutes and 29 seconds. Now, how are we going to prove these charges? Uh, we're going to prove it, ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost by witness testimony. Uh, we're going to bring in some of those bystanders that I've referred to, normal folks. They'll tell you what they saw. They'll tell you why they stopped. They'll tell you why they were concerned. They'll tell you from that witness chair. We'll bring them in here. Uh, you're going to hear from any number of police officers responsible for training, uh, responsible for what the officers learn around first aid, coming to the care of others. We'll bring in a number of police officers, including the chief of police. But we're also going to bring in various professionals and experts, medical experts, experts in police conduct. You're going to meet any number of them. You'll have here a forensic pathologist, uh, Dr. Thomas, who uh, studies the tissues of the deceased as a, as a forensic pathologist to determine the cause and manner of death. You're going to hear from a pulmonologist, Dr. Tobin. He's a lung specialist, cardiologist, heart specialist, critical care physicians, emergency medicine physicians, internal medicine, and also from, uh, from toxicology. We're also going to bring in the court uh, Dr. Andrew Baker, who's the Hennepin County Medical Examiner, who will tell you about what he found. So we'll also bring him in. But we'll also bring in uh, experts who will prove that the use of force here was not reasonable. I mentioned earlier Jody Steger, Chief of Staff for the Inspector General, L.A. Police Department, and Seth Stoughton. Uh, you'll hear from both of them. Now, I've spent a few minutes talking to you about what this case is about. There are any number of things that this case is not about, maybe an infinite number of things the case isn't about. But one of those things that this case is not about, all police or all policing. You will learn from Chief Arredondo when he comes that police officers have difficult jobs, they have to make split-second decisions. They sometimes have to make split-second life and death decisions. In this trial, you're going to meet any number of the men and women from the Minneapolis Police Department who do a fantastic job. They're committed, take very seriously preserving the sanctity of life. I mentioned already Commander Katie Blackwell, Sergeant Kerry Yang, um, Officer Nicole McKenzie, to name a few. This case is about Mr. Derek Chauvin, and not about any of those men and women, and it's not about all policing at all. And this case is not about split-second decision-making. In nine minutes and 29 seconds, there are 479 seconds, not a split-second a month. That's what this case is about. You are going to hear from one of the bystanders, Charles McMillan. And Charles McMillan is going to talk to you about the excessive force that he saw Mr. Chauvin displaying on May 25th. And he will tell you uh, what he experienced in the way that Mr. Chauvin looked at him and the other bystanders who were calling out for Mr. Floyd's life. Uh, he will tell you uh, what he saw in terms of Mr. Chauvin never letting up or getting up on his body. You will be able to observe Mr. Chauvin's body language for yourself in the video and determine what that language uh, says to you. So I'm going to show you in a moment one of the videos that you're going to see uh, in this trial just to kind of tee up for you uh, what will be the essence of what we will be focused on in the trial. Uh, I need to tell you ahead of, ahead of time that the video is graphic, that it can be difficult uh, to watch. It is simply the nature of what we're dealing with in this trial, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to see any number of videos from the police officers who had body-worn cameras on. But you're also going to see videos from uh, the bystanders, normal folks, the bystanders.
You're going to see these bystanders, a, ver a veritable bouquet of humanity, these bystanders. Uh, you'll see here a little girl who's wearing a green shirt on the right uh, with the words love on the green shirt. I won't say her name now because she's a minor, but she is going to come and talk with you about what she saw. Uh, next to her in the blue pants is her cousin, who at the time was also a minor. So I won't tell you her name, but she's also going to come in and talk to you. Uh, cousin was taking the younger one to Cup Foods uh, to be able to pick up candy and snacks when they came up on what was happening um, with Mr. Chauvin and Mr. Floyd on the ground. Next to uh, the, uh, the young woman in the blue pants is Genevieve Hansen, the first responder who tried to intervene to check his pulse and to check on Mr. Floyd. She's going to come and testify to you. Next to her is a young man named Donald Williams, trained with a security background. He's also trained in mixed martial arts, um, who was very excited and alarmed about what he saw in the exchange between Mr. Chauvin on top of George Floyd. He's going to come in and testify to you. So any number of these bystanders and others also will be coming in uh, to talk with you. And so they come from the broad spectrum of humanity, uh, different races, different genders. You have older people, younger people. But you will see that what they all had in common as they were going about their business is that they saw something that was shocking to them, that was disturbing to them, and it made them stop and take note. Stop and take note. They tried to first, you will learn when you meet them, to intercede on what was happening with their voices. Uh, they tried to interject, to exhort, to please stop, to try to get into what we call good trouble just with their voices because something there was concerning to them. And when that didn't work, you can see any number of them pulled out their cameras to document what was happening such that it would be memorialized, such that it would not be misrepresented, such that it could not be forgotten. What we'll see this morning will be the, the footage taken from one of these bystanders in just a moment. And you will learn uh, with respect to these bystanders that none of them knew who George Floyd was. They didn't know his history. They didn't know anything about it. All they knew was they came up on an individual uh, that uh, they saw was in some ser serious distress under the knees of Mr. Chauvin and it alarmed them. Let me show you what the scene looks like uh, just briefly. Here in Minneapolis, this takes place at the intersection of Chicago Avenue and 38th Street uh, at Cup Foods. If you can see the image of a squad car on Chicago Avenue, that is ultimately where Mr. Floyd was being restrained on the ground, under the knees of Mr. Schott. Uh, we will spend quite a bit more time with this map uh, during the trial, but just for now, I just wanted to try to set the stage for what you're going to see. So with that, uh, I'm going to show you the video evidence. And the video evidence, I think, will be very helpful and meaningful to you because you can see it for yourself without lawyer talk, lawyer spin, lawyer anything. You can see it for yourself. God. Get up and get Mama, in the car right. I can't. 
JJ, y'all have to tune to get in, bro. I told you, you can't win. My knee. You can't my win, neck. man. I'm through. I know you're in that, but you didn't listen. Uh, I touched the phobia. Just My stomach hurts. Uh -huh. My neck hurts. Uh -huh. Everything hurts. Uh -huh. Ah, there's some water or something. Please. Please. Ah, I can't breathe. Oh, my God. Ah, shut up. They will kill me. They will kill me, man. Bro, with your feet on his neck, man, you get out the His man. nose is bleeding. Like, yeah, come on now. That's wrong right there with his feet on his neck. Look at his man. nose. You just see your knee on his neck. Yeah, he got your feet right on his neck, bro. Yeah, he's not breathing the rest. I cannot breathe. You just a grown. You're, oh, you're, tough, oh, you're a tough guy. Oh, you're a tough guy, huh? Oh, I see a tough guy. He's not even resisting the rest, bro. His whole nose is a little bit. with him? Bro, but why you just sitting there? He ain't doing nothing now. Put him in the car. It'll kill me. How long y'all got to hold him down? This is why you don't do drugs, kids. It ain't about drugs, bro. Y'all understand that. Y'all don't got to put y'all in his neck, bro. Right. Uh, he is human, bro. Uh, He's his talking. nose is uh, You can put him in the car. That's a we bum tried ass that shit. for 10 minutes. That's a bum ass shit, bro. Uh, That's a bum ass shit, bro. Uh, Y'all know that. You don't got to sit there with your knee on his uh, neck, bro. Uh, bro, he ain't crying, bro. Uh, you you circle okay. like in a jiu-jitsu move, bro. You try you trapped in his breathing right there, bro. Okay. Like, you don't think that what it is, bro? You don't think nobody understands that shit right there, bro? I trained at the academy, bro. That's some bullshit, bro. Right, that's bullshit, bro. That's bullshit, bro. You, you fucking stopping his breathing right there, bro. Okay, he's talking. He's talking. Bro, but you could get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. You could get him off the ground, bro. You could get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. He enjoying that. He enjoying that shit. He enjoying that shit. He a fucking bum, bro. He enjoying that shit right now, bro. You could have fucking put him in the car He's by now, bro. He's not now. resisting arrest or nothing. You enjoying it. Look at you. Your body language explains it. You fucking bum. Bro, get the fuck off of him. It's the whites. They love but, him. No, the I already know that, bro. I train with half of these bum ass now. dudes at the, the academy, bro. You know that's bogus right now, bro. You know it's bogus. You can't even look at me like a man because you a bum, bro. He's not even resisting arrest right now, bro. His nose is bleeding. Down. You that's fucking stopping his breathing right now, bro. You think that's cool? That's what You think that's, that's cool really though, not. right? What's your right. what's your what, oh man, what's your badge number, bro? You think Honestly. that's cool right now, bro? You call police You think that's cool though, bro? You're a bum, bro. You're you're a bum for that. You're a bum for that, bro. You can't you get mad. You just sitting there stopping his breathing right Look now. The dude's about to go out fuck? right now, bro. Look at bro. him. So get off of him now. What, what, is wrong wrong with like that? what the fuck? What he got mace. He got mace. He cannot breathe. Get over here. No, first of all. Bro, look, well, you can check on him. He's not responsive no! right now. Get off. He's not responsive right now. He's not responsive right now. He's not responsive right now, bro. No, bro, look at him. He's not responsive right now, bro. Check for a pulse. Bro, are you serious? You're going to just let him sit here with that on the neck, bro? Let me see a pulse. Is he breathing right now? Check his pulse. have this conversation. Check his pulse. Okay. Check his pulse, Kyle. Kyle, right. check his pulse. Right. Kyle, check his pulse, bro. Bro, check his pulse, bro. You right. bogus, bro. Don't do you drugs, bogus. Guys. Don't do drugs, bro. Check what is that? What do you think that is? You so you call what he doing okay? Get back. You call what he doing okay? You call. You call what you doing. You call what he doing okay, bro. Are you really in firefighter? Yes, I am from Minneapolis. Bro, you 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 call. You think that's okay? Check his pulse. Check his right. Kyle, check his pulse. Get back in the Check. The man ain't moved yet, bro. The man ain't right, moved yet, bro. Okay. Where, where? Minneapolis. Okay, bro, okay. you're a bum, bro. Okay. You're a bum, bro. You're Check definitely right a bum, now. bro. Tell me what it is. Tell me what his pulse is right now. Check the pulse, bro. He has not moved not one he's time. He's bro. off. He's off track right now. He's but yeah, bro, OB. go back in the store, bro. You don't understand. No, no, no. Bro. I'm the reason. Under, okay, that's cool. Go back in the store, bro. Go back in the store, bro. He's not fucking I moving. That. I see that, bro. I'm, bro, I'm, I'm trying to help y'all out, bro. You don't need to help me out, bro. I know your parents. I know everybody that owns the store. You don't need to help me the fuck out, bro. He's not fucking moving right now, bro. I just saw that, man. Bro, he was just moving I, when I walked up here. And I know, then that he, he they, bro, they, they did that you to him. Just they, out, you just get out. You just get back out here, bro. I've been watching it the bro, whole time. You just get back out here, bro. Bro, 
He doesn't have a bro. He's not fucking moving. No, do they fucking kill him, bro? Bro, did they bro. Kill him what are you, 1087, bro? You're a oh bum, bro. Or 987, bro? You're a bum. First thing you want to grab is your mace because you're scared, bro. Scared of fucking minorities, you fucking bum, bro. Like, bro, three minutes, bro. He's not fucking moving. Bro, he's not even fucking moving. Get off of his fucking neck, bro. Get off of his neck. Yes, look at that, bro. Are you serious, bro? Are you serious? And you gonna keep your, you gonna keep, you gonna keep your, your thing on your neck? Yeah, bitch. Bro, we, bro, I barely touched me like that, dude. I swear I slapped the fuck out of both of y'all. I didn't want to call the ambulance. Bro, he's, not, he's just gonna let him keep his hand on his neck, bro. You're a bitch, bro. Tao, you gonna keep? You gonna let him keep that like that? You gonna let him kill that man in front of you, bro? Huh? Huh? Bro, he's not even fucking moving right now, bro. He's not even fucking mouth. This is what it is. We gotta deal with this shit. Bro, they're not gonna help us, bro. Right? He black. They don't care. Nine eighty-seven years. If it ain't fake people, they don't care, bro. You gonna just sit there with your knee on his neck, bro? You a bro? You a bro? You a real man for that, bro? He ain't handcuffed, bro. You a real man, bro? You a real man, bro? I trained with these guys, bro. The fact that you guys aren't checking his pulse and doing compressions if he needs that, you guys are on another level. Oh my god, bro. Okay, they just dragging him like, come on now. And I have your name tag, bitch. That's not very professional. It don't matter. So what? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, folks. Don't touch him. I got this all on camera. Watch out. Don't touch him. You touched him. You went to him. So shut up. You went to him. Y'all always try to start something. Don't ever touch me, bro. I ain't said a word. Have a nice day. Have a nice day, bro. You damn near dead, bro. He's fucking dead, bro. Nine two nine, the mo three most important numbers in the case. Nine minutes and twenty nine seconds is how long that went on. For half of that time, uh, Mr. Floyd was unconscious, breathless, pulseless. You will see in the videos, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Mr. Floyd from time to time was heaving up his right shoulder. There's a reason for that. Mr. Shavlin's on his left side, his back and his neck. He can't move that. His hands are behind his back. He's heaving up the right shoulder so he can get room for his rib cage to expand to breathe. Because at this point, you will learn he's pancaked with the hard pavement beneath him and Mr. Shavlin on top of him. In order to breathe, you have to have room for the lungs to expand in and out. And you'll see Mr. Floyd doing his best to kind of crank his his right shoulder up, having to lift up his weight and Mr. Chauvin's weight on top of him to get a breath for as long as he could get a breath. And, uh, and you will see and hear more about that uh, during the trial. You will learn that a number of the bystanders there called the police on the police. Genevieve Hansen, the first responder, called the police on the police. You'll learn that Donald Williams, uh, the young man who's very vocal, security background, mixed martial arts background, saw the pressure that was put on the neck, he called the police on the police. But not only that, you're going to learn that there was a 911 dispatcher. Uh, her name is Jenna Scurry. Jenna Scurry is going to come to talk to you also. There was a fixed police camera that was trained on this particular scene and she could see through the camera what was going on. You will learn that what she saw was so unusual and for her so undisturbing, I'm sorry, so disturbing, that she did something that she had never done in her career. She called the police on the police, a 911 dispatcher. She called Sergeant David Plinker, who's gonna come in to testify. She called him to report what she saw because she found it just that disturbing. She will tell you that she felt that she saw a man literally lose his life and uh, you will hear her testify. Now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about intent. That is, what our evidence is going to be uh, on the issue of intent. As I mentioned, we're going to show you that the use of force here was excessive and unreasonable. 
uh, we're going to show you that it was not accidental in terms of what was happening there at the scene. Uh, that uh, what Mr. Chauvin was doing, he was doing deliberately. Now, when we bring you the evidence of intent, it's not going to come in like a sandwich board that has a front side and a back side. And the front side says, this is our evidence of intent. And the back side says, yeah, you saw it. Uh, we will bring it to you, ladies and gentlemen, through the totality of all of the evidence, looking at it all together. Uh, you will, for example, hear from Nicole McKenzie, the medical support uh, coordinator for the Minneapolis Police Department. She will tell you that the dangers of the prone position, putting people face down on the ground, have been known about in policing for over 30 years that they train officers on it. Uh, she will tell you that arrestees, citizens who are under arrest, should never be put in the prone position except only momentarily to get them under police custody or control to get handcuffs on them, but never left in that position. You will learn that Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs already, so they didn't need to put him on the ground to get him into, uh, uh, to get him under police control. And she will tell you that the reason that you don't put persons or leave them in the prone position that way, let alone with a man's body weight on top of them, let alone for nine minutes and 29 seconds, the reason you don't do that is because of the potential to obstruct the airways. You're also going to hear from Lieutenant Johnny Mercer, the Minneapolis Police Department Use of Force Training Coordinator. He's going to tell you about what training Mr. Chauvin had received. But he's also going to tell you uh, that he knows of no training that would suggest that kneeling on somebody's neck, as Mr. Chauvin was doing, was proper, according to Minneapolis Police Department uh, training. You will learn that officers are trained uh, to avoid putting pressure on areas that are above the areas of the shoulder on the spinal column, on the neck, on the head. And that uh, to do that is using deadly force because if you are putting pressure or blows in those areas, you run the risk of seriously injuring the person or potentially even killing them. It can be deadly force. And so they're trained not to do that. But above all, you know, they, uh, the police are trained in the side recovery position that if you have to put somebody in the prone position to get them under control, you turn them over on the side as soon as possible so you don't obstruct their airways by having them on their stomach where the lungs can't expand with the chest, let alone having a weight on your back. You put them in the side recovery position right away. Um, and, uh, and you will hear all about the importance of that. And we'll all obviously bring you the evidence of all of the warnings that Mr. Chauvin would have received, not just from George Floyd himself, from the calls and crying out by the bystanders, from the approach of the ambulance, uh, from the paramedics and so on, all of whom did their part uh, to encourage him to let up and to get up. You'll be able to consider that too under the umbrella of intent. Now I want to talk with you uh, a second about uh, the evidence on causation, the medical causation in terms of what was happening to Mr. Floyd while he was there on the ground. Um, and if I had to give this part of the evidence you're going to see a name, I would tell you that you can believe your eyes uh, that it's a homicide, it's murder. You can believe your eyes. And here's what you'll be able to see uh, for yourself. You'll be able to see every part of what Mr. Floyd went through from him first crying out, from his effort to move his shoulder to get his breathing, to get room to breathe. You'll be able to hear his voice get deeper and heavier, his words further apart his respiration more shallow. Uh, you'll see him when he goes unconscious. And you'll be able to see the uncontrollable shaking he's doing when he's not breathing anymore, the anoxic seizures from oxygen deprivation. You'll be able to see when he's going through agonal breathing, the involuntary gasping of the body once the heart has stopped from oxygen deficiency. And you, you'll hear uh, and are well aware when there was a loss of pulse. Uh, you'll hear from a number of experts on the stand that putting a man in the prone position with handcuffs behind his back, somebody on his neck and back pressing down on him for 9 minutes and 29 seconds is enough to take a life. You will hear that also. You're also going to hear from other experts who will point to the significant evidence of the excessive force that was put on Mr. Floyd's body. 
uh, you'll be able to see, ladies and gentlemen, the road rash on the shoulders from where he's been pressed into the pavement from the weight on top that stripped off layers of the skin. The same with respect to knuckles on his hand when he's pressing up trying to get room to breathe. The damage to his nose when he pressed his face into the pavement to try to get room to breathe, ladies and gentlemen. You will learn that the last nine minutes and 29 seconds of Mr. Floyd's life, he was only alive for part of that, um, uh, that period of time, but it matches the patterns of somebody who dies from an oxygen uh, deficiencies. We'll be able to point to the video evidence you'll be able to see for yourself. You're also going to hear and see certain evidence of what this was not. This was, for example, not a fatal heart event. Uh, this was not, for example, a heart attack. Uh, you will learn uh, that there was no demonstrated injury whatsoever to Mr. Floyd's heart, as in a heart attack. Uh, you'll hear evidence that uh, Mr. Uh, Floyd had an artery in his heart uh, that was partially uh, clogged. Uh, you will learn that there was no damage to Mr. Floyd's heart from an inadequate blood supply, su blood supply to his heart. Uh, that there was no clotting in his heart. You will learn that the medical examiner, when he was examining Mr. Floyd's heart after he had died, uh, saw no injury, no evidence of heart injury, and it was so unremarkable he didn't even photograph the heart. You will learn that this was not what's called a fatal arrhythmia, uh, that the heart beats rhythmically, and it, occasionally then the heart gets out of rhythm. And out of rhythm, the heart just may stop, in the case of a fatal arrhythmia, you're going to learn that when a person suffers that, they stop and they drop right there where they are. It's instant death. You'll be able to see for yourself that Mr. Floyd did not die in instant death. He died one breath at a time over an extended period of time. It does not at all look like the way that one dies from a fatal arrhythmia. It was instant death. And uh, this was not an instant death. You'll also learn, ladies and gentlemen, that George Floyd struggled uh, with an opioid addiction. He struggled with it for years. Uh, you will learn that he did not die from a drug overdose. He did not die from an opioid overdose. Why? Because you'll be able to look at the video footage and you'll see he looks absolutely nothing like a person who would die from an opioid overdose. You will learn that opioids are tranquilizers. And when a person dies from an opioid overdose, what do they look like? First and foremost, asleep, in a stupor. And they never come to again. And they simply pass away, opioid overdose. They're not screaming for their lives. They're not calling on their mothers. They are not begging, please, please, I can't breathe. That's not what an opioid overdose looks like. Now you will learn that Mr. Floyd had 11 nanograms of fentanyl in a system when he died, and they may say that's a fatal amount. Well, what you have to learn is something about tolerance. So for a person who has never been exposed to opioids or fentanyl, that may be lethal for them. But for others who have been struggling with it for years, then they have a different tolerance level. Uh, you will learn, for example, that 11 nanograms of fentanyl is in the range that you will find in people who might receive opioid for cancer pain, for example. Mr. Floyd had lived with his opioid addiction for years, and you can see on the video that his behavior is not consistent with somebody who dies of an opioid addiction. He didn't go into slumber. He was not non-responsive. Uh, he was calling out for his life. He was struggling. He was not passing out. Now, you're also going to hear from um, a forensic pathologist, uh, Dr. Lindsay Thomas. And what she does as a forensic pathologist, she studies body tissues on autopsy to try to determine the cause and manner of death. He did this over a 35-year career as a forensic pathologist. Over that period of time, she had done medical examiner, forensic pathology work in some 37 Minnesota counties of the 87 we have, seven counties in Wisconsin. She had done over 5,000 autopsies and determined cause and origin or manner and cause of death in thousands uh, of others. She's semi-retired now and uh, works as a consultant still in the field of pathology. She was one of the persons who helped to train the current Hennepin County Medical Examiner, 
Dr. Andrew Baker when he was just getting started out in forensic pathology. Now here's where Dr. Baker and Dr. Thomas agree uh, as to the manner of Mr. Floyd's death, and I will show you the findings from Dr. Baker. When he lists manner of death for George Floyd, homicide. Now I want to explain to you that when he uses homicide, it's not the way that we use it here in the courtroom. When the medical examiner says homicide, it simply means that the person died at the hands of another, is what that means. And I will show you what list that's chosen from in just a minute, and Dr. Thomas will come in and testify about that. But it means that he died at the hands of another. But you'll also learn uh, that he listed a cause of death, cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Now, I'm going to translate that into English, and you'll hear this from Dr. Thomas. Cause of death, cardiopulmonary arrest. Uh, what you're going to learn is that every human being that's ever been on the planet has two things in common with every other human being. Number one is that they are born, and number two is that they die of cardiopulmonary arrest. Because all that cardiopulmonary arrest means is that the heart stops and the lung stops. It's simply another way of saying death. So, cause of death, death. Complicating, that is involving law enforcement, subdual, that is subduing George Floyd, restraining him and compressing his neck under cause of death. And then how the injury occurred, decedent, George Floyd, experienced a cardiopulmonary arrest while being restrained by law enforcement officers. Now, in terms of the manners of death, what you see here, it says homicide. Here, here would be the standard list of the choices that medical examiners will look to in determining what the manner of death was. How the injury or disease leads to death is manner of death, and this is Dr. Thomas will talk to you about this. Five manners of death. Natural. Natural causes. A heart attack is a natural death, you will learn. A fatal arrhythmia is a natural cause of death, you will learn. Accident. A drug overdose is an example of an accidental death, uh, for example. A car accident can be an accidental death. Suicide, homicide, which is when they chose death at the hands of another, or undetermined, that if you can't tell which it is or what it is, you indicate undetermined. And here you will learn that Dr. Andrew Baker and Dr. Thomas determined amongst these possible manners of death, it wasn't natural, not accidental, not suicide, not undetermined. It was homicide, uh, death at the hands of another. But that's not all that Dr. Thomas is going to tell you. She's going to tell you something about the limitations of pathology, that is looking at the tissues of persons after they have been deceased and trying to determine whether somebody died as a result of oxygen deficiency. There are limitations because in over half the cases where somebody dies from insufficient oxygen, and when you know they died from insufficient oxygen, there are no signs in the body tissues. She would give you the example, for example, of somebody who's smothered by a pillow and they die that way. She said you may see nothing in the body tissues, but you know they died from oxygen deficiency because you know how they died. And uh, here in this case, you will hear that on autopsy, they didn't see any objective things in George Floyd's tissues, but she says we have to look at all the evidence and we can see what happened at the scene. And, uh, and we can see moment by moment uh, that he had all the telltale signs of a person who's struggling and suffering uh, from not receiving sufficient oxygen. She will say you have to look at all the evidence and we'll show you that objective evidence as we go through. So finally, uh, I want to talk to you about some of the evidence that you will hear, some of the facts uh, that do not excuse uh, this excessive use of force, but you will hear about them. We will tell you about them. Uh, for example, you will hear that George Floyd was a big guy. He was over six feet tall. Every uh, police conduct witness we bring to you on the stand, every use of force expert will tell you that his size is no excuse for uh, any police abuse. You're going to hear, obviously, that he struggled with drug addiction, that he had high blood pressure. They'll talk about heart disease, um, and we will tell you about that, uh, heart disease. 
uh, that he had. What you will learn is is that George Floyd years for lived for years, day in and day out, every day with all of these conditions until the one day on May 25th when he ended the nine minutes and 29 seconds, and that was the only day he didn't survive. That he went into that circle of nine minutes and 29 seconds is the only day he didn't come out again. Uh, you will learn that. It's not an excuse for what happened in the nine minutes and 29 seconds. You will hear what happened earlier on the day, on May 25th. Uh, you will be able to see how the police approached him in his vehicle over the fake $20 bill. You'll be able to see how when they approached his car, came to his window within seconds, they had pulled out their gun, were pointing it at his head, and were using the foulest of language. You'll be able to see them uh, get him out of his car, put him right away in the handcuffs. You'll see them pat him down so that they know he doesn't have any weapons. And not only that, you'll be able to hear uh, George Floyd when he approaches the squad car saying he is terrified to be put into that squad car. You hear him say, I think I'm gonna die if they put me in there. I think I'll die if I'm put in that squad car. He was terrified, you'll hear him talk about that. He says he was claustrophobic. And then he asked to count himself. Let me count my way into the squad car. And he starts trying to count one, two, up, the manhandle him, shove him into the car with the handcuffs on, and you'll see how he freaks out uh, from that. Uh, you hear him saying, I can't breathe in the back of the squad car, and we will show you in the back of the squad car where Mr. Chauvin at one point had his hands around Mr. Floyd's neck in the squad car, and another, his arm and elbow around his neck with Mr. Floyd's uh, head here when they were pulling him out of the squad car putting him on the ground in the prone position, and when the nine minutes and 29 seconds begins. But you're also gonna learn, ladies and gentlemen, at the time they put Mr. Floyd on the ground that way, there were five grown men armed police officers who were on the scene over a fake $20 bill. There were five of them there. Mr. Chauvin and his partner, the two officers who showed up there earlier in the first place before Mr. Chauvin was there, and a member of the park police. There were five there. Uh, for a man who didn't threaten anybody, you will see committed no act of violence in any way, who didn't try to run away, and uh, who was put in the prone position this way with five grown men, armed police officers present. None of that, ladies and gentlemen, we submit you will find uh, to be an excuse for what happened in the nine minutes and 29 seconds. We're also going to want you to learn uh, something about George Floyd, George Perry Floyd. His family members call him Perry because he was not simply just an object of the excessive use of force of police. He's a real person. And I want you to learn something about it. At the time that he was killed, he was 46 years old. He was a father, a brother, a cousin, a friend to many. He was originally from Houston, Texas, even before Houston. Uh, he was from my original home state, North Carolina. Uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, before Houston, uh, is where his family was from. He excelled in basketball and uh, football, loved shooting hoops, even to the end, and kept himself fit that way. He moved to Minnesota from Texas uh, for a fresh start. And the rest of this you learn about him, his work as a security guard, that he lost his job when COVID hit. He's a COVID survivor, uh, George Floyd was. And he lost his job as an employer, employer was forced to close uh, given COVID. But the point to all of this is that we want you to know something about who George Floyd was as a person because he was somebody to a lot of other bodies uh, in the world. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, gonna sit down in a moment this morning. Uh, we're going to show you through the evidence that there was no excuse uh, for the uh, police abuse of Mr. Chauvin. We're going to ask at the end of this case that you find Mr. Chauvin guilty for his excessive use of force against George Floyd that was an assault that contributed to taking his life and for engaging in imminently dangerous behavior, putting the knee on the neck, the knee on the back for nine minutes and 29 seconds without regard for Mr. Floyd's life. We're gonna ask that you find him guilty a murder in the second degree, murder in the third degree, and second degree manslaughter. Thank you.
Mr. Nelson, do you wish to open at this time? Yes, sir. You may. May it please the court, counsel, Mr. Chauvin, members of the jury. A reasonable doubt is a doubt that is based upon reason and common sense. At the end of this case, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about doubt. But for purposes of my remarks this morning, I want to talk about reason and common sense and how that applies to the evidence that you're about to see during the course of this trial. Reason is an idea that wholly permeates our law, our legal system, and it forms the foundation. And you will see and hear that repeatedly throughout the course of this trial. What would a reasonable police officer do? What is a reasonable use of force? What would a reasonable person do in his or her most important affairs? What is a reasonable doubt? As such, reason dictates and necessitates how the evidence must be looked at and analyzed in every single case. And common sense is exactly that. It's common sense. Common sense tells you that there are always two sides to a story. Common sense tells us that we need to examine the totality of the circumstances to determine the meaning of evidence and how it can be applied to the questions of reasonableness of actions and reactions. In other words, common sense is the application of sound judgment based upon a reasoned analysis. And that's what this case is ultimately about. It's about the evidence in this case. The evidence that you will see in this case during this trial. It is, I agree with counsel for the state, it is nothing more than that. There is no political or social cause in this courtroom. But the evidence is far greater than nine minutes and 29 seconds. In this case, you will learn that the evidence has been collected broadly and expansively. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension employed nearly 50 case agents, analysts, and technicians to investigate this case. The Federal Bureau of Investigation included at least 28 additional agents in their investigation. These agents combined have engaged in an extensive and far-reaching investigation. They have interviewed over 50 members of the Minneapolis Police Department, including the officers who responded to the scene after Mr. Floyd was brought to the hospital. They, were, they interviewed members of the Minneapolis Police Department command staff. They interviewed officers who oversee training and policy-making decisions within the Minneapolis Police Department. They have interviewed nearly 200 civilian witnesses in this case. Some of these witnesses saw the entire incident, some who saw a portion of the incident, many who saw nothing, and some who had some piece of information to give to the officers, and others who had nothing. These agents interviewed the numerous medical personnel who interviewed, or excuse me, who attended to Mr. Floyd, and they interviewed the numerous firefighters and paramedics who responded. Agents executed approximately a dozen search warrants in this case to gather information. And in the end, you will hear a term throughout, I believe, this case called the bait stamp number. The bait stamp system is a way for lawyers to keep track of the case, to make sure that we are working from the same set of documents, the same set of evidence, to, to preserve the integrity of the investigation you will learn that we are approaching 50,000 bait stamped items. So this case is clearly more than about nine minutes and 29 seconds. As you all saw during jury selection, the witness list in this case neared 400 people. So how do we begin to analyze and organize this evidence? I suggest that you let common sense and reason guide you. I propose that every witness you will hear from 
and every piece of evidence that you will see or hear during this trial can be assigned to one of four basic locations. Cup Foods, the Mercedes-Benz, Squad 320, and Hennepin County Medical Center. So let's start at the first, Cup Foods. You will learn that on May 5th, excuse me, May 25th, 2020, shortly after 7 o'clock p.m., Mr. Floyd and his friend Maurice Hall entered the Cup Foods located at 38th in Chicago. While they were there, they ran into their other friend, or Mr. Floyd's ex-girlfriend, Shawanda Hill, and he offered her a ride. You will hear from Chris Martin, who is the store clerk at Cup Foods. Mr. Martin observed Mr. Floyd. He watched his body language. He interacted with Mr. Floyd in this moment. And Mr. Martin formed the opinion that Mr. Floyd was under the influence of something. You will see the actual video from inside Cup Foods. Mr. Floyd did use a counterfeit $20 bill to purchase a pack of cigarettes. Mr. Martin realized this, and first, along with another one of his co-workers named Nabil Walter, went outside to the car where Mr. Floyd, Mr. Hall, and Miss Hill were sitting. Mr. Martin asked Mr. Floyd to come in and either buy the cigarettes, exchange, or return the cigarettes. And you will hear from Mr. Martin that Mr. Hall and Mr. Floyd refused. You will hear that a short time later, Mr. Martin went back to the car a second time. He went back to ask them again, please come inside, give us the money, or return the cigarettes. And that second time, again, Mr. Floyd refused. So, at 8.01 p.m., a second clerk from the Cup Foods named Omar Kamara called 911 to report Mr. Floyd. During that call, Mr. Kamara, you will hear, described Mr. Floyd as drunk and that he could not control himself. He's not acting right. He's six to six and a half feet tall. Accordingly, Minneapolis police officers Thomas Lane and Alexander King were dispatched to the scene and arrived at 8.08 p.m. They were driving Minneapolis squad car 320, and they faced parking southbound in the northbound lane of Chicago Avenue and were directed by store employees immediately to the second location, the Mercedes-Benz. During this trial, you will hear evidence of what happened in the Mercedes-Benz in the 20 to 30 minutes prior to the police arriving. You will hear from Mr. Floyd's friends, Shawanda Hill and Maurice Hall. This will include evidence that while they were in the car, Mr. Floyd consumed what were thought to be two Percocet pills. Mr. Floyd's friends will explain that Mr. Floyd fell asleep in the car and that they couldn't wake him up, that they kept trying to wake him up to get going, that they thought the police might be coming because now the store was coming out, and they kept trying to wake him up. And in fact, one of these friends called her daughter, Miss Hill, Shawanda Hill, called her daughter, Shakira Prince, to come and pick her up because they couldn't keep Mr. Floyd awake. At 8.09 p.m., Officers Lane and King approached the vehicle, and Officer Lane approached the driver's side of the vehicle, and Officer King approached the passenger side. During the course of this trial, you will see and hear the body-worn cameras of these officers that fully capture the entire interaction with Mr. Floyd and his friends. You will see Officer Lane draw his service weapon after M Mr. Floyd failed several times to respond to his commands to show him his hands. You will learn that that is an acceptable police practice. You will see the officers struggle with Mr. Floyd to get him out of the Mercedes Benz and handcuffed. And you will see and hear everything that these officers and Mr. Floyd say to each other. The evidence will show that when confronted by police, Mr. Floyd put drugs in his mouth in an effort to conceal them from the police. 
At approximately 8.10 p.m., Officer Peter Chang of the Minneapolis Park Police responds. He responds to the scene to assist Officers King and Lane, and he helps in detaining the passengers. You will see Officer Chang's body-worn camera, and you will hear his interactions. This becomes important as we learn about police practices. Because what you will learn is that when an officer responds to what is sometimes a routine and minimal event, it often evolves into a greater and more serious event. You will see surveillance videos near Squad 320 from a local business called the Dragon Walk that capture the actions and reactions of, all, of everyone present at that location, including evidence of further concealment of controlled substances. During the course of the investigation, two search warrants were executed on the Mercedes-Benz. The first on May 27th of 2020, the second several months later on December 9th of 2020. BCA agents located various pieces of evidence during both of these searches, including two pills. That later analysis by the BCA revealed to be a mixture of methamphetamine and fentanyl. This is what's called a speedball, a mixture of an opiate and a stimulant. You will learn that these uh, pills were manufactured to have the appearance of Percocet. While standing next to the Mercedes-Benz, Officer King and Officer Lane both asked Mr. Floyd what he was on. And he says, he is on nothing. Officer King and Lane escorted Mr. Floyd to the third location, Minneapolis Squad 320. The evidence will show that as Officers King and Lane escorted Mr. Floyd to their squad car, a citizen by the name of Charles McMillian walked alongside them. He, he kind of joined them. And he was encouraging Mr. Floyd to cooperate with the officers. Get in the car. You can't win. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd and the officers began to struggle as they attempted to get him in the squad car. And you will learn that officers Derek Chauvin and his partner Tu Tao arrived to assist officers King and Lane at 8.16 and 48 seconds, almost 8.17. Upon their arrival, the first thing that Officer Chauvin sees is Officers King and Lane struggling with Mr. Floyd. Mr. F Mr. Chauvin asked the officers, is he under arrest? Yes. And then Officer Chauvin began to assist them in their efforts to get him into the squad car. You will see that three Minneapolis police officers could not overcome the strength of Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chauvin stands 5'9", 140 pounds. Mr. Floyd is 6'3", weighs 223 pounds. You will learn that because of this, this intersection at 38th and Chicago is considered a high crime area, the city installs what's called the Milestone Video System. It's a camera that sits up high atop a pole and can surveil the entire intersection. When you see these videos pulled back from afar, you will be able to see the Minneapolis police squad car rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth during this struggle. So much so that it catches the attention of the 911 dispatcher, Jenna Scurry. This was not an easy struggle. As the struggle continues, you will see and hear both what Mr. Floyd was saying to the officers and the officers' responses to him. Mr. Floyd does end up on the street and appeared to continue to struggle to these officers, so much so that they considered applying what's called the maximal restraint technique. It used to be called the hobble or the hog tie. Mr. Chauvin used his knee to pin Mr. Floyd's left shoulder blade and back to the ground and his right knee to pin Mr. Floyd's left arm to the ground. Officer King was placed below Mr. Floyd's buttocks and Officer Lane was at the feet. And you will see and hear 
them continue to struggle with Mr. Floyd as he's attempting to kick. You will see in here that a crowd begins to develop watching and recording officers, initially fairly passive. As the situation went on, the crowd began to grow angry. But here's what you will also see in here. You will see in here the conversation between the officers behind the squad car. The crowd is not aware of what they are saying and doing. You will learn that several bystanders, including Donald Williams and Genevieve Hansen, they grew more and more and more upset with these officers. You've seen it this morning. But you will also see it from the perspective of the police officers. As the crowd grew in size, seemingly so too did their anger. And remember, there's, there's more to the scene than just the office, what the officers see in front of them. There are people behind them. There are people across the street. There are cars stopping, people yelling. There, are a, there is a growing crowd and what officers perceive to be a threat. They're called names. You heard them this morning. A fucking bum. They're screaming at him causing the officers to divert their attention from the care of Mr. Floyd to the threat that was growing in front of them. At this location, questions emerge about the reasonableness of the use of force. And this will ultimately become one of the decisions that you have to make. To answer these questions, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the evidence will show that the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension investigated the Minneapolis Police Department's training and policies. You will learn about things such as the authorized use of force, pro proportionality of force, excited delirium, defensive tactics, including prone handcuffing, neck restraints, maximal restraint technique, the swarm technique. You will learn about rapidly evolving situations and the Minneapolis Police Department's decision-making model. You will learn about crowd control, medical intervention, de-escalation, procedural justice, crisis intervention, and the human factors of force. That is, what happens to a police officer or any person when they are involved in a high-stress use of force situation. And you will learn that Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do over the course of his 19-year career. The use of force is not attractive, but it is a necessary component of policing. The evidence will again demonstrate that the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension conducted two searches of Squad 320. You will learn that in the second search of Squad 320, agents recovered several pieces of partially dissolved pills. You will learn that these pills were again analyzed were again shown to be consistent or similar to the pills found on the Mercedes-Benz in that they contained methamphetamine and traces of fentanyl. Moreover, these pills contained the DNA and saliva of George Floyd. Which leads us to our final, our final location, Hennepin County Medical Center. The evidence will show that officers made two calls for emergency help. Those calls were within one minute and 30 seconds of each other. The first call, officers called for paramedics to arrive code two because Mr. Floyd had a nose injury. He was bleeding from the nose. That occurred during the struggle. Mr. Floyd banged his face into the plexiglass partition of the squad car. You will see the blood evidence in the squad car. That first call came at eight minutes, excuse me, eight o'clock, 20 minutes, and 11 seconds. The second call was what's called a stepped up call or a code three call, meaning get here as fast as you possibly can. That call was made and placed at eight o'clock, 21 minutes, and 35 seconds. You will learn that paramedics arrived on scene at 8.27 and 18 seconds just 19 minutes after King and Officers King and Lane arrived, 
within six minutes of it being called a code three, and they did what they refer to as a load and go because of the crowd. They came, they picked up Mr. Rather than attempting to resuscitate him or treat him on the scene, they loaded him into the ambulance and they drove to a location several blocks away to begin their resuscitative efforts. And you will hear and learn that Officer Thomas Lane accompanied them for part of that time. You will learn ultimately that Mr. Floyd was transported to the emergency department at Hennepin County efforts where efforts uh, to save Mr. Floyd were made in, at the direction of Dr. Bradford Wonkied Langenfeld. Again, he took important tests. He ran uh, blood samples and blood gas samples. He took certain very important, uh, obtained very important pieces of information. And you will learn that later that evening Mr. Floyd was pronounced dead. The evidence will show then that Dr. Andrew Baker of the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office conducted the only autopsy of Mr. Floyd. And you will hear of several interviews that Dr. Baker had with law enforcement where he discusses the cause and manner of death and what that actually means according to what he saw present in Mr. Floyd's body. And some of this evidence is in extremely important to the final determination of Mr. Floyd's cause of death. The medical findings include things such as the blood gas test that was, show, was taken at HCMC that re revealed Mr. Floyd had an exceptionally high level of carbon dioxide. Dr. Baker found none of what are referred to as the telltale signs of asphyxiation. There were no bruises to Mr. Floyd's neck, either on his skin or after peeling his skin back to the muscles beneath. There was no petechial hemorrhaging. There was no evidence that Mr. Floyd's airflow was restricted and he did not determine to be a positional or mechanical asphyxia death. At the time Mr. Floyd was in the hospital, ephemeral blood draw was taken. That blood draw was analyzed by a lab the re results of Mr. Floyd's toxicology screen revealed the presence of fentanyl and methamphetamine, among other things. And it will be important to know the difference between fentanyl and methamphetamine. The autopsy revealed many other issues, including coronary disease, an enlarged heart, what's called a paraganglioma, which is a tumor that secretes adrenaline, swelling or edema of the lungs. And the state was not satisfied with Dr. Baker's work. And so they have contracted with numerous physicians to contradict Dr. Baker's findings. And this will ultimately be another significant battle in this trial. What was Mr. Floyd's actual cause of death? The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing, flowing through his body, all of which acted to further compromise an already compromised heart. At the conclusion of this evidence, you will be instructed as to the law, the elements of the offense, and the court will give you detailed instructions on what you must find to convict Mr. Chauvin of these charges. But when you review the actual evidence, and when you hear the law and apply reason and common sense, there will only be one just verdict, and that is to find Mr. Chauvin not guilty. Members of the jury, we're going to take our morning recess at this time uh, until about 11.15. I want you to keep in mind that these breaks, we try and keep as much as we can to time, but if bathroom needs and other needs uh, are important, we can expand it a little bit. So I don't want you to be nervous about making sure all of your personal business is done within the 20 minutes. But keep in mind, the 20 minutes is what we'll try and stick to for our morning and afternoon breaks. And so now... 
Deputy will take you back to the other courtroom. We're in recess until 11.15. With that gavel, we are now in a break in the trial of the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. You are watching a special report from the newsroom of the Washington Post. I'm Rhonda Colvin. With me now, Eugene Scott, reporter for The Fix, and James Homan, who is a columnist here at the Washington Post. Um, I'll probably dive into some specifics about what we just heard, but overall, Eugene, what are your takeaways from these opening statements from the prosecution and the defense? Well, it was very clear that the defense wants to make it um, known that it was not the responsibility uh, or the, not the fault, should I say, of Derek Chauvin that uh, Gerald Floyd, I'm sorry, that George Floyd is no longer uh, alive. And we know um, that is not something that uh, the defenders of uh, the prosecution, defenders of uh, Floyd's family are going to buy into, have supported, or even put forward. Uh, we saw the video, the reaction to the video uh, via, uh, as I was just looking at social media, seeing how people were interpreting it uh, after, you know, perhaps not having seen it for months or maybe even some individuals seeing it for the first time. Uh, it's going to make it, I believe, pretty difficult uh, for the defense to uh, argue that uh, Derek Chauvin did not know what he was doing and the impact of what he was doing, considering the reaction that he was getting from onlookers who were letting him know uh, just how much uh, Floyd was in a difficult situation, having a hard time, uh, even breathing and responding and even making it uh, known that he was in as much pain as he was in. Uh, but we are going to see, I imagine, uh, the defense try to make the case that uh, that was not uh, excessive by any means, but a response to what they believe uh, was uh, behaviors or actions or even words uh, from Floyd that uh, necessitated they respond in that way. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see which argument is winsome based on uh, the arguments and the facts. And I'd like to point out, too, that there has been sort of a debate on the timing of how long Chauvin's knee was on uh, Mr. Floyd's neck. Uh, in the May 29th arrest complaint against Chauvin, prosecutors with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, which originally handled the case before it was turned over to the state attorney general, said Derek Chauvin had his knee on George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. But police body camera footage released publicly in July showed Chauvin held his knee on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes. A calculation later reaffirmed by Cahill, the judge, who timed it at more than nine minutes and 20 seconds in a ruling last fall. Body camera video shows Chauvin kept his knee on Floyd's neck for nearly three minutes after another officer told him he could not detect a pulse. The footage shows Chauvin lifting his knee only when a paramedic nudged him. So that was uh, part of what we heard today uh, in opening statements, that uh, difference in time there. Uh, but it certainly was long, eight minutes or nine minutes. It certainly was a long time. And that did come across in the, the video that we watched. James, I want to bring that question to you, too. Did you learn anything new when you watched the video uh, footage that we just saw? Yeah, Rhonda, absolutely. And and we heard the prosecutor say 929. That was the number he was using. Those are the three most important numbers. That's how long Derek Chauvin's knee was on his neck. And and it was striking watching that video again uh, in full, which was obviously, you know, so central to the opening statement that they played it, you know, half an hour in. Uh, you, you know, you hear those bystanders yelling and saying, uh, there's no pulse, like he's not resisting, let him up. And, and I think what was new and what was fascinating is the prosecution is saying that's evidence that, that these innocent, these bystanders who didn't know George Floyd were so shocked uh, to the core by what they were seeing that they were engaged and yelling and angry. And the new thing that we saw during the defense opening statement was using that very crowd. Uh, the defense team will use the existence of the crowd, the size of it, their profanity, their anger uh, to justify and defend Chauvin's behavior and the behavior of the other officers. We talked in the pre-show about the video and how obviously central this video is, how galvanizing it was for the country. But what I was also struck by was Eric Nelson saying there are other videos, that 929 isn't the most important number in the case, that it's what was happening in the 20 to 30 minutes beforehand when they allege uh, George Floyd was resisting arrest and that that's what kind of prompted this escalation. Uh, he previewed the officer body camera footage, which as you note, Rhonda was released publicly over the summer, but he said, we're gonna hear the, the officers talking, what you couldn't see, uh, what the bystanders couldn't hear, the officers engaging, and then also kind of this overwatch camera uh, the, that was looking at the street intersection, 
The prosecution mentioned that we're going to hear about it, that a 911 operator was so disturbed that she called the police on the police uh, in, in his telling. But then Eric Nelson, the defense lawyer, also noted that uh, that video, okay. which we'll see at some point during this trial, showed the squad car bouncing back and forth. Uh, that, that, that is is indicative of, uh, of of George Floyd resisting arrest, which they would argue then justified pinning him down. The question then, of course, becomes, you know, what what about those last three or four minutes uh, after the other officer said he's not there is no pulse after everyone was yelling. Uh, but it, it that is the kind of the legal defense for the initial decision to pin George Floyd down. And it's not just what we saw in that video, but what we saw before. So that was a really interesting window into what we'll be hearing a lot more of from the defense. Yeah, that's a really good point that the uh, number of witnesses, they will be used by both the prosecution and the defense. And we actually have a clip of one of the things you just mentioned. Prosecutor Jerry Blackwell made a point to underscore the actions of the bystanders and preview some of his key witnesses. So take a listen. You will learn that a number of the bystanders there Call the police on the police. Genevieve Hansen, the first responder, call the police on the police. You'll learn that Donald Williams, uh, the young man who's very vocal, security background, mixed martial arts background, saw the pressure that was put on the neck. He called the police on the police. But not only that, you're going to learn that there was a 911 dispatcher. Uh, her name is Jenna Scurry. Jenna Scurry is going to come to talk to you also. There was a fixed police camera that was trained on this particular scene and she could see through the camera what was going on. You will learn that what she saw was so unusual and for her so undisturbing, I'm sorry, so disturbing, that she did something that she had never done in her career. She called the police on the police, a 911 dispatcher. So that's Jerry Blackwell with the prosecution, and he's saying that there were witnesses who called the police on the police. And when he mentioned his list of witnesses that the uh, prosecution would like to bring up, I, I noticed that he mentioned uh, a lot of officers. He said the chief of police uh, will uh, be one of the witnesses who will talk on how Chauvin's actions were not in line with the police department's uh, policies. Uh, he mentioned the 911 dispatcher who was so alarmed she called. Um, he, he mentioned some other officers who will also be brought to the stand. Uh, Eugene, by bringing officers in to use that in the prosecution's argument, is that a symbol that they want to say, this is not you know, the state of Minnesota against blue lives, so to speak. This is the state of Minnesota against one bad actor. There's certainly an uh, effort to show just how out of the norm uh, Chauvin's actions were and, and how many people in law enforcement uh, would support the conclusion that this was uh, excessive. Uh, and also one of the reasons you, you could uh, surmise that uh, law enforcement want to come forward and speak out against Chauvin's actions is because uh, this case, like many of it before, uh, before it, but especially this one, uh, has put the law enforcement community as a whole uh, under a microscope and, and have led people to say that there are some systemic uh, institutional problems overall that are way bigger than this uh, individual case that should concern people about uh, how law enforcement interact with uh, private citizens, especially black people. Uh, and what some of these law enforcement uh, uh, that will testify will try to make uh, clear, like we've seen in so many op-eds and interviews uh, over the past near year, is that uh, law enforcement actually can be trusted far more than what uh, one would guess after seeing that video, and that these types of actions are not indicative of how law enforcement as a whole behave. Yeah, I'd like to pose to both of you a question about the community. When we saw how many people were on the sidewalk, we got a visual that this was something that people stopped, they paid attention. I don't know if it struck you guys, but um, I want you to comment on this. When we heard the audio of the people who are watching this, uh, this event happen, uh, it seemed as if they escalated their concern. At first, they're just kind of calling out to the officers and saying, you know, stop, you, that's too much force. 
Um, but then you kind of see, you hear the strain in one of the, the men's voice when he's saying, I've trained at the academy, this is too much force, check his pulse. Did that stand out to you in terms of how the bystanders were trying to engage with the police and tell them to stop? James, I'll go with you first. Yeah, absolutely, Rhonda. And I thought that the bystanders were, were as powerful. Their kind of cries for help to George Floyd, almost as powerful, I guess, as, as, him, as George Floyd himself saying, I can't breathe, mom, mom, help me, I can't breathe. That, that these other human beings who didn't know him were so disturbed by what they were seeing that they were getting in the face of police trying to interfere uh, with, with what was going on. And, and I was really struck to what Eugene just said a second ago. Uh, you know, Eric Nelson said in his opening statement that Derek Chauvin did exactly what he had been trained to do during his 19 year career. So I think if you're watching this at home and you know this is exactly what you're supposed to do as a police officer, uh, that that illustrates and underscores the need for deeper systemic reform. You know, if that's what a police officer is supposed to do in that sort of situation, that that highlights something broader and deeper. And that's why part of the onus on the prosecution is to explain that this is not okay, that this is not exactly what Chauvin was trained to do, that this is not what good cops do to people that they interact with on the street. And Eugene, what was uh, what stood out to you when we heard the audio of the bystanders? Well, you heard uh, a combination of fear and boldness. There was genuine anxiety that uh, George Floyd was going to die, that he was going to be permanently harmed because of this knee on his neck for what the bystanders would conclude was an excessive amount of time. But you saw them using language and aggression towards the cop, trying to make him move um, in a way that suggested that they perhaps were not um, as concerned about what could happen to them as you would guess. Uh, there was real uh, fear, real, real boldness, real aggression, um, and, and a, a, overall, obviously, a desire to see uh, the cop interact with Floyd very differently from what they had seen, began to see when they first encountered the, the two of them. Um, and, and unfortunately, that did not change in uh, the short amount of time that they were hoping. Um, and as a result, we're going to hire, hear some of them speak about what they uh, observed and, and what they experienced and uh, what impact that had on them individually and what they believe needs to be done as a result. Right, and I think that was an important point, too, about how you do hear fear in their voices, too. And I was thinking, even though we all know the outcome of this video, uh, it was pretty stunning to hear the one man who I believe will be a witness. He uh, had uh, done some security training, and he was the most vocal on that recording. And uh, he was just bringing up that this is too much force. But there was a moment where he was talking to one of the other officers who was trying to stand in between him and Chauvin and, and Floyd. And I was thinking to myself, my goodness, this could have gone all sorts of other different ways where they could have then turned their attention to those bystanders. So, uh, yeah, that's a very important point about uh, the fear that, that also the community felt by watching this play out. Um, James, the uh, prosecution mentioned that they are going to uh, put on the stand two friends of uh, Floyd who um, are going to discuss how they believe Floyd uh, ingested a couple Percocet pills um, during the time he was in this uh, area and also fell asleep. Um, in, in a car. So this is something that um, I guess we could assume is going to be used to bolster their argument that Floyd was on drugs, he was in poor health, and that was really the cause of his, um, his death. Were there any other witnesses that the prosecution laid out there that you'll be uh, looking to hear from or interested to hear from? Yeah, those opening statements, Ron, to give us a real window into the clash that we can expect in the coming days. And what drug exactly Floyd had taken is sort of relevant to the arguments that are being made by both sides. From the prosecution, uh, we heard him say he was an opioid addict. Okay. George Floyd uh, was, was taking these opioids, and opioids are sedatives. We heard the prosecutor say, you know, if you're on an opioid, you kind of drift off to sleep. You're kind of out of it. You're not, uh, you know, yelling and screaming and, and resisting. Uh, so the, the, it was the result of uh, Chauvin's knee on his neck that he was doing those things. Yet we heard from Eric Nelson that while the pill that he took was designed to look like a Percocet, really it was what's called a speedball, which is a mix of methamphetamine and fentanyl. And the methamphetamine is a stimulant. Uh, the fentanyl is an opioid that would make you sleepy. But so that the defense is going to argue that what you saw with him uh, Floyd kind of yelling and trying to turn and, and writhing on the ground was was really him 
in the throes of, of, a, of, of methamphetamine high. So that's, you're going to hear the witnesses who are going to, you know, say we saw George taking those pills, uh, but then you're going to see clash between dueling toxicologists, uh, witnesses for the state and witnesses for the defense, who will uh, essentially be arguing about the chemical properties of the drugs that Floyd was on based on what's in his system and how that would make uh, any normal human being respond. The other thing that was really interesting that we're certainly going to hear witnesses is you heard the prosecution try to preview this by saying, you know, what the defense is going to tell you is that someone with the amount of fentanyl that was in George Floyd's system, that that's toxic. And he said, you have to learn the concept of tolerance that George Floyd, and that's why the prosecution said it's sad, but he had a multi-year addiction. So he was going to be able to withstand that level of fentanyl in a system that maybe would kill a normal person just because he was so habituated to it. And you heard the defense preview that they're going to make the argument that any normal person with that amount of, of drugs in their system would die. So we saw a lot of the fault lines starting to emerge that are going to play out as, as this trial unpacks. And just a reminder to everyone, uh, the courtroom is taking about a 15 minute uh, stretch break. Um, this is something that the judge, Peter Cahill, uh, often does or did during the jury uh, process, jury selection process. So he, he likes to give the room uh, some breaks. Uh, before they come back, I want to get um, another question in about uh, the, the defense counsel and the prosecution. Uh, they seemed very measured in their uh, opening statements. Did that stand out to you at all, Eugene, that this was not, this is not like a Perry Mason episode. This is, uh, they are both coming to uh, tell the jurors, you know, what their plea is right now, uh, and they're not doing it in any sort of dynamic ways. Well, it was certainly uh, different, quite different from what we have seen uh, in some years past where, you know, court TV was almost as if it was entertainment. Um, and uh, I think that is uh, in part because uh, there is some concern about how sensational all of this could become. Uh, their focus wants the focus on both sides. Uh, want the desire of both sides is that the focus be on uh, what actually happened and the facts and the harm that was done, um, or what was not the responsibility uh, of of Derek Chauvin. Um, and that I think um, is leading them to respond or behave in ways that are not like heavy with uh, you know emotion and histrionics and everything that we uh, you know. Uh, may see if this was some type of uh, movie or reenactment of, of, of what actually happened. Um, and this is not by, by any means to uh, uh, misrepresent the, the, the approach that the lawyers and the defense uh, took during the uh, press conference prior to the uh, court trial, but uh, that is something, you'd see more of that somewhere there where you're, there's a desire to appeal uh, to the peop people, to uh, popular opinion, um, and, to, and to pull at people's heartstrings um, about everything that happened. And, and I think that's something that we will continue to see be the case as we move forward. Yeah, I think we can get a clip in of uh, something that happened a few moments ago. Defense counsel Eric Nelson asked the jury to focus on Officer Chauvin's coming to the scene of a crime to confront the size of George Floyd. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd and the officers began to struggle as they attempted to get him in the squad car. And you will learn that officers Derek Chauvin and his partner Tu Tao arrived to assist officers King and Lane at 8.16 and 48 seconds, almost 8.17. Upon their arrival, the first thing that Officer Chauvin sees is Officers King and Lane struggling with Mr. Floyd. Mr. F Mr. Chauvin asked the officers, is he under arrest? Yes. And then Officer Chauvin began to assist them in their efforts to get him into the squad car you will see that three Minneapolis police officers could not overcome the strength of Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chauvin stands five foot nine, 140 pounds. Mr. Floyd is 6'3", weighs 223 pounds. So Eugene, um, Nelson mentioned a few times Floyd's uh, size and compared it to Chauvin's size, saying that this was a, a struggle to subdue um, George Floyd. Um, th that might be factual that George Floyd was that height and weight, 
but historically, this is often used um, in cases of uh, police violence toward black people that um, there needs to be additional, oh, we're gonna go back to the courtroom now. I'll ask you that later. Your Honor, the state would call Jenna Scurry to the stand. Before you begin, if you could give us your full name, spelling each of your names. Okay. My first name is Jenna, J-E-N-A, middle of Lee, L-E-E, -E. last name is Scurry, S-C as in Charlie, U-R-R-Y. Mr. Frank. Do you want the witnesses to leave their mask on or off? What's the preference? Uh, actually, uh, I prefer you take your mask off so we can hear it if you don't mind. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, Ms. Curry. Can you tell the jurors what your occupation is? I am a Minneapolis 911 dispatcher. And uh, so who is your employer? City of Minneapolis. And how long have you been doing that? Almost seven years. Can you tell the jurors you know, what kind of training goes into being a dispatcher? Um, a lot of training. We go through close to two years of training, starting with call taking where citizens are calling 911 with their emergencies. Um, also speaking to non-emergencies and how we can direct those. Uh, we then work with police and fire on sending them their calls and prioritizing those. And also with the police officers on their off duties and, and warrants and lost children. So there's a multitude, there's about four different positions that we work. Yeah, and maybe I should start first with, you know, what all is involved in your job as a dispatcher? What are the kinds of things you do? Specifically as a dispatcher, I take the calls that are from 911 as they are prioritized and send them out to the police officers or the firefighters to handle. And do you also, like for instance, have to answer, uh, well, provide information out? Yes. Okay. And, um, is this just for police calls or fire calls or what kind of calls are involved? We have two different dispatches. So we have police dispatchers who will take the calls from 911 and the information and give it, all, give it out to the officers over the radio. And we have fire dispatchers who would then do that specifically for the fire department. So there are kind of four different aspects to your job, right? Correct. What, can you just describe for us what those four really are? The first one, uh, 911 call taking, again, where the citizens would call in giving their emergencies uh, we help with prioritizing those or getting them to um, non-emergencies lines we then have fire dispatch where those dispatchers specifically send over fire rigs to fires or medical runs uh, channel 7 would be where we log in our off-duty officers deal with lost ch uh, children reports warrants uh, it's called our information channel because it, it is a lot of where information questions happen. And then our police dispatching where we take those calls from 911 and then send them out to the officers based off of priority. So a lot of people think of a dispatcher as getting a call from somebody and then just calling a police officer and saying, go, go answer this call. But it's more to it than that. A lot more to it. Okay. And when you're working a typical shift, um, well, describe for the jurors like, what's around you. What's your office look like when you're a dispatcher? My office, our center is currently located in a, ba in a basement. We have walls similar to like this covered with carpet. Uh, it's a large center. You'll have all the call takers together, uh, similar to how the jurors are set, but you'll have five to six different screens around you. Um, and then in another room, you'll have your fire dispatchers to give them some 
uh, silent so they can work around that and be on the radio and listen to the firefighters. Across the room, you will have our channel seven that is closely located to our dispatch group, which is approximately four people that are giving out all the calls to the officers. So when you say the fire dispatchers are somewhere different, why is that? It's just the layout of our center. Um, I mean, police dispatch is also on the, across the room away from the call takers. It gives them the ability to be louder if they need to, if someone's hard of hearing or anything like that. Uh, the chatter also gets, with everybody together, gets pretty loud. So we have our own different areas for the ability to be on the radio without all of the background noise. So in any particular shift, there are some people taking calls and some people dispatching calls. Correct. We are not doing the same. I am not taking a 911 call and then dispatching it. Why is that? Minneapolis is very busy. We have dedicated um, 911 call takers at that time. We wouldn't be able to do it all at the same time. And then fire dispatches their own fire units for a particular call? Correct. Okay. Now you mentioned having five or six screens in front of you. What are all those screens about? Uh, those screens have different uh, resources on them. One of my screens is a telephone that has hundreds of numbers in it um, that I can use to call whoever I need to for any given reason. Uh, I also then have a city computer that I can utilize if I need to find an address because someone may not know it, I can use Google or any other resources I need from the internet. I then have a radio screen that has all of our radio channels on it, along with other um, public answering points. So we can listen to their chatter in case something is coming into Minneapolis that we need to be aware of. And then I have three screens dedicated to the calls that are coming in, the calls that are assigned to police or fire, and it'll tell me all of the units I have available or who is signed in for different things. Sounds like a lot of information. It is a lot of information. How long did it take you to really become a master at your job? Every day is a learning day. I can tell you that I can learn something new that I didn't know yesterday. Um, to be completely comfortable with police dispatching, it took me about three years to get comfortable there. And as part of your training for that job, did you have to learn about how the City of Minneapolis Police Department divides up the city for coverage? Yes, that's all geography for us um, based off of the precincts and then how the precincts break down into different sectors. And can you describe for the jurors then, and, and by police coverage, and you're talking about how officers are assigned, correct? Correct. And so how is the City of Minneapolis divided up for police coverage? There are five different precincts in Minneapolis, one through five. Um, within those precincts, they all have different sectors. Those sectors are given to the officers. They have specific sectors that they belong to. And based off of the geography of the call, you would assign a certain unit to a different call or to that call. And if you don't have a unit to cover that area, then you would have to take a unit from a different sector to cover that, leaving the sector they came from available. So can you describe for the jurors, let's take, for example, the third precinct. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with the third pre precinct? I am. And um, describe for the jurors generally what the third precinct is. The third precinct is has four sectors in it. Um, the first one being 310. Uh, that is the top of the precinct. It goes down to Lake Street. And then the middle would be 320. And the lower half being 330. The east side being 340. And so what generally in the area of Minneapolis are we talking about? For the third precinct would Correct. be South Minneapolis, east of 35W. And when you use these terms like 310 and 320, what is that really referring to? It refers to their sectors to correspond with the call signs that they use. And so on a typical shift, how many officers would be assigned to each sector? Typically you have one per sector, and then you have a sector squad or a precinct-wide squad that would be assigned to the whole precinct. 
And so when officers are assigned to that sector, they're known by that sector number, not their names or their badge number or anything like that? Correct. So when you're dispatching, you dispatch to 320 because they're the 320 car? Correct. And um, and so if you dispatch a call and that sector car is not available, what's the process there? You move to that 360 number. It is a precinct wide squad. If there is not one available, then you move to the most closest available squad. So somebody has to go out of their sector to respond to that? Correct. And um, or what's a priority call? A priority call is a incident where someone calls in within 10 minutes of the situation happening or there's the suspect that is still on scene. So what's the significance of calling that a priority call for in terms of dispatch? The significance we would want to get someone there as soon as possible. Uh, it's no longer, it it falls still into the, how would I say this? It's still happening. There's a possibility of the person still being on scene. It's not a report call that they would go co not code two. And so describe for us then what code two means. As far as I understand, code two would be not using lights and sirens. They're going without those. So it sort of makes sense for a call to be priority if you've got a suspect still there, want to get an officer there right away. Correct. And so code two, from your training and experience, means proceeding without lights and sirens. Are there other codes that are used as part of the dispatch process and the policing process? We have code four, which would be seen safe. Okay. If we're working with other agencies such as EMS and they're staging in the area which means they're not going in unless police have deemed it safe for them. Uh, police would let us know that it, the scene is code four and then they would proceed in. And so between two and four is there a code three? There is a code three. And what does that mean? Code three means emergent. So They need them as quickly as possible. Okay. I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, in your job as a dispatcher uh, you do a lot by hearing what's going on, getting calls. Is there also some things that you can do visually in terms of seeing what's going on outside of in the city of Minneapolis? The majority of our job is all through listening. Um, from the first call that comes into us to dispatching it to the radios between dispatch and the responders. Uh, at some times we do have cameras available to us they can be up simply for the fact to know what time of the day it is, to know what the weather might be out for at that time, um, to keep us as up to date so we can understand how or what questions to ask our callers depending on the day or what it looks like. But we do have cameras available to us if needed. So explain where these cameras are. What do you mean that there are cameras? Um, as far as I know, they are around the city. I don't specifically know where each one of them is, but uh, they are up and we do have access to them. Not specifically the dispatchers, but they are cameras that are available for usually camera operators, which are some police officers that operate cameras to use, and then we can use them as well. So how do you see them You know, when you're working as a dispatcher? How do you see the video from those cameras? Um, just like the the um, TVs in this room, they're on the wall for us to vi or to use. There are approximately, I believe, six TVs. And so it's a way for you to see what's going on out in the streets. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Okay. And you know, how often in your job do you think you look up at those and and see what's going on? It depends. Depends on how busy we are. Sometimes we are going from call to call to call and you start at five o'clock and somehow it's already nine o'clock in the afternoon and you don't know how you got there. Sometimes um, we can look up and see what it's like outside and you can watch the people walking by. It all depends on the day. So in communicating with police officers who are out working, mm -hmm. there are different ways that you can 
actually communicate with them and talk to them. Correct. What are the different ways that you can do that? First, we use our radio. Uh, that is our formal way of communication with giving out calls and information. We also have our CAD system, and that is the computer system that allows us to take the calls from 911 operators. Uh, they come over to us at dispatch, and then when we dispatch the call, we're also giving that same call to the officers or the firefighters uh, to their computers so that they have the same information that we're giving out. Uh, through that, we also have what would seem as a an email system, and we can use that to send messages to if needed. Can you also make phone calls to officers? We can. And so, you may have sort of already answered my question, but just to be clear about it, tell us the typical process when a citizen makes a 911 call, how that comes through the, the call center and becomes a call to police officers for assistance. So everything is, uh, the first question we ask is what is the address of the emergency? It's the most important thing so that we can send help right away if needed, but it also allows the calls to be coded to the correct dispatcher. We have three dispatchers working all at the same time and they're in charge of different precincts. Um, my channel, which was channel one, was in, is precinct three and two and the other, cha the other channels involved have different precincts. So the address allows us to give it to different dispatchers so they can disseminate that information. And so a call goes to um, a call taker. Mm -hmm. They give information to you to do the dispatch out. Correct. And so were you working on May 25th of last year? I was. Okay. What was your shift? Do you remember that day? My shift was a middle shift. I started at 14.30, which is 2.30 in the afternoon, and I worked until midnight 30, which is 12.30 at night. And I think you told us your responsibility then was uh, which areas of Minneapolis? Channel 1, which would be Precinct 2 and Precinct 3. So then the other channels have the other um, precincts. Correct. And so what was um, your assignments, what were your job duties on May 25th of 2020? As a police dispatcher, it was to take the calls that came in from 911 and to dispatch them to the police officers. And um, incidentally, I think I may have forgot to ask you, is there always a sergeant on duty when you're serving as a dispatcher, a sergeant on duty out in the streets in each precinct? Yes. Um, how many sergeants are there generally on uh, it depends on their shift, minimal of one. And as part of your duties, do you often have contact with those sergeants about calls and other matters? Yes. Now on that date, May 25 of 2020, um, did you dispatch a call to officers uh, to a location known as Cup Foods? Yes. And. Um, did you receive that 911 call? I did not. And did you, but you dispatched a call about that? Correct. Are you familiar with that location, Cup Foods? Yes. And what, do you know the intersection where that's located? 38th in Chicago. And is that in the city of Minneapolis? Yes. You know what county that's in? Hennepin. Okay. And uh, why are you familiar with that location? Um, it's a place where I've been in the area before. Um, excuse me, sorry. And also it's part of our geography to know certain landmarks that stick out. It's a place where we have to be ready to understand where it is. So if someone tells me they're at Cup Foods, I know where that is. It's 38th in Chicago and I can use my computer system to get that address. So fairly familiar with the city of Minneapolis. Yes. And um, were you aware at the time if there was one of these street uh, cameras for that area? I did not. Okay. Did you subsequently learn that there in fact is a camera there that could show the incident you had called? Yes. Okay. At some point did you also then look at some video for this incident at that location? 
Yes. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, Prior to uh, coming into court, did you have a chance to look at what we've marked as Exhibit 151? Um, you don't know that, um, but uh, it's the VisiNet or CAD printout from part of this call, correct? Yes. All right. Your Honor, can we turn on just the witnesses screen, please? Can you put up 151, please? I'm showing you what we've marked as Exhibit 151. Do you see it on your screen? No. Oh. Now do you see it? Yes, I'm using the judge's computer. Okay. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you, first of all, do you recognize what this document is? Yes. And what, how would you refer to it so I get it right? It is the printout version of the call. And that it came in from 911. So as calls are processed through the center, a, a record of that is made that looks like this. Yes. And is this kept in the ordinary course of the business of the call center and keeping track of what it does? Yes. And are you, have you on prior occasions relied on something like this to um, recall what happened during a call? Yes. And is it something that you're able to see even sometimes during your shift? Yes. And would this come up on one of the multiple screens that you have if you wanted to yes it everything looks different um, it would take a lot of explaining but yes we see all of this information your honor then I would offer exhibit 151 151 is received. Now, Ms. Scurry, I'm going to ask uh, for 151 to be put up on the screen so we can all see it. And um, starting here um, with the first page of this document, um, and I'll represent to you that we have not included the entire document, right? This is just a portion of that information, correct? Correct. So what I'm going to ask you to do um, here with the first line um, is tell us, you know, run us through that first line and tell us the information on that very top line. The first line is from the call taker. It is a query of the plate that's in the call and then we use a lot of abbreviations for quick hand information to the dispatchers and it would say outside on 38th Street reporting that there is a mail providing or provided a counterfeit bill to the business. Uh, the suspect is a black male, six foot taller, sitting on top of a blue Mercedes ML320 SUV license plate, boy Robert John 026. Okay, so what I'm gonna uh, do is I'm gonna have this blown up a little bit so it's easier for everybody to read along with you. And uh, at least the first uh, couple lines, just so that it's bigger for us all to see. So the first column on the left, self-explanatory, that's the date. Correct. And then the time, also probably self-explanatory. Um, what does user mean? User would be how you identify different persons involved. Uh, this person, you can tell, is a call taker. It's the first two um, letters there, and then it has their ID number. We all have our own ID numbers. And so what's your ID number? Mine is 123096. 
but this first um, user number that starts with a CT, mm -hmm. you're familiar with who is assigned that number, generally who has that number? Yes. And how do you know that? It It's given to our certain, everybody has their own specific one. If I needed to query that to find out who it was, it would tell me who their name is. But I also know that that's a call taker based off of the first two letters. And then uh, type, what does type mean? It's the response. So that's outgoing information. Yes, I believe. I'm not, I can't, I don't know exactly know what that means actually right okay. there. Okay. Um, so that first line, uh, query, somebody's asking to run a license plate, correct? Correct. All right. So then the next line, um, can you describe for the jury then what we're seeing here, all that, if that's in capital letters? So everything we write is usually in capital letters, but the first three letters are OTS. It's our short term for outside. And then just on 38th Street, it's providing the information of where. Um, we try to be as clear as possible and paint a picture. So outside on 38th Street, we're reporting that there's mail provided a counterfeit bill to the business. And so is this the information that the call taker provided to you to make the dispatch to officers? Yes. And as part of this process, does that information also go to the officers in writing? Yes, all of this information is sent to them when they're assigned the call. So this is available to them in their squad car as well? Correct. And we see then um, there's a description of the vehicle, correct? Blue Mercedes? Yes. And then there's an address. Yes, that is the query information that goes in there so we can, sometimes plates don't match vehicles. It is the reason why we ask, along with the license plate, what kind of vehicle are you seeing? So when we run that plate, we can say this is a stolen vehicle and it doesn't match or the plate doesn't match because it might just be wrong. So here, clear to 2419 Ileana Avenue North, what does that mean? That is the registered owner's address. Of the vehicle that's described there? Yes. All right. And so then when, well the next line, no screening questions asked, what does that mean? Due to the pandemic, we have certain questions that we ask and there were no screening questions asked based off of um, the person not being the person they're calling about. So the caller, as far as we know, they're not going to have contact with. But no screening questions were asked to let the officers know that we don't know if they've had any COVID contact or symptoms. So then taking this information, then did you dispatch uh, a squad car to respond to this call? Yes. And who did you, well, first of all, if you could tell us which sector of the third precinct uh, well, I assume this was the third precinct, correct? Correct. Which sector did you, would this fall in? This falls in 320 sector. And did you, in fact, dispatch then to 320? I originally dispatched this to 330. And why is that? 320 was not available. And you knew that from your work previous that day? Yes. You, okay. And um, so then you, um, did you make an actual dispatch to um, 3.30 to respond to this call? Yes. And so when you do that, make that oral dispatch, you base it off this information that you're reading right here? Correct. All right. And prior to uh, coming to court, did you have an opportunity to listen to a copy of that call? Yes. And we played that for you? Yes. And that appeared to be an accurate recording of the actual call that you made? Yes. And we've marked that as Exhibit 10. Um, and Your Honor, we would offer Exhibit 10 at this time. Can I Can you play Exhibit 10, please? 2004, 23, May 
On 38, they are reporting that there's a person who used a counterfeit bill as a business suspect of a black male, six foot four taller than. Just so we're clear, that's not quite the end of the call, is it? No. All right. We will try again and see if we can get the whole thing to play. Mr. Friend, you want to take a bowling? So in your call out then, you passed along essentially the same information as in the written part we saw in Exhibit 151. Correct. Slightly different based on just what you're re reporting out, correct? Correct. Also the same record. Okay, it looks like they're having a little bit of a sidebar uh, going on right now. Um, and it's also interesting to point out, this is also a part of the COVID precautions in this courtroom. They use headsets to discuss instead of actually gathering together to have that sidebar. Um, so this is uh, a, a part of this uh, type of courtroom style in addressing the pandemic. Um, but we're just waiting here for them to resume their questioning of a 911 dispatcher who uh, was distressed about what she was seeing uh, at the time of uh, George Floyd's death. So, uh, yeah, Eugene, uh, from what we have heard from this dis dispatcher, what has stood out to you um, in some of the things that she said? Well, so it, was, it was really interesting hearing how uh, attentive uh, dispatchers either are or are not. Uh, to officers and the uh, community. Oh, uh, okay. I'm sorry, Eugene, I'm gonna have to interrupt. We'll go back to the courtroom. They look like they've started again. Your voice, that's just an, ele an electronic voice marking the time of the call, correct? Correct. All right, so we'll try Exhibit 10 again. T04 23 May 25 2020 330 330 as you just started is the only available out of your sector to cup food on Chicago 3759 Chicago on 38 they are reporting that there's a person who used a counterfeit bill as a business suspect of a black male six foot four taller sitting on the hood of a blue Mercedes License plate 4, Robertson, 026, possibly hospital as well. Squad 320, could you put this call in pending priority 9? We can take that 4-3. Copy, 30 option, Chris. Copy, cancel, thanks, 20. So that is the total dispatch you had regarding this incident with the officers out on the street, correct? Correct. All right. So we're going to back, back up and run through this a little bit. And if you can tell us, um, so uh, Cup Foods is in which sector? It's in sector 320. Okay. And you initially called this out to 330, correct? Correct. Do you recall who was working in 330 that day? 
I don't specifically know. Okay. And so when you start your shift, uh, you just know there's a car out there that's 3.30, you're calling to them. Correct. And after that, um, 3.30 called back and said copy, correct? Correct. And what does that mean? It means they acknowledge that they've been given a call. Okay. And subsequent to that, there was a call from 3.20, correct? Yes. And what was the substance of that call? They said they would take their call. Okay. So based on what you knew about 320 being busy, what did you take from that exchange that 320 was now calling in? That they were able to at least put their call in pending and they could come back to it and then take their call. They also mentioned pending priority nine. What does that mean? That means that I didn't clear them from their call. Uh, sometimes I will clear a squad for whichever reason, if it's report, advised, sent, there's a multitude of different reasons. And I instead just put it back in pending so they could pick it up later to finish whatever they needed to do. And then um, 330 ended up calling and, and, uh, and saying cancel and thanks 20, correct? Correct. All right. What did that mean? that they were no longer going to be going to the call and to thank them. And so when you're making, um, when you're doing that dispatch, um, at some point did you ask to send additional officers there? In the initial one, no. Correct, but did you eventually? Yes. All right. So if we can go back to 151, please. And again, we'll expand that first page so we can see it easier. Um, you'll see a line at uh, 201008. So that would be 81008, correct? Correct. And that's your uh, identification number, correct? Correct. And so what? tell us what that line is about. Uh, these are the actions that I did uh, to back the squad 320 up with 330 and then 830. And so when you're saying backed up 320 with 330, what does that mean? What do you Additional squads are in route. And so did you request that or was that information you got that they were going to back up 320? I, I backed them up. Okay. Do you recall why? I believe I don't remember specifically that I heard something loud in the background and asked for additional squads until code four. And you did that as well with 830, correct? Correct. And what does 830 refer to? Squad 830 is a park squad. And by park squad, you mean what? They're a Minneapolis park officer. So it's the park police work for the city of Minneapolis as well. Correct. And so they can respond to calls in Minneapolis even though it's not in a park. Correct. Right. And so then can you tell us uh, a few lines down at 2011.02, uh, do you see that line? Yes. And describe for us what's, uh, what is listed there. They are taking one out. Okay. And what does that mean? They are taking a person out of the vehicle. Is that customary for officers to call that in? Yes. And the right below that is a, is a license plate number, correct? Yes. Right. And we have removed the identifying information from that, correct? Correct. That's why there's a gap there. Mm -hmm. And though there is a, a street address in Minneapolis, correct? Yes. And that's on Ilion Avenue? Correct. Where is that in Minneapolis generally, do you know? That is in the 4th Precinct. So which side of Minneapolis is that? That is on the north side of Minneapolis. And so this information has gone out to the officers as well, that, that address. Correct. And then um, following down um, to 2012-21, do you see that entry? Yes. And can you describe for the jurors what's depicted on that line? It is squad 320 is code four. And so that means what to you? Scene C. And incidentally, this 2012 is military time. That's 8-12, correct? Correct. 
I suspect you're far more accustomed to translating that than the rest of us. Very much. Yeah. And then the next line down, uh, can you describe for the jurors what's there? Uh, it says 830 is out with squad 320. That is when the squad arrived. That is when the what? I'm sorry. The 830 park squad is now with squad 320 at that location. Okay. And then if we move down to the next line, a whole bunch of stuff there. Mm -hmm. Not really concerned. That's just all coding for some information requested, I assume. Yes, that is uh, 830 put something in the call. Okay. So then we'll uh, move to the next page and we'll expand this so we can see it. And actually these two pages, we'll probably pull up both at the same time so we can look at them uh, as we go along. Um, drawing your attention to the second line at 202011, do you see that? Yes. And can you describe what's uh, listed there, what, what that line is about? I believe I heard EMS code 2 for a mouth injury requested by the squad. And so that's 320 calling in for that, correct? Correct. And so code 2, you told us earlier, means what? Non-emergent. And then um, describe for us then what's depicted in the next line at 202135. Squad 330 requested EMS code 3. So this is um, now upgrade. 330 upgrading the call to code 3. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. And um, so they're asking for the ambulance to come quicker. Correct. And just to be clear, when we talk about EMS, we might think of that as an ambulance, right? Correct. All right. And then the next line at 2027, 20, 21, can you describe for the jurors what's depicted there? It was information for the paramedics that police had the male restrained on the ground. And incidentally, are you able to tell you know, who called that in, whether it was, or which squad it was? I would be able to if I read the portable number, okay. but I did not. But not on this, uh, not on this printout, correct? Correct. All right. So then, um, the next line down at 202836, do you see that? Yes. Can you describe for the jurors what that line has there? So we first start out with a different um, number, so the, the long numbers with all the zeros, and then that is a paramedic writing into the call, and it says rig 412 is requesting fire code 3. So we're adding additional agency to that. Now explain why, like is EMS different than fire? Yes. How so? EMS, we have two different um, EMS companies we work with, North and then Hennepin County, Hennepin EMS. Um, and this is them writing in here, adding the additional fire. Fire is clearly firefighters, but they are medically trained. They can be anywhere in the city close to within four minutes. So this is the paramedics calling in? Additional support. For support from the fire department? Correct. Right. And um, and then if we skip down two lines to 203112, um, tell us what's listed there. Uh, per engine or rig, this is the paramedic rig, 412 EMS is now located at Park and 36, so they no longer are on scene. And so for those last two lines we've looked at, the EMS people are sending information to you or to this call center. Everything's shared. Okay. So we have a shared um, computer system that we use, and when you start adding additional agencies, everybody gets the same information so that everybody can be informed on what's going on. And so this information then as well goes out to the fire department? Correct. Is it a separate thing you have to do or is it automatic as part of the sharing? It is an automatic thing once you are adding the agencies. Okay. So fire would not be able to see that unless they had their own call. And so the line above that um, is the multi-agency fire is adding fire in? Correct. And so skipping down a couple lines now to 203302, uh, can you describe for the jurors what's in that line? 
It says via METCOM, EMS would like the fire department for patient condition at the requested location. And this is something you dispatched out? Correct. And so that's, you know, what's the import of this information? What's being communicated here? I no longer knew what was going on. And I asked our partners, our agency, other agencies, uh, via METCOM, it is a resource group that we have uh, that we can connect radio to radio instead of phone to phone, it's faster. And I asked them what was going on and that's what they told me, so I put it in the call so that everybody had that information. And the next line down at 203410, uh, can you describe where that information is coming from? It's coming from the paramedics and it says full arrest. Okay. So that's something they're reporting into this shared, our shared system, uh, full arrest. Correct. And the next line after that, um, 203430. Again, uh, from coming from paramedics, or their, um, they said engine or rig 412, the paramedics are working a full arrest. And the next line down again now is you calling in, or you handling this information, correct? Yes. And what are you dispatching out there? Uh, adding information that the fire department is en route to park in 36. And then the next line down, 203607. That is a different um, ID number, and it starts with F, which means it's coming from one of our fire dispatchers. It says engine 17, fires two minutes out to 36 then park. And the next line down, if you could just describe that for the jurors, the 204823. That is EMS transporting to HCMC. And then finally, this last line, 205506, um, in the uh, column after the time, 330, correct? Yes. So what does that mean with that code being there? there the, the information that they provided? Right, so is this 330 calling in? Uh, they didn't call in, this is information they put directly into the call. All right, how do they do that? What they that have mean? their computers, um, it's a laptop, I believe, in their cars that they're able to provide information that way too. And so on this line, it, it references the status of the AP. Do you recognize the abbreviation AP? No. Okay. You don't know what that refers to? No. Okay. And so this is really a timeline of what happened during these calls, correct? Correct. So during this call, um, you know why we're here today, of course, because of this incident, correct? Correct. You have since learned the identities of the officers involved? Correct. On uh, May 25th of 2020, did you personally know any of those officers? No. And um, during uh, this time of this call, did you have some opportunities to look at uh, the street video from this location. I did. And can you describe for the jurors you know, how you came to, to see that? Um, while working at my position, we have two cameras or two TVs on our walls, uh, one on both sides of the walls, so either side of the room can see. While I was dispatching calls, because this call was not the only call that I had to dispatch to officers in different precincts. I noticed that the cameras were up at 38th in Chicago and that we were able to see what was going on. And did you recognize what was depicted in the video? For the most, to the best of my knowledge. And did, was Cup Foods in the video? Yes. And did you recognize that as Cup Foods? Yes. And that seemed was that consistent with what you knew to be 38th in Chicago? Yes. And so did you also, when you uh, observed that, see some police officers? Yes. And can you just describe when you first looked up there in general kind of what you saw? When I first, I just saw the squad car. I didn't see the police officers. And did you watch this video feed for a period of time? I went in and out of the camera and, and being able to pay attention to it. I did not watch the whole video. 
or as it was happening, I did not watch the whole time. And why not? I still had calls to take care of and and things to give out to the police officers. So we've marked uh, a copy of that video. Did you have a chance to view that before coming into court today? Yes. And you understand that we cropped it in the sense of on one side of the video there's a huge sign that kind of obscures that whole area. But the rest of the video does it fairly and accurately depict what you were able to see. Correct. Um, and um, so, Your Honor, we would offer what's been marked as Exhibit 11. Any objections? I bar, Your Honor. Yeah. Okay, another sidebar uh, that's happening here in the courtroom, and again, uh, if you're just tuning in, uh, this type of sidebar is a part of uh, COVID precautions where the judge is able to conference um, uh, separately from the uh, lawyers and the other people on this uh, on the headset. So um, this is something that they are uh, have put into place to keep people safe in there. Um, we've just heard from Jenna Scurry, who's a 911 dispatcher, and she was working on the day of George Floyd's death. She said that she noticed what was going on on the corner of, I believe it was 38th and Chicago, the, the street corner where uh, Chauvin met Floyd, um, and she kept her eye on, on what was going. Okay, we're going to go back. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start showing uh, Exhibit 11, and I'm going to let it run for about 15 seconds, and then I'm going to pause it, okay? All right, so if you could do that, please. All right, so I'm going to ask to pause it right here. Now, as I said, other than cutting out the big sign on the right side, does this fairly depict what you were able to see when you looked up at the at the screens in, on May 25th of 2020 regarding this incident? Correct. And you said when you first saw it, there were no officers. Uh, now we obviously have seen some officers walking into view. Were you still able to watch it? when they did walk into view? I was in and out of this video, so I do not remember them walking to the car. All right. And um, what do you remember you know, seeing the next time that you looked up? I believe they were getting into the back of the squad car. All right. And um, do you remember then the next time that you were able to see it generally what was depicted? I believe they were still trying to get into the back of the squad car. It was moving a little bit, and then I went back to my screens. And I think what I'd like to do is have this run, and if you could just watch the video and tell the jurors, you know, when you were able to look up what parts that you remember seeing uh, that day during your shift, okay? Okay. All right. I believe this is close to where I started watching.
So obviously you can see some police officers here. Did you recognize them individuals individually? And then I know I've only, I didn't watch that much. And then the next time I looked, they were opening the door. I do remember that. Okay. Which door do you mean? The driver's side back seat. This is what I remember seeing. And so for the record, we uh, see the officers now trying to put Mr. Floyd into the back seat, correct? Correct. The timestamp on the top for the record reflects about 8, 17 and 10 seconds when you said that approximately. Yes. the officers have opened a rear passenger door. Do you remember seeing this part of the video? Yes. I remember seeing the squad move. And what do you mean by move? So like now you can see the squad is moving back and forth. It's not like being driven, but moving back and forth. Right. And for the record now, the timestamp at the top is 8.17.50 approximately. And I know I wasn't able to watch all of this. So at some point here, you had to turn away and do your job? Yeah. Okay. And do you remember what uh, was the next thing you remember seeing? The next time I remember looking up is they had moved from the back of the squad to the ground. Right. And so when you see that, let me know and we'll just make a reference to it at that time, okay? Okay. I don't exactly know when they moved to the ground. I just know that when I looked up, Right. We were no longer in the back seat. Because you've told us that you remember seeing them on the ground with him, I want you to point out the time in the video that looks familiar to what you remember seeing when you say that you saw them on the ground with him, just so that we know, okay? Okay.
I believe this is when I started watching again. So for the record, the timestamp at the top reflects 8-19-25. So this is what you mean by uh, them having him on the ground? Correct. Do you recall uh, how long you were able to watch um, around this time? No. Honestly, I was in and out of looking at the cameras and then going back to my screens to make sure I wasn't missing anything, uh, added remarks, getting out calls, and then would go back to the screen again. Now, and actually I think what I'll do is just pause it here. Um, after seeing this, at some point, um, then did you look back to the screen? To, to back to the working? No, back to this video of, of yes, the scene. Yes, I was in and out of looking at this screen and then my my work. And at some screens. point then did you go back to this and did it, how did it appear at that time when, when you went back to it? It had not changed. And what do you mean by that? At, it, they were still on the ground. The whole situation was still on the scene. Had there been other changes to the scene? Were there other people in the I didn't pay attention to the surroundings of what was going on. I just know that they hadn't moved. All right. And, but at some point, did you see other like citizens in the video? There, I cannot remember seeing them. I just remembered looking up and seeing that the situation hadn't changed. Do you recall approximately how long that was? No, it was long enough. It was it was long enough that I could look back multiple times. And so when you did look back, still on the ground, like depicted here, essentially. Correct. And um, what did you think about this when you looked back and saw that it hadn't changed? I first asked if the screens had frozen. Why did you ask that? Because it hadn't changed. Okay. And did you find that it had frozen? No. How did well, you I was know? told that it was not frozen. Did you see the screen change yourself? Yes, I saw the person's moving. So what did you start thinking at that point? Something might be wrong. Why? Um, we don't get these videos often, or you know, video at all, unless it's looking at the bridge or just looking at people walking. We very rarely get incidents where police are actively on a scene. Um, and they had changed. They had come from the back of the squad to the ground and my instincts were telling me that something's wrong. Something has not right. I don't know what, but something wasn't right. In what ways was that, were you thinking that something was not right? It was an extended period of time. Again, I can't tell you the exact amount of time. Uh, and they hadn't told me if they needed any more resources. It's a it's a multitude of different things that ran through my brain, but I became concerned that something might be wrong. Wrong with, with what? What are you thinking? It was a gut instinct of, in the incident, something's not going right. Whether it be they needed more assistance, or if There were, there just something wasn't right. I don't know how to explain it. It was a gut instinct to tell me that now we can be concerned. And what did you decide to do? I took that instinct and I called the sergeant. And do you recall who the sergeant was that you talked to? It was Sergeant Pluger. And um, why did you call a sergeant? The sergeant is the police officer's supervisor. Um, you're not uh, a Minneapolis police officer. No. You haven't gone through like the use of force training. No. But in your experience, you felt something was wrong here that a sergeant needed to know about. Correct. Um, if this was a form of use of force, I was calling to let them know. Why would you involve a sergeant in a call that might involve the use of force? Sergeants are, are usually always notified for use of force. And so did you, in fact, call Sergeant Pluger? I did. Have you ever in your career before called a sergeant for oh, something like this? Multiple. For an incident like this? Right. To be exact, no. Okay. Um, 
where you had this instinct and felt something was wrong and you needed to call a sergeant about it. Have you ever had that incident or that situation before this incident? If something was wrong with a call, yes. If and, and not, I don't know how to say this, not if I can call a sergeant for anything because they are a, a resource. And if I'm wrong, then I'm, I'm wrong. Um, but I can call them regarding calls if something doesn't look right in a call, if there's a caution note, if there's something that they can do beyond the scope of the call, I can call them. And have you had a chance to listen to a recording of that call you actually made? Yes. And that recording is made as part of the business of the call center, records that traffic? Everything's recorded. All right. And we played a recording of that for you previously? Yes. And was it an accurate recording of your call? Yes. And we've now marked that as Exhibit 12. In your honor, we would offer Exhibit 12. No objection. 12 was received. And at this time, we'll play that call, all right? 2030, 44, May 25, 2020. Hey, this is Channel 1. Channel 1. Hey, what's up? Hey, so um, just wanted to let you know about the person with a knife at 2602 Bloomington. And then, I don't know, you can call me a snitch if you want to, but we have the cameras up for 320's call. Oh, did they already put him in the, they must have already started moving him. Um, and 320 over at Cup Foods. Okay. Um, I don't know if they had use force or not. They got something out of the back of the squad, and all of them sat on this man. So I don't know if they needed you or not, but they haven't said oh. anything to me yet. Yeah, they haven't said anything unless it's just a takedown, which doesn't count, but. Okay. I'll find out. No problem. I, we don't get to ever see it, so when we see it, we're just like, well, uh, well that looks okay. a little different. <laughs> All right, thank All you. Right. Bye. So, yeah, bye. 2031, 33, May 25, 2020. So I'm going to walk through that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, you spoke kind of fast, and you identified yourself. You just described for the jury what you were saying there. I told them my name was Jenna, and that I was Channel 1 Dispatch. So that's meaning the dispatch first. Third precinct. Correct. And then you talked about something involving a knife. Is that related to this case at all? No. That was from some other call? Correct. And then you um, you used the term snitch. Yes. What did you mean by that? Um, at that moment, it was a word that just came out of my mouth, but it's out of the scope of my duties to call a sergeant if poli if if there was any use of force. And so that's what the purpose, well, tell me, what was the purpose of making that call to him and giving him that information? Voicing my concerns. Um, like I said, we don't see incidents. My job is mainly all listening. And by the time you made that call, you said something to Sergeant Plieger about, or did they take him already? By the time you made that call, were you still able to see the video from the street camera? Yes, the video was still up. And what did you see at the time that you were making that call? That nobody was there. So you were aware an ambulance had come to the scene? Yes. But the ambulance was not in the video at that time? Correct. So that is that the reason why you made a reference to them being gone? Yes. So I was speaking to the rest of my team over there and asking a question to them while still on the phone with the sergeant so probably a better time for me to ask this question but have you ever prior to that date made a call like that to a sergeant no in your job yeah i have no further questions thank you mr nelson uh, should we take our lunch break or would you like to do short cross-examination all right. All right. Uh, members of the jury, we'll take our lunch break. Uh, lunches should be delivered to your room soon. So uh, we'll see you at 1.30. With that gavel, we are now in a lunch break. You are watching a Washington Post special report for the trial of Derek Chauvin. I'm Rhonda Colvin. 
With me now, Eugene Scott, reporter for The Fix, and James Homan, Washington Post columnist. Also with us, too, uh, later on in the show will be Mark Berman, who has covered uh, the jury selection process. But uh, first off, James, uh, the, the last part of what we just saw was the questioning of uh, Jenna Scurry, who is the 911 dispatcher who was on duty the day George Floyd died. She kept her eye on monitors that were in her dispatch center and said that her uh, gut told her something was off. She kept looking at the, uh, the video screen and, and felt she needed to make a call to the sergeant to report use of force. Um, what stood out to you uh, about her uh, delivery there on the stand? Well, hey, Rhonda, what stood out is that she's someone who did her job. Uh, Jenna Scurry is, is sitting there. She doesn't normally have this sort of vantage point uh, from this, this kind of camera. She sees that something is wrong. She's doing her job. She has six screens there at her desk uh, and, and she's watching all of this unfold and she sees that there is some altercation, uh, that the suspect appears to be resisting arrest, that they're sitting on him. Something tells her that it's, uh, it's not right. Uh, she felt like, it, to use the word she was just explaining there at the end, she was maybe snitching on, uh, on these officers on the scene, but she did what she's supposed to do when there's a use of force, which is to notify the sergeant, uh, the police sergeant, and we just heard that call. Now, this is a star witness for the prosecution because it's it's someone who's saying that this is outside the bounds of what you'd normally expect police officers to do, that this was not a normal response to a problem uh, that, that normally they would have called for backup traditionally, which they didn't do. Uh, and, and usually if you're the prosecution, you put your, one of your best or your best witness first because you still have the full attention of the jury. You're sort of setting the scene. You're laying the foundation of your case. And... I thought she's someone who clearly, you know, she didn't know any of the people who were involved. You know, she didn't know the names of the officers. She didn't recognize them. Uh, she was just, you know, assigning people based on numbers and based on geographies. And so she has no sort of skin in the game. She's just doing her job. And, uh, and I thought that that made her an, an especially credible and compelling witness. Yeah, she's their first witness out of the gate. Uh, why do you think they questioned her for so long? They went over the transcript of the call, the time of it, and then went into what she uh, told the sergeant. Why do you think they spent so much time with her? Yeah, there's a lot of throat, throat clearing there at the top. I think that the idea was to establish her routine uh, so that they could show Rhonda that this is not routine, that what was happening, this isn't just you know another uh, Monday night uh, where the cops get called and this kind of thing happens, that this was incredibly unusual, uh, that, that this was this was something that in her years of experience, you know, I think at the beginning they were saying, how long did it take you to become comfortable uh, basically doing your job? She said three years. She'd been, she's now been doing it for seven years. So I think establishing her credibility and establishing that this incident is not what she normally was dealing with, that it was something that was unique and that that kind of wind up understanding the monotony in some ways and the challenges of her job ultimately helped us appreciate the 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 fact that when her gut told her something was wrong that that was something to listen to because she has a lot of experience and she knows how things are supposed to work. And Eugene, uh, one of the things that stood out to me is that we saw yet another camera angle of uh, this event where we're seeing her view on those uh, security screens in her dispatch center and uh, the lawyer played that for her and you see the slow progression of the event. Was there anything that stood out to you in that, that new video where we're seeing how uh, the, uh, the event unfolded? Absolutely, I think one of the things that provided context to just how long uh, Derek Chauvin's knee was on uh, George Floyd was that uh, Jenna said she thought the screen had frozen. Uh, she was that concerned and she was even fearful that she might be perceived to be a snitch, which she went on to talk about, but she let her gut instinct override all of that uh, to express concern because uh, what she did feel was that that amount of time uh, that uh, Derek Chauvin's knee was on uh, George Floyd was not in the best interest of either one of the individuals and something needed to be uh, done to intervene on that. And so uh, being able to step away and see uh, just what uh, things look like from her perspective and to try to get an idea of what was going on in her head um, and, her, and what motivated her to move as quickly uh, as she did was insightful.
I want to play a portion of uh, Jenna Scurry's testimony. Remember, she is the 911 dispatcher and talked about being disturbed by what she saw in the footage from George Floyd's crime scene. We don't get these videos often or, you know, video at all unless it's looking at the bridge or just looking at people walking. We very rarely get incidents where police are actively on a scene. Um, and they had changed. They had come from the back of the squad to the ground and my instincts were telling me that something's wrong. Something has not right. I don't know what, but something wasn't right. In what ways was not, were you thinking that something was not right? It was an extended period of time. Again, I can't tell you the exact amount of time. Uh, and they hadn't told me if they needed any more resources. It's a, it's a multitude of different things that ran through my brain, but I became concerned that something might be wrong. Wrong with, with what? What are you thinking? It was a gut instinct of, in the incident, something's not going right. Whether it be they needed more assistance or if there were, there just something wasn't right. I don't know how to explain it. It was a gut instinct to tell me that now we can be concerned. And what did you decide to do? I took that instinct and I called the sergeant. And do you recall who the sergeant was that you talked to? It was Sergeant Pluger. And um, why did you call a sergeant? The sergeant is the police officer's supervisor. Mm, so that's Jenna Scurry, the 911 dispatcher. Uh, Eugene, she describes that she uh, would place a call with the sergeant because she was concerned about use of force. Um, and then we also talked about how um, she also saw this uh, transpire over you know a matter of minutes and you're you're able to see that this was not a very quick event this took a long time so why is that useful for the prosecution to show that this was a pretty uh, long encounter with the police for George Floyd well because there is an argument um, in defense of Derek Chauvin that uh, his behavior was just normal and uh, permissible and uh, the correct response to the situation. Um, and having people inside uh, the department or the, the law enforcement agency step back and say, no, this actually is not how I believe we are trained to respond to these matters, uh, validates the argument that the prosecutors are made that uh, George Floyd was treated in a way that is beyond um, anything that people would normally uh, be treated uh, or handled, should I say, uh, if law enforcement was operating uh, properly. I think one thing that was very interesting is her noting that uh, they don't get videos like this very often. And one of the reactions that I saw to that statement uh, on social media, which I w I'm not surprised by, is that if this is what is happening uh, from the few videos that we have access to, what could be happening? when eyes are not on law enforcement when they interact with uh, civilians, especially black Americans. And I want to point out that we're looking at scenes from around the courthouse there in Minneapolis. There uh, appears to be a Black Lives Matter um, demonstration or just people there to um, uh, support George Floyd. Uh, and, and that brings me to a question to you, James. You're from uh, Minneapolis. So you have your ear to the ground there. Um, how is the community feeling about this? This could, we're seeing these demonstrations now, but this could build over the next month. It will build, Rhonda. And, you know, the city is on basically lockdown already. It's going to be several weeks in all likelihood before we know the verdict. There's a lot of concern about violence, but there's also a lot of desire for there to be a fair trial and for there to be justice. Uh, the, I, I think overwhelmingly, you know, the, the local community feels like Chauvin is, is guilty. Uh, that's the overwhelming sentiment. That's the tenor of local press coverage. Uh, the fact that the city of Minneapolis gave a $27 million settlement to George Floyd's family obviously shows they believe there was wrongdoing. The fact that this prosecution is being brought, that they brought a third degree murder charge. So there's there's certainly sort of this this strong local desire to see justice and to see 
uh, accountability for police. There have been a lot of police shootings in Minneapolis and the surrounding cities over the last decade, and uh, this is the highest profile prosecution. And so this there's a lot wrapped up in this that's you know, we're not going to hear about it in the courtroom, but we're going to see outside uh, because this is, you know, there's there's certainly been a big reckoning on racial justice, but also the, the power of law enforcement. Uh, the Minneapolis Police Union has been notoriously uh, very, very powerful and strong in the city. And so all those tensions are, are playing out and there there is this uh, desire for justice, but also a nervousness that if there's not a conviction, that it's going to lead to another summer of unrest, which is why Governor Tim Walz, the Democrat, in his State of the State address last night, urged people to protest peacefully uh, because he's he's so concerned about that. So I think there's there's sort of a, a mix of, you know, we're finally getting out of COVID uh, and, and people are finally able to go outside again because the winter's over, uh, but also a, a, a nervousness that it, it could be a reprise of the violence of last summer. And James, what Eugene, James is pointing out, that's what's happening in Minneapolis. But let's think about other local communities. I know you've mentioned that one of the things that stood out to you over last summer was that these protests reached all sorts of cities and states across the nation, even globally. So should uh, different localities, different cities across the country also be uh, bracing themselves for, for potential protests or demonstrations? I think that's possible. I think this, this case, uh, as we noted previously, got significant attention last year and, and many eyes are still on uh, this case, especially considering so many of the different uh, communities that have connections here. Uh, obviously, we know that George Floyd was in Minneapolis, but he was from Houston. He had roots in North Carolina, all of which was mentioned earlier today. Um, and, and there's interest and concern about how this uh, situation, this, this particular uh, use of force, whether or not it was excessive or not, uh, will be uh, handled or treated in the future. Um, and I would not be surprised if activists and protesters who've expressed some concern about police violence against black people uh, were out in the streets, regardless of what the verdict ends up being, uh, to profess uh, their deep belief uh, that black lives matter. All right, and uh, with us now, Mark Berman, reporter covering criminal justice. Mark, you covered the jury selection and your article had a striking headline. It said, millions marched after watching George Floyd die. Now a dozen people will decide whether Chauvin broke the law. What do we know about those uh, who have been seated on the jury? Uh, what we know so far is that it's a, a, an eclectic mix. Um, it's people who have seen the video uh, of Floyd's death, who've well, marched and protested or, or, or aware of what was going on. And then there's also people who are on the jury who said they haven't watched it. It's people who have said that they've only seen stills or they've only seen clips. And it's an interesting assortment of people in terms of the, the perspective and the experience they bring to the case. And I'm not sure if we can bring it up yet, but we have a graphic that shows a composite of who is on this jury. Um, we have uh, three black men who are uh, in between the ages of 30 and 40. We have several uh, white men and uh, I think four w uh, white women who are in their 40s. We're only able to get um, their ages, age range, and uh, their race and gender right now. They have not been identified and won't be until the judge deems it um, okay uh, after the trial ends. Uh, Mark, one of the things that stood out to me when I watched the jury selection process is that um, so many people did discuss a negative view of Chauvin, that they were coming into this already with a negative view um, uh, of him. So there were about uh, 300 potential jurors and about two thirds of them uh, felt this way about Chauvin. So tell me how difficult it was over the last few weeks to land on these uh, 15 individuals. Well, it was very, it's a very tricky process for the for the both sides of the case, really. Uh, what we found is that actually a lot of high profile cases, and when I say high profile, I don't mean the ones that just become high profile after the fact, but high profile cases going in where you have cases where like this and some of the other ones we, we looked at are other police shooting cases and other police uses of force. People tend to come in with a lot of information and they tend to come in with some opinions made up. And what the prosecution and the defense are trying to do is they're hoping to find people who say, okay, I know about this case, I know some facts, but I'm open to hearing what's presented in court and deciding only based on what happens in court. But, you know, in some cases, that means that 
the attorneys have to take people on the jury that they may not necessarily otherwise have been uh, as inclined to take it. There's, there's one person who's on the jury who said their view of the officer involved uh, is that they think of him as, quote, an aggressive cop with tax problems, which suggests that they've read a fair amount about him. Also, uh, there was a point during the jury selection process where uh, the city of Minneapolis awarded the Floyd family 27, a $27 million um, settlement. And uh, that may have complicated some things because they went back over the jurors that they had already seated to find out if that influenced uh, their decision making or could influence their decision making. Um, are, are you finding that that was an issue uh, during uh, the process uh, that people really remembered the $27 million settlement? Well, what was really interesting about that is it came out in the middle of the jury selection itself, and the defense was not happy about that. They were questioning that. But as you mentioned, the judge had to then go back and ask some of the jurors, is this going to change your mind? Is this going to affect your mind? And when other jurors were then called in, they were asked about it. And there was one person who went up on the stand during selection who said, I don't think I can be impartial. I think that swayed the needle for me. And it swayed them toward guilt because they hear such a large amount of money. They just said they just assumed there had to be wrongdoing involved. One of the other interesting things, too, about the jury makeup is it's about uh, half uh, of people in their 20s and 30s. So if we think about it, that's the age group that took to the streets uh, for the protest over George Floyd's death. Um, were there any concerns during the jury selection process of younger people having um, perhaps a, a perspective that may be more in line with the prosecution than the defense? Interesting you ask that because a lot of the focus on the jury selection is typically on the demographics in terms of race, but age is obviously such an interesting factor in this. Um, I've spoken to people on both sides of these kinds of cases, prosecutors and defense attorneys, and typically the view tends to be that older people are more inclined to be trusting of authority and believe police officers. This is speaking in a broad generality, but and that younger people tend to be more skeptical. So the youth of the uh, of, of the relative youth of some of the people on this jury is just a very interesting factor in this in terms of how they might approach police, their experiences with police, and their experiences with the system. Yeah, and I also want to talk a little bit about security because these jurors are surrounded by security. The National Guard is there. Uh, these jurors are likely going to be uh, protected by the Minneapolis uh, police officers who are one-time colleagues of Chauvin. Um, has there been any concern that that may influence their thinking too, that they are receiving help um, from uh, people who are uh, former colleagues of the defendant? You know, it's an interesting point. I, I haven't heard that exactly aired out, but it is obviously something that the longer this goes on, and especially as we get into the deliberations, it's sort of an inescapable part of this is that the entire the entire area around the courthouse, as James mentioned earlier, is so locked down. This entire community is so sort of under lock and key. It's hard to imagine that jurors going into this aren't going to be aware. They know the notoriety of the case. They're going to see the security. You know, one of the things that experts, uh, legal experts, as well as prosecutors and defense attorneys, like I mentioned before, from other cases, they say that they hope the jurors who go in that room only think about what's in the room, not about what's outside the room, not about how the community might react, not about how the people who walk them in and out might react. But it's interesting because, you know, among other things, I've talked to some prosecutors who have prosecuted police officers before, and they say that's something that hangs over the case, which is how other police officers who frequently work with prosecutors are going to feel about that and about them. All right. Thank you, Mark, for those points. Uh, let's check in with Joyce Coe, who is reporting from Minneapolis today. Joyce, what's, his, what's it like on the ground? Hey there, Rhonda. Um, we are standing right outside of the courthouse where all of this is taking place. And here on the ground in Minneapolis, it's actually a pretty quiet day, all things considered. Um, the city has been bracing for opening arguments in this trial. And uh, you know, we were wondering how many protesters we would see out here today, and there haven't been, um, you know, any huge protest presence. There's a couple of uh, protesters on on the street, uh, the corner by where we are, but um, not any major protest presence. We did see some yesterday um, throughout the weekend. Um, protesters taking to the streets down here, uh, you know, shutting off traffic at times and um, really using their voice to have their message heard that they are calling for justice in this case. Uh, you were talking about the security around um, this area just a few moments ago with your guests, and that is something that we have seen um, throughout the course of the last several days and really weeks um, where there is a, I'm sure you can see a, a bit of the 
fencing, the security fencing behind me. Uh, and that really stretches a couple of blocks around this entire um, Hennepin County Government Center uh, as you know, there has been a secure perimeter around the proceedings in this case. Uh, earlier this morning, we did hear from George Floyd's family as well as their uh, attorney, Benjamin Crump, and Reverend Al Sharpton. Uh, they gave some statements to members of the press. There were dozens of uh, members from the media here this morning, and the family really um, had a message of calling for justice and wanting a conviction in this case. Uh, there was some demonstration earlier this morning where uh, the Reverend Al Sharpton, as well as George Floyd's family and some activists that were here uh, on this lawn, uh, demonstrated for eight minutes and 46 seconds to represent the amount of time that uh, the former police officer, Derek Chauvin's knee was on George Floyd's neck before uh, he died. Uh, and, and I think all of this uh, goes back, of course, to what is happening inside the courtroom with uh, Chauvin on trial. And, and what I've heard from activists as well as the family this morning is that there is a, a strong message that they want to send that, that George Floyd is not the one that is on trial here. It is uh, the former police officer, Derek Chauvin. Uh, th there is a lot of concern that George Floyd could be characterized in a way that uh, degrades his character and uh, as far as what the defense will be presenting in this case. So those are some of the things that we are watching for and talking to activists about as this case continues. Um, from here on the ground, things are actually pretty quiet. There is, um, you know, some activity that we are monitoring and talking to protesters and activists, but uh, we'll, of course, bring you the updates as we, as we get them from here in Minneapolis. Rhonda? Thanks a lot, Joyce. Uh, Mark, I want to go back to you for a little bit more on the, the jury's makeup. So, as we mentioned, the jury is it's quite diverse. Um, but when you look at the demographics of Hennepin County, it's about 75% white. Um, has that struck you in how uh, diverse this jury is, that uh, it seems a little bit more diverse in the actual makeup of the county? It is, and that's actually something that stands out. Uh, Mary Moriarty, who's the former chief public defender, in Hennepin County spoke to my colleague, Holly Bailey, who's in the courthouse uh, reporting from the, from the courthouse scene for us. Um, and she said this jury is much more diverse than what they're used to seeing in Hennepin County. And actually, apparently uh, she was saying that over the last year during the coronavirus pandemic, that the juries in Hennepin County were even more uh, dominated by white jurors, the white residents, because of the disproportionate impact of the uh, pandemic on communities of color in that region. And they were saying that more people, more of the people of the communities of color in the Minneapolis area, Twin Cities area, have been excused from jury duty during the pandemic because of economic or employment hardships or responsibilities at home, uh, which was a factor that came up during jury selection in this case as well. But it's notable how diverse this jury really is. And James, being our, our native of Hennepin County, uh, what's your take on this jury and how um, you know, in relation to the actual diversity in Minneapolis, it doesn't exactly match up. What was your takeaway when you found out who the jurors were? I, w I was uh, pleasantly surprised by how diverse the jury is. You know, Minneapolis, Hennepin County is the most diverse county in the state. So 75% uh, of, of the population is, is white, but you know, you go to some of the surrounding counties and the population is 95, 98% white. So, uh, you know, Minneapolis comparatively feels much more diverse than than the surrounding areas. Uh, and, and, you know, the part of Hennepin County, there are some kind of inner suburbs. Uh, Keith Ellison, who's now the attorney general for the state, who's prosecuting uh, the, uh, the, the case. Uh, he's not the person we're seeing, but he's on the trial team. Uh, he used to be the congressman from this area. You know, it's the largest population of Somalis outside Somalia. Uh, it is a, a pretty diverse community, uh, but you, you normally don't see uh, the, traditionally that amount of, uh, of civic engagement, uh, and that's changed over the last couple of years. Uh, Ilhan Omar uh, is, is actually replaced Keith Ellison in Congress, uh, a member of the squad. She represents uh, the district where this courthouse actually is. Uh, and, and so the, the community has been evolving and changing, and the institutions have been somewhat slow to catch up. And so the fact that the jury was this diverse is, is a, a promising sign that, one, the defense team didn't use all their preemptive jury strikes uh, to, to necessarily 
uh, make it a, a disproportionately white jury, but two, that uh, there is uh, more civic equality than there used to be. And Mark, if we can get one last question in uh, with you. Uh, during the jury selection process, how concerned were potential jurors about the fact that uh, Ju Judge Cahill, at uh, any time after this trial ends, he will release their names? How concerned were they that they will, um, their names will be out there eventually? You know, some of them said that they were concerned. Some said they weren't. Some said that they, they knew their names would be out and they seemed okay with that. Others said that they actually told the judge during this process that they were worried about safety and they were specifically worried about possible unrest or anger that might follow the verdict. Um, what we've seen happen in some prior cases where police officers charged with, uh, with shooting people or other crimes have been acquitted is the communities have sort of erupted in a sense. There's been anger that's, that's, that's been expressed in the streets after. And obviously in Minneapolis, the thing lingering over this is how, how heated things got last year. So a few jurors said they were concerned about that. Thanks so much for sharing your reporting with us, Mark. Uh, Eugene, I want to talk about the jury with you as well uh, and the diversity makeup of it. Um, do you think that that is also somewhat of a signal or a symbol that uh, Minneapolis wants to send to the world since this is a, going to be a, a global case in terms of how many people are watching it and, and Minneapolis's actions and how they handle this case are going to be watched. Do you think by including, making sure that this jury is even more diverse than the, the pool of people who live there, is that a, a symbol to the world that they want to make sure that this is a fair trial? I, I would think so. Uh, as James noted, uh, the city of Minneapolis is actually more diverse than most people would assume, considering that it is in Minnesota. Uh, but there has been great frustration, I think, from many people of color that so often in these situations, uh, the juries uh, did not always look like the community um, and certainly, you know, leaned in a certain direction that um, has led to some of the outcomes that we've seen that have left so many people disappointed. And so I think what uh, this jury could possibly uh, be uh, messaging to people is that uh, there, there is hope uh, that the outcome might not be um, the same as we've seen in so many other situations where uh, law enforcement officers who uh, had engaged in behavior that to many people on the outside looking in, especially if the uh, outsiders were far more diverse uh, than the jury uh, would believe was problematic, um, we're still, you know, getting getting off and uh, not seeing uh, justice uh, actually happen. And Eugene, we know from Holly Bailey, who is our colleague who was there in Minneapolis and has shared that uh, one of the cameras has been slightly moved in the courtroom um, to get a closer view of Chauvin. Um, I'm not sure if you're watching him um, while this is going on, but is there anything that stands out to you as, as, in terms of how he is, seems to be very engaged? He seems to be taking a lot of notes and listening. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's not that surprising to see this level of engagement. I know this is not always uh, how uh, individuals who are um, on trial seem to interact, but you know, this is literally his future and his, his life. Uh, I'm sure there are bits and pieces that he's heard uh, so far, even from the first testimony that uh, he, agree he disagreed with and wanted to communicate to his lawyers that that was not what was happening or uh, perhaps that wasn't uh, fair or true. Uh, but I, I'm not surprised to see this level of uh, engagement uh, fr from him and, and just attentiveness uh, considering everything that is on the line. Yeah, and there, there was a tape that I played for you earlier, but I had to interrupt because we needed to go back to the courtroom. But one of the things that we are consistently hearing from the defense is that George Floyd was very tall, he was mm -hmm. big, he was heavier than Chauvin, and that mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why uh, a level of force was needed. Um, but do you find that troublesome, or at least um, when it comes to how the public is going to perceive these statements and these arguments, um, when you think about how uh, this has been historically used in mm -hmm. cases like this, uh, where we've seen police say uh, that they use this force because uh, this black individual was, uh, you know, tall or big and needed to mm -hmm. be restrained? Well, I think if uh, that argument stands, what it will communicate is that when you 
are, when a law enforcement officer is interacting with someone who is taller and bigger, they can behave in a way that other people in their same community, professional community, deem to be excessive. Uh, and it's going to uh, perhaps just tilt the standard in a way uh, that disadvantages people who are bigger than a law enforcement officer. And we know that law enforcement officers vary in size uh, themselves. And so the treatment of people uh, based on their um, size is going to be able to be different if that is okay. It's hard also to understand that even if he uh, was actually bigger, which, which I trust that he is, that uh, this level of uh, interaction was necessary despite the fact that he was already in handcuffs. Um, and there has to be, critics will ask, a way for shorter cops to respond to larger people without putting their knees on their necks for more than eight minutes. Uh, if that stands, uh, you're going to have, I imagine, levels of rebellion and frustration in um, communities that have, uh, you know, raised alarm uh, about the interaction between law enforcement and police, and I'm sorry, black communities, uh, for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I want to play that clip uh, right here. Defense counsel Eric Nelson asked the jury to focus on Officer Chauvin coming to the scene of a crime to confront the size of George Floyd. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd and the officers began to struggle as they attempted to get him in the squad car. And you will learn that officers Derek Chauvin and his partner Tu Tao arrived to assist officers King and Lane at 8.16 and 48 seconds, almost 8.17. Upon their arrival, the first thing that Officer Chauvin sees is Officers King and Lane struggling with Mr. Floyd. Mr. F Mr. Chauvin asked the officers, is he under arrest? Yes. And then Officer Chauvin began to assist them in their efforts to get him into the squad car. You will see that three Minneapolis police officers could not overcome the strength of Mr. Floyd. Mr. Chauvin stands five foot nine, 140 pounds. Mr. Floyd is 6'3", weighs 223 pounds. And one of the other arguments that we will uh, likely continue to hear from the defense is uh, George Floyd's uh, drug use. They've already brought that up today and it's expected that they will continue using that as a central focus in their argument um, to exonerate uh, Mr. Chauvin. James, when it comes to using that defense, um, do you think that that's going to be something that this jury is, is going to have an appetite for? The defense of saying that uh, George Floyd died because he was on drugs and, and that's why um, he, his, he expired. Well, Rhonda, that's the million dollar question, right? That's, that's gonna determine the outcome of the trial and we really don't know. Uh, we can speculate, and I think we have, you know, in, 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 in a smart way, uh, which is to think about, you're right, the, the you know, younger people are, uh, tend to be less trustful of authority, and uh, they, you know, tend to kind of, they were out in the streets last year. Uh, the, the two African-American men on the jury are, uh, are immigrants, uh, and they both said that they have not had direct interactions with Minneapolis police officers before, uh, and, and so, it, it, we can speculate, but we really don't know whether that argument will gain currency with this jury. And also, it's a reasonable doubt standard, uh, you know, so beyond a reasonable doubt. And you don't have to, you know, get every single member of the jury conv convinced. Uh, if a couple do believe that he did what was reasonable, then, then the defense can uh, win an acquittal, perhaps as, at least on the, third or the second degree murder charge, which is the most serious of them. Uh, what is interesting is, you know, I think that the, the broader question of if Officer Chauvin, then Officer Chauvin, he's lost his job, was doing exactly what he was trained to do, then it really is a, a damning indictment of the police uh, and, and the training and the way that they use force. Uh, if Officer Chauvin was behaving in a way that was inappropriate, uh, that he was not trained to do, uh, then then the, the training materials are perhaps not as, as egregiously uh, bad as, as people pushing for defunding the police and systemic reform say. So that, I think, is the central tension of the trial. Ultimately, you know, one of the things that was so striking about rewatching that video during the opening statement from the prosecution was how Derek Chauvin didn't 
look up. It was, I mean, it was, it was almost haunting how you hear all those bystanders yelling, you know, you're killing him. He doesn't breathing. He's not resisting. What's his pulse? Stop. Uh, and, and Chauvin doesn't look up. He's just sort of like looking down, trying to ignore them. In some ways, it almost looked like he was being defiant uh, to not give in to this crowd that was forming. And, and as the judge, Cahill said at the top of the day, you, know, you have to use your common sense, use what you come into with your own life experiences to weigh all of this evidence. And I have no doubt that that jury, as constituted, watches that video and, and sees Chauvin sort of appearing quite heartless as all these people are screaming to let this guy breathe. Uh, th that image certainly uh, sears into the jury's mind. That doesn't mean they'll find him guilty, but it means that it's a, a pretty high burden after watching that tape to put in the, the seeds, to plant the seeds of reasonable doubt. Yeah, and we should also point out that the other officers who were on the scene that day, they will also see uh, their trials in August. Uh, so thank you very much for that, James. Uh, well, we're now going to go uh, to our national reporter, Nicole Ellis, who is joining us from Houston, where George Floyd is from and where much of his family is from. Nicole, we have heard about Floyd's struggle with addiction, which was part of what brought him to Minneapolis. Can you give us a little more insight on his family's role in what he hoped would have been a fresh start in Minnesota? That's absolutely right, Rhonda. We know from our reporting and from hearing about it throughout today that Floyd struggled with addiction, and, but he also wanted help and sought that help in Minneapolis, uh, where he, he found himself looking for a rehabilitation center there. It's also where his aunt, Angela Harrelson, lived, and she was excited about being a part of setting a reset button, both in his life in terms of overcoming addiction, but also in terms of getting a fresh start and, and seizing life with new vigor and new opportunities in a new place. Uh, but she, the weight of, of, of seeing him pass the way he did also kind of demonstrates not only how his family was incredibly supportive of him, but also felt like they, they thought they had more time with him. Uh, let's take a look at an interview our colleagues here at the Washington Post did with Angela Harrelson earlier, earlier uh, this past year. I did not know about the death of Perry till the day after he was killed. You know, and when I did hear about it, it was from a news reporter. I was home and the phone rang and he said, are you Angela Harrelson? I said, yes, I am. He said, I'm calling to get your story about the, the murder of your nephew, George Floyd. And I remember thinking, um, sir, I think you have the wrong family. And then I hear my husband, because he had turned the TV on, Angela, you need to come and watch this. So my mind is racing. And I remember dropping the phone, going in there, and there it was. It was Perry. And at that moment, when I saw it, it was him saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And then he went there, mama, mama. And I just went to my knees. And I said, oh my God, what did I just watch? We made so many plans to do so many things. We thought we had all the time in the world. If I knew now, you know, what I, what, I, what I could have known then, I would have saw him every single day. So you can hear from Harrelson, she, she refers to George Floyd from his family name and his family name, Perry, throughout that interview. And, and she talks a little bit about, you know, how excited she was about the possibility of spending time with him and the time she would have spent had she known that their, their time together would be cut short. Uh, and earlier in that interview, she also talks about conversations with George Floyd's mother, Larsenia Floyd, and the excitement about him coming and, and kind of being watched over by his aunt and having the full support of his family in taking this journey to Minnesota to get the help he needed. Uh, one of the most striking parts of, of hearing from Angela Harrelson is is just hearing in her voice this, this sort of tinge of regret that she also talked about in that interview in terms of, you know, 
wanting to support her sister, uh, Larsenia Floyd, in helping George Floyd come through this time and helping him reset his life and feeling like she failed her sister in some sense because his life was cut short and she didn't have the time to spend with him that she'd hoped to have. So this conversation around addiction, while we'll, while we'll see it manifest itself in many different ways throughout the trial, you know, I think it's important for us to also kind of bring it back to this relationship that, that many families have in terms of navigating struggles with addiction and the ways that may, may be articulated or demonstrated or exemplified uh, as, as one part of what happened that day, but also this sort of internal struggle that so many families, especially in America, are familiar with when it comes to addiction. Back to you, Rhonda. Thank you so much for that, Nicole. Uh, joining us now, Keith Alexander, who has covered courts and crime for more than 11 years here at The Post. Keith, welcome back. Um, so, so far, we've heard the opening statements for the defense and the prosecution, and we've also seen our first witness, the 911 dispatcher. Uh, what has stood out to you in uh, this first section of the opening statement day? Uh, good questions. Uh, what really jumped out at me is really the defense. Um, you know, the defense's job is to, to muddy up uh, or conf confuse the juror um, in terms of uh, what exactly could have caused the death of George Floyd. And I think uh, that's exactly what the defense tried to do. Um, you, you, you heard them, you, you, you all talked about this earlier, you heard them talk about the drug use. Now, we all knew about the drug use was going to be, was going to come up repeatedly. We also talked about, you talked about how, how, how big George Floyd was, right? And, uh, you know, you heard that several times. And, and, and you'll, you hear a lot of the uh, defense attorneys who have argued that this is, all of this is, 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 is a, an excuse, if you will, that people have used that based on the, the, the quote, unquote, big black man theory, that they are a threat. Um, and so you heard uh, Floyd's weight and his size thrown out there several times. It was also very interesting. You heard uh, the attorney talk about the crowd and, you know, that the, the Coven and, and the officers were so focused on the crowd that they didn't really pay attention to what was going on with Floyd. And, and, and also when the paramedics arrived, that they also paid so much attention to the crowd, they didn't have time to uh, so, uh, do some, uh, to work on Floyd when they arrived at the scene. So that's what the defense attorney was doing, throwing out all these various reasons so that when it came down to deliberations, you have the crowd, you have Floyd's size, you have, you have the drug use, um, you have you know, the, the being kneeled upon. What could have been the reason? And the jurors can't decide on one reason. After hearing all these other reasons, they can get an acquittal. And that's what the defense, that's why the defense threw out all those various reasons to, to, to muddy up um, uh, the, the prosecution's uh, accusations. Yeah, and I, I want to also get your take on a question I uh, posed to Mark Berman, who was just on with us talking about the jury makeup. We've talked about race, we've talked about gender, but if you look at the makeup of the jury, about half of the people are uh, in their 20s and 30s. So in your experience being a court reporter, um, do, do generational differences make any difference when it comes to deliberations, especially on a case where I'm assuming many of these 20 and 30 year olds were able to, um, are very comfortable on uh, Instagram or Facebook and are, were able to see the video very early. Um, do you think gener generational differences make any difference on a jury? I most certainly do. I you know, here in, in, in the nation's capital, when I, when I covered courts for, for you know, more than a decade, you know, prosecutors always told me they preferred older uh, jurors, um, particularly older African-American jurors, but mm. especially older jurors, because oftentimes they are more conservative. Um, they tend to want to hold somebody uh, 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 responsible for something. Um, and so they will really cater to in terms of making sure that older jurors are, are, are on uh, pick court jury's duty. So to have such younger jurors, it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, because yes, just as you said, younger jurors uh, could be a little bit more um, savvy when it comes to the media, have seen these videos, um, have been on various social media, but also keep in mind, and I'm sure of this, that both the prosecution and the defense have gone into 
the social media history of these jurors. You better, better believe they have done so, especially to make sure that they have, have, have anything out there over the past year or more that indicates their, their beliefs one way or the other. And since they're of that age where everything goes out into social media, I guarantee you they are doing uh, a deep dive into their backgrounds. And, and something else I'd like to get your take on, too. Um, we do know that Chauvin and Floyd both worked in security at a local nightclub. Uh, Chauvin worked outside uh, doing some patrolling and security, and Floyd worked inside as a bouncer. And the owner of that establishment said she is not sure if they knew each other or not, but they did. Their times working there do overlap for a while. So I'd be interested to hear uh, what your take is on the fact that the prosecution has not brought that up. Now, we do not know if they knew each other, but that hasn't been mentioned at all. Is that strategic or, I mean, does it even matter? Well, it does matter. I mean, if, if the prosecution knew that there was um, intent, that there was a history there, you better believe that uh, the prosecution will be putting that out there. So there's a reason that the prosecution is not putting that out there. Maybe that, that they can't prove anything. They can't prove intent with this relationship. Um, that it doesn't really take their case any further along. So why even bring it up if you can't add to it? If it's not going to add to the case, why even bring it up? Um, so they're, they're trying to focus on the things that they believe will bolster their case. Um, also, one more thing. I know, you know, my colleague James had a very good a point um, watching uh, Chauvin as, as the video was being played. But keep in mind, and I know, I know James knows this, that you know, I'm sure the defense attorney told him, look, you can't show any reaction. Not only is the jury going to be watching you, but the cameras will be on you repeatedly during this trial. So take notes, do tic-tac-toe, write notes down, whatever. Look busy. Do not show any type of emotion or response because the jurors are watching you and the cameras are watching you. So I'm sure that's why uh, Chauvin was just busy looking like he was taking notes because I'm sure his, his attorney told him, don't show any type of response whatsoever. Yeah, and I'd also like to bring uh, Eugene and James in on that too. Um, have you been surprised at all, Eugene, that the uh, prosecution has not made mention that Chauvin and Floyd both worked at the same establishment at the same time? You know, I um, recognize, like you are, that it's early, and uh, some of the points that uh, many of us think probably would be made are still forthcoming. Um, and this trial is still very new to some folks, the details, should I say, of everything that's involved. I don't know how pertinent I, I know or believe that to be, uh, to be brought up at this point, but uh, I do think one thing that's been really uh, helpful is just how much attention has uh, been paid by the prosecution on trying to humanize. Uh, Floyd and for us to understand who he was besides this incident because for most of us the image we have of him is limited to his face being on the ground um, and so the, the desire to make uh, him into just more than a victim of law enforcement I think it's been the main priority of prosecution right now. Yeah and James uh, is that your take as well is that this day and, and the prosecution's uh, efforts are to humanize Floyd instead of bringing any other details in? Yeah, well, and th that could end up being a humanizing detail, you know, that this isn't just some, uh, you know, caricature that the defense tries to portray him as later in the trial. And and so I, th I think some of that could come out later from witnesses. We could have witnesses who worked with, with both men uh, in those respective capacities uh, that could speak to uh, Chauvin's past uh, misconduct allegations or Floyd's past uh, drug use. Yeah, I think a lot of that will come out in the in the next few days. All right. In the prosecution's opening statement, Jerry Blackwell told jurors that this case was not about putting policing in America on trial. He said he wanted them to focus instead on one man. One of those things that this case is not about all police or all policing. You will learn from Chief Arredondo when he comes that police officers have difficult jobs. They have to make split second decisions. They sometimes have to make split second life and death decisions. In this trial, you're gonna meet any number of the men and women from the Minneapolis Police Department who do a fantastic job. They're committed, 
take very seriously preserving the sanctity of life. I mentioned already Commander Katie Blackwell, Sergeant Kara Yang, um, Officer Nicole McKenzie, to name a few. This case is about Mr. Derek Chauvin and not about any of those men and women, and it's not about all policing at all. And this case is not about split second decision making. In nine minutes and 29 seconds, there are 479 seconds, not a split second a month. That's what this case is about. Keith, I want to pose this question to you. Um, Mr. Blackwell is talking about the witnesses that he uh, intends to bring forward, and he said a lot of them are going to be officers. So is that smart to bring in officers uh, from the Minneapolis Police Department, people with a law enforcement background, put them on the stand? They weren't officers who might have been there at the time or on the scene, but is it smart to include their perspective in this case? It is definitely smart. What the prosecution is trying to show is this, that officers have been trained to do X, Y, and Z, and that officers who go above or beyond that, so who use excessive force, should be held accountable, and that Tobin used, he used excessive force. So they're trying to establish the fact that these officers were trained to know better. And you're going to hear repeatedly these officers say, we know what to do and what not to do. And what our, our former colleague did was what not to do. So that's a lot of what they're going to do. What's also very interesting is that if the prosecution pulls, uh, calls on the, the chief of police, which I, I see he is on the uh, witness list, what's going to happen is they're going to try to talk a little bit about Chauvin's background. Mm -hmm. But what's going to be interesting is to see how the defense uh, tries to stop that. Because remember, uh, the defense does not want Tobin's prior uh, six allegations of excessive force to come out. Now, if the, if, uh, if the uh, chief of police gets on the stand and talks about or hints about his background, then that will open the door for the prosecution to get uh, Tobin's uh, past excessive force complaints brought into court. So you have to listen carefully to how often the defense uh, uh, will try to object uh, to the questioning that comes forward because that's going to be very key. Also, what surprised me in this case, I was surprised, just like, like you know, as Gina people said, I was surprised the prosecution did not put on family members of Floyd immediately. In the cases that I've covered, right after the prosecution does an opening statement, the first witness up is going to be a family member to, to humanize the victim, to let people know this person was a, a brother uh, an uncle, a, a, a father, and not a headline, not just a, a story, but an actual person. So I was, was surprised that the first person up for the prosecution was not a family member, but instead a, a 911 uh, dispatcher. Hmm, that, that's really interesting. Also, you mentioned uh, Chauvin's background, that he does, he had a, a number of complaints. He was the subject of a number of complaints of use of force. So there is history um, with him using a, a level of force that was concerning. Uh, and you worked on our uh, police uh, shooting database, won a Pulitzer, part of that team who won a Pulitzer. Is it common for officers who have um, been uh, the focus of uh, complaints about their force to do it again? Or, you know, is it possible that an officer does it once and is uh, reprimanded? You know, one of the things we did back in 2015 was, was we did look at the background of these officers who were uh, uh, involved in multiple killings. And what we found was just that, that these officers have had a history of, 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 of excessive force uh, allegations levied uh, against them. But, you know, these officers are represented by very strong unions. And oftentimes these officers just have a slap on the wrist or a retraining, um, or the officer can say he or she was in fear for their life. Um, and that is, that's the, the defense that often gets them out of trouble when they say they were in fear for their life. So these officers remain um, on the force or they'll go to another department and work and continue to, to continue to patrol the streets. So yes, these officers who are have multiple uh, excessive force allegations levied against them uh, will often stay within the department for years. Hmm. All right. Uh, you're watching a special report from the Washington Post. The trial of Derek Chauvin is on a lunch break. We'll be right back with more reporting and analysis.
Sometimes you have to see to believe. Sometimes waiting isn't an option. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written with our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer at WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public, protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you. A big day in the trial of Derek Chauvin. You are watching a Washington Post special report. I'm Rhonda Colvin. Today we heard opening statements and first witnesses in a case that has been described as one of the most important trials in American history, the state of Minnesota versus Derek Chauvin. My guests this afternoon, Eugene Scott, James Homan, and Keith Alexander. So James, as I just mentioned, that this is being closely watched. This is uh, looking um, at, at, to become uh, one of the more historic trials uh, in America. Why should we be looking at it um, in, in a historic lens? Well, Rhonda, because it is a, it is a referendum on, on policing and accountability. You know, I think in the short term, we should be watching it because it will tell us a lot about those other officers that are also gonna be prosecuted. Uh, their defense lawyers are working behind the scenes with Eric Nelson, Officer Chauvin's uh, attorney, uh, to coordinate to some degree, uh, because if this prosecution isn't successful, uh, then it, the prosecution against the other officers who didn't kneel on uh, the, the victim's neck uh, certainly will be challenging. Uh, and so it is this sort of test of in 2021 in America, after all the protests of last summer, uh, after everything that's happened, can they get a conviction? Uh, and you know, I think the Rodney King trial uh, is is certainly a, a benchmark to compare it against. And uh, and you know, as Keith said a few hours ago, uh, the Emmett Till trial of the 1950s. This is in league with those, uh, and will say a lot about what uh, what is acceptable and not acceptable for police in America. And Eugene, uh, to you, you cover identity and race uh, as part of the FIX team. To you, what does this trial mean uh, when uh, people are calling it sort of a barometer or a gauge on race in America? Well, I think this trial will uh, determine to some degree whether or not uh, we have made uh, you know, some strides or whether or not this is a turning point. Uh, regarding this issue in the ways that many people really thought it was uh, last summer. If you recall, about a month after um, uh, uh, George Floyd was killed, the majority of Americans, uh, according to various polls, were supportive or at least sympathetic uh, of Black Lives Matter and anti-racist um, protesters. And that wasn't where uh, we were before uh, this trial. And so people are really trying to figure out um, if, if this will be the case that could lead to some uh, significant change in terms of how uh, law enforcement interacts with uh, black Americans. And, and if not, why and what else needs to be done? Yeah, I, I want to kick this question over to Keith. You raise an interesting point there, Eugene, that this was not uh, the reaction to George Floyd's death was not what we had seen before with other viral videos. And I was thinking, you know, over the summer I've covered instances of uh, police use of force and how these videos go very viral very quickly. They're consumed and then we move on to the next. Sometimes we don't even remember the person's name. But this time was incredibly different, and, and I'd like to explore the reasons uh, of why you think that might be the case. We've talked about the fact that it could have been because we were in a pandemic. Well, well we still are, <laughs> are in a pandemic, but back then we were in lockdown and we were all um, captive audiences for this video. But to you, why do you think the George Floyd death uh, spurred what it did? You know, I, I think a lot of it was the video. It was the audio. It was of hearing Floyd you know, crying out for his mother. You know, I, I've heard a lot of people talk, especially mothers, um, talk about how that resonated with them. Um, white mothers, how that resonated with them. I think that was a, a, hear, hearing his voice uh, crying out in pain, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, calling out for his mother. I think that really, really gripped a lot of people. And also hearing the voices of the people behind them, the crowd, pleading and pleading and pleading. Um, uh, uh, for 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 the officers to do something. So I think just the the emotion 
on both of all everyone involved. I think that really, really uh, gripped a lot of people. You know, and also, I, I, you know, I, I know Gene and James were saying that this is also you know, the whole race issue. I, I definitely believe race is definitely, you know, exam, examined here in this case. But I also think that this case, more so than any other case, is going to be about policing. I really think that this case is going to be the, the, a watershed moment in terms of uh, excessive force and whether or not jurors or this country is saying enough is enough when it comes to excessive force. Because now we saw it, we saw the results of it. And I think now people are looking at this whole prism of excessive force really does exist. And I think that's really also going to be, along with race, I think that also is going to be a, a watershed moment with this, with this case. And Keith, the fact that there are so many camera angles uh, of this event, we've just seen uh, the 911 dispatcher, her view of what she saw on the screens in her dispatch center, that, that was a new view of this. Um, and then we also have the body cam footage as well. And then of course we have the viral video. Uh, having that many um, perspectives to tell this entire story, does that, does that help um, the prosecution at all? You better believe it does. Every time the prosecution puts up a video from a different angle, that video, the, the last moments of this man's life, of George Floyd's life, are, are, are being shown over and over and over again from various vantage points. But it, the bottom line is, is that video keeps coming out. And the defense can't argue that it's repetitive because these are different uh, uh, videos, it's, it's different evidence. So, but it's still the same effect over and over in seeing this. So yes, the prosecution are using all of these cameras to its advantage to get that story out and to get that image in front of the jurors over and over. And not just the image, but when there's audio, the audio as well. And Keith, one uh, last question to you. Um, we heard the rundown of witnesses that both teams want to bring. So that includes officers. That includes also the owner of Cup Foods, uh, who uh, I guess initially made the call um, and uh, that the officers were responding to. There's also going to be a couple minors we're expecting, specifically uh, the one young woman who shot the video uh, that went viral first. Um, out of the rundown of people that we're expecting to hear from in this week and in the coming weeks, is there any one witness that you're gonna be looking out to listen to? Oh, most definitely. Oh, the, the medical examiner. You better believe the medical examiner is gonna be on, is gonna be on the witness stand for more than a day. Um, because there's going to be so many parts about, you know, whether or not it was it was the neck or was the chest compression, was the drugs. The medical examiner is going to be key for both sides. Uh, definitely the medical examiner. That's going to be um, uh, that people really want to tune in for. But also this you know, this young lady. Remember the young lady who who shot this video that went viral. She was only 17. She wasn't even an adult. She was a 17 year old girl who shot this video and who watched a man die in front of her. So I really wanna hear from her as well. I think she will be very telling uh, to, to hear from her as well. So the medical examiner and this young lady uh, who shot the video are, are definitely the witnesses that people are gonna, gonna wanna, wanna hear from. Yeah, and to add to that, she was on the scene because she was uh, babysitting her uh, nine-year-old cousin, I believe, and, and the little girl asked to go to the store, and that's why they were on the scene, and they may bring that uh, younger girl, uh, too, to testify as an eyewitness. Uh, I'm also going to pose this question to James, too. Out of the rundown of witnesses that we have heard that we will uh, be hearing from, are there any uh, individuals that you're interested in hearing from? Absolutely. In, in addition to the two that Keith just talked about, it will be really interesting to hear from the chief of the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, the the anyone talking about police training, how systemic these problems are, if at all, versus uh, one bad officer who didn't follow the rules. Uh, I, I, it will be fascinating to see uh, police officers essentially testifying against another police officer. And Eugene also want to bring you in on this. Is there anyone that you are interested in hearing from? I really want to hear more from the family. 
I really want to hear more from people who actually knew uh, George Floyd and could provide some context to who he was, who could uh, humanize even the, the problems related to his addiction to help people understand uh, where he came from and how he got to where he is. I know we did a great piece uh, in the Washington Post about his upbringing um, you know, in Houston, and it'll be good to hear more about that. All right, we'll leave it there and go back to the Hennepin County Courthouse uh, where Judge Cahill has uh, just returned. Okay, just a reminder, you're still under oath. Okay, thank you. Mr. Nelson. Sure. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hey. We'll get started while my computer resets. Hopefully it'll work in time. Um, so Ms. Scurry, you testified that you have been a 911 dispatcher for approximately seven years at this point, is that correct? Yeah. And I just kind of want to roughly go back over, um, you described sort of four areas that you do, correct? Correct. So as I understand it, the first area is there are days or shifts where you have, uh, you may be the actual call taker. Is that correct? Correct. And so as a call taker, someone, a citizen calls 911, you pick up the phone and respond to whatever that call for service is. Is that correct? Correct. And then you'll type it into a system. That information will get sent over to a dispatcher, correct? Correct. And the dispatcher is the person who is in charge of communicating with and assigning officers to calls, correct? Correct. And there are days when you show up for work and you're assigned to be the dispatcher, correct? Correct. Um, you also described a third part of your job is to be the fire dispatcher, which is separate from police. Correct. Now, in preparation uh, for trial, um, I believe on March 2nd, you met with members of the prosecution team, correct? Correct. And you made a statement, uh, apparently made a statement that police is more fluid than fire. What did you mean by that? Correct. So when fire calls come in, they, let's start over. There are most generally not times where the fire department comes upon an issue. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen where we can assign a rig that's come across someone who might be down on the ground or anything like that. But when a structure fire comes in, it's not because they were out driving around. It's because someone called soft flames or smoke, whatever prompted them to call. And then we send the rigs to where they need to go. Okay. So basically, whereas police, they may be driving around and they may just see two people fighting on the corner, stop and have to deal with it, right? Correct. And so, um, Dispatching to police officers is a different process than dispatching to fire. You are correct. All right, so we've got the call taker, the dispatcher, the fire dispatcher, and what was the fourth aspect again? We call it our channel seven. It's an information channel. Uh, we mainly use it for officers coming in for off duties. Okay. Or when someone reports a lost child, we have dirt different um, computers that we use to make sure we can log them appropriately in our national database. Okay, so um, the channel seven responsibilities may include, um, when you say off duties, those are police officers who are hired as security at local businesses, things of that nature? Yes. So even though the officer is not on duty as a Minneapolis police officer, a business hires them and they still act as a police officer, correct? Correct. Um, now, and then there are those other, the lost children, things of that nature. Yes. Right? You also okay. described that the city of Minneapolis is comprised of five precincts, correct? You are correct. Uh, first precinct being downtown, is that correct? Yes. And downtown is broken into two sectors, correct? Correct. And then you have the second precinct, which is the northeast, right? Correct. The third precinct, which is the southeast, correct. right? The fourth precinct, which is the North Minneapolis, northwest side of the city, right? Correct. 
and the fifth precinct, which is the southwest side of the city. You are correct. All right. All right. And each of those five precincts, like the first precinct has two sectors. Mm -hmm. The four, third precinct, you said, had four sectors, right? Correct. And um, so essentially, there would be two squad cars downtown, four in southeast Minneapolis, and that's the totality of the police force in those two parts of the city. I mean, as far as patrol. Patrol. At, at certain times, it can be more. Right. It depends on the shifts and when they're on. So there may be an event or a concert, and they may bring in extra people, or something's going on where they would need extra officers? Correct. And oftentimes, um, there are fewer officers than are assigned sectors, correct? There's usually always at least one squad per sector. Okay. Um, but those, like, officers call in sick or they go on training, and so the, the numbers of officers on the street at any time shifts from time to time. Correct. And it's fair to say that as a dispatcher, um, you, you're not a police officer, correct? Correct. You're, you have not been through the police academy, through police training, things of that nature. Correct. Um, but you, and you don't know all of the police officers in the city of Minneapolis, right? No. Okay. Um, now, in terms of uh, your uh, previous testimony, you indicated that listening is a big part of your job. Yes. You said that the majority of your job is done by listening. Can you explain what you mean by that? We are in a room with no windows. We, we work off of a phone and a radio the majority of our time. The other times would be only if we had some kind of video to show us, anything like that. Then other, other than that, we are always on a phone or radio. Okay. Now, um, you said that there are six televisions, you believe, in the dispatch room? Is that right? Um, throughout the whole center, there's six on the walls, two large ones on the ends, and then there's one in fire. Okay. Um, so... Nine total. Nine total. Sorry, I had to do some <laughs> quick math. <laughs> um, the... And I'm just trying to get this set back up here, if I may have just a minute here. There we go. Okay. Um, those televisions don't have the city of Minneapolis cameras up all the time, do they? No, they do not. Those televisions may have other information up. They may be off. I mean, they're not constantly on all the time. Uh, they're always on, but you are correct. They're not always on cameras. We have other information that we put on those screens that we can have constantly running as reminders. Uh, we also have other screens that we utilize throughout the day, too. All right. And then in front of you, you have four or five different computer screens itself. And it sounds like it's a very, you know, moving job, right? Um, now, the how you, you testified that it's very rare that you actually see an incident that you've dispatched on these city cameras. Correct. Um, like, does it happen once a year? Like, is this the first time you remember it ever happening? How rare would you say it is? Um, I can't be specific, but there might be in the whole time that I've been a dispatcher, maybe three to four calls that I've seen on our TVs. Okay. And usually, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason that may be brought up is because there's something that triggers someone to operate that camera and put it up, right? Correct. So you don't control the cameras. You are correct. You don't have access to the cameras through any of the screens in front of you. Is correct. that right? Um, someone else who may be like a manager or a supervisor has to do that? Correct. All right. Um, but this incident was specifically brought up on the cameras, right? Yes. All right. Um, now, I got this all. You also um, were previously interviewed in connection with this case by uh, Special Agent Brent Peterson. Is that correct? Yes. And that was back on June 9th of 2020 at approximately 1 o'clock, right? Yes. And that was at the FBI field offices, or where was that? 
It was over the phone. I was not in town. Okay. So you had a phone interview with Agent Peterson, and I believe you um, had your union lawyer or something with you as well, right? Correct. Okay. So you, on May 25th, you were Channel 1 Dispatch. That covers both the 2nd and 3rd Precinct, correct? Correct. And there were, again, the four sectors of the 3rd Precinct, Squad 310, Squad 320, Squad 330, and Squad 340, right? And you didn't necessarily know who the officers were assigned to those cars. Correct. Have you subsequently learned who the officers were who were assigned to those squad cars? Yes. So who was assigned to Squad 320? Officer Lane, and I do not know how to correctly pronounce the other officers. Left. King. King. All right. And Squad 330 was Officer Chauvin and Officer Top, correct? Correct. And the other cars did not come, right? Uh, squad 310 or 340 were not on scene, correct. right? And ultimately, um, 830, did you identify who Squad 830 was for the Park Police? I didn't. Now, when this call initially came in, you again were not the call taker this day. You were the dispatcher, right? Correct. And so the call taker comes in, takes the call. You see the information that the call taker puts into the computer system, correct? Correct. And it's fair to say that that information is also being seen in the squad cars of a Minneapolis squad car, right? Correct. So when the call taker types in this information, it's visible to the officers in the squad car. Yes. And it allows them to respond as well. You can respond. Lots of people can respond to various calls, right? Correct. All right. I am going to go back to with the court's permission. I believe this was Exhibit 151, which was the computer aided dispatch. Mm -hmm. Can you see that in front of you? Yes. All right. Let's see if I can get rid of some of this stuff here. All right. Okay. So the call initially comes in at 8.02 and 13 seconds, correct? Correct. And as you described, that uh, the caller reported that outside a, uh, the reporting party that there is a male provided a counterfeit bill to the business. Suspect is a black male, 600 plus, I mean six foot or higher. Yes. Okay. Um, sitting on top of a blue Mercedes-Benz ML320 with the particular license plate. And it also noted that it appears this person is under the influence, right? Correct. So at the time that the call came in, you would have seen that this person was suspected to be under the influence by the call caller, right? As would the officers in their cars. Correct. And so you indicated that you had initially radio, did you say you radio dispatched squad 330 to this call? Initially, yes. Right. And that was because, and do you recall where they were at the time you dispatched them? No. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, back in June 9th, when you spoke with Officer Peterson or Agent Peterson of BCA, would you dispute me if I said you told him that they were at the precinct at the time of the call? I would not dispute you. Okay. And so it's, at that time, you, you believe that Squad 320, which was the sector car, mm -hmm. was tied up, but they had not cleared something from the computer? Is that right? Right. They were still on the call that they had been working on. So let's talk about when an officer finishes a call. Is there something that an officer is supposed to do to say, hey, I'm done with this call, I'm on to the next one? It is, they can either clear over the radio with us, clear me whichever report, advice, sent, whatever, there's a multitude of things, or they can clear themselves. Uh, on my screen, I have a status screen that shows me when a car is clear, when the car is in route, when they're on scene, and when they're code for. Okay. And so on one of these screens that's right in front of you, you have some sort of representation of each of the sector cars that you're responsible for dispatching. So if, for example, you have a call in 
sector 310, and 310 is already occupied with some other call, you can send 320 or 330 or 340, or even somebody from a different precinct or sector, correct? Um, from a different precinct, it requires um, more conversations with a sergeant to pull response cars. It's a, poli or it's a policy of calling people and getting their permission to use their cars. But yes, if someone is busy and I don't have a 360 or whichever precinct 60 car to use, then I have to go to the closest available. Or if there's no one who's close and I only have one squad available, that's the person that has to go. Okay. So when you are looking at your computer screen, do you see all of the precincts, cars, at, like, and their availability, or do you only see the second and the third precinct? I only see the second and the third. Okay. Now, so you indicated that um, ultimately uh, Squad 320 kind of took the call back, right? Correct. They said, hey, we're clear. We're going to go handle this call at the Cup Foods, right? Correct. And you, you're familiar with the, uh, you said you were familiar with the 38th and Chicago intersection? Mm -hmm. Correct. And um, does it get a fair num number of police calls to that area? That I don't have the statistics for. Okay. And I wouldn't be able to rattle off a, a yes or a no. Okay. In the last year, yes. Before that, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay. Um, now, squad. So uh, again, Squad Thirty uh, was ultimately back. Excuse me, Squad Three Twenty was ultimately backed up with Squad Eight Thirty, the Park Police, and Squad Three Thirty, Officer Chauvin's squad car. Right. Correct. And again, you uh, do you recall why you backed these officers up? Initially, I believe I heard a loud something in the background I couldn't I would have to be reminded okay. of what exactly I heard but it was loud and so until they were code 4 I started a squad to back them okay so correct me if I'm wrong you can't just hear what an officer is doing at any given time listen in on their be on their calls right no they have to radio us to let us know um, what's going on all right so when an officer pushes his button on his radio, or however they do it, um, it opens up the air or the microphone, so to speak. And, and that's what you're talking about. You're trained to listen, mm -hmm. right? Correct. And when you spoke with Agent Peterson, do you recall telling him that you heard loud, lots of yelling and things of that nature at one point when Squad 320 said they were taking one out? I don't remember specifically if I believe I spoke told him that because that was the reason why I asked for assistance right squad 320 didn't call in and say hey we need help you heard something that was concerning to you and you sent help correct and then when they said they were taking one out I had they said that first I would have also started it then right and so squad 830 was the first to respond yes and I believe that they uh, responded, let's see, at 8, 10, and 38 seconds, right? These actions right here, the one with my numbers where it says backed up with 320, um, or 320 with 330 and 330 with 830, that is me using my tools at dispatch to just back them up. I don't have, I don't see the arrival times on here. Okay. Um, so this, uh, you see here, 525 at 201221, 320 C4. That's code four. Correct. Right? Meaning all clear, right? To my understanding, yes. And then 830 out with 320 at 12, at 2012.55, so roughly 40 seconds or 34 seconds later, squad 320, or excuse me, squad 830 is out with 320, Correct. right? And then you got a, there was an inquiry to get some information, mm -hmm. right? And ultimately then um, at 
8, 20, and 11 seconds, there was a code 2 call for a mouth injury, right? Correct. Meaning, code 2 again, meaning just come in the matter of due course. And don't, no need to rush. Routine, yes. Routine, right. Um, and then at 20, 21, 35, so again, about a minute and 24 seconds later, squad 330 EMS code 3. Correct. So someone assigned to squad 320, either Officer Chauvin or Tao, called EMS and stepped them up to code 3. Squad 330. Squad 330, right, which okay. was, would be Officer Chauvin or Officer Tao. Correct. All right. And they, um, code 3 means get here as quickly as you possibly can, right? Correct. Um, lights and sirens. Correct. At now this particular uh, this particular document exhibit 151 does not have the arrival times correct? Not printed on it. No. All right. Are you familiar with other documents uh, or other printouts that would show various arrival times? Yes. And it would show other people who are associated with the case. Like what time? Like who is assigned to which particular squad car? Yes. Okay. Um, if I may have just a minute, if we could take this down, Your Honor. Mr. Frank, I'd be referencing bait stamp 7438 for your information. Is, uh, would, it, would it refresh your recollection or would it help you to identify arrival times if you were to look at what's called an incident detail report? Yes. I'll ask you if, if you can show this screen to oh, the witness. This hasn't been offered, Your Honor. I'm sorry? I can't kill them. Oh. Those screens, but not that one. If I may have a minute. Now, the incident detail report has a much more detailed time of like first keystroke of when somebody starts typing, what time officers arrive. Every single time is documented very closely, correct? Correct. Now, would you disagree if I told you that the phone was picked up that from the 911 caller at 8.01 and 15 seconds? I can't disagree with that. Okay. And I know that you don't have this right in front of you. But because of some redactions, uh, I just have to walk you through this these times. Okay. Um, would you agree or disagree? Or would you agree that uh, the first unit was assigned at 8.04 and 28 seconds? Yes. And that that would be squad 330 was in route at 8.04 and 28 seconds? Correct. And then 320 took the call at 8.05 and 11 seconds and indicated that they were in route. So very short time, right? Very short time. Would you agree that if I told you that squad 320 arrived at Cup Foods at 8.08 and 10 seconds? Correct. Squad 330 being assigned to Derek Chauvin, to Tao, Squad 830 being assigned to Peter Chang of the Minneapolis Park Police. Squad 320 being assigned to Officers King and Lane. Correct. Okay. 
No, in terms oh. in terms oh. of. All right, we are taking another sidebar, it looks like, in the courtroom right now. Uh, we still have on the stand the 911 dispatcher um, who was working the day that George Floyd uh, met with uh, Chauvin and, and died on the corner of 38th in Chicago in Minneapolis. So right now Chauvin's lead attorney, Eric Nelson, is uh, in a sidebar with the judge um, as they question her. Uh, her name is uh, Jenna Scurry and she has is worked in this role for about seven years. Um, and she had said earlier that she was alarmed by the footage she was seeing and decided to call the sergeant. Okay, it looks like they're coming back. We're gonna go back to old school methods and print out some paper. <laughs> we'll get there. to them to speed this process up. Mr. Nelson? That's fine, Your Honor. All right. So for purposes of uh, stipulation, EMS code 2 for a mouth injury was called at 8, 20, and 11 seconds. EMS code 3 from squad 330 was called out at 8, 21, and 35 seconds. The arrival time of EMS is 8.28 and 36 seconds. Am I reading that correct? So 8.28 and 36 seconds, EMS arrives, correct? Correct. All right. And then EMS didn't stay on scene, right? No. They left, and they indicated that they went to 36th and Park, right? Correct. And they didn't go to 36th and Park, did they? EMS? That's, that's where I believe they were. Okay. Um, so to your, your belief, they went to 36th and Park because that's what they called out, correct? Correct. Um, do you recall fire having trouble finding EMS at 36th and Park? Yes. Okay. Because they didn't go to 36th and Park, they went to 36th in Chicago, correct? Or do I don't, not know? I don't, I actually don't know. That's, I, after those comments, 
I, I did not know that's where they went. Okay. So ultimately there was some confusion between fire and EMS about where EMS actually was. And you heard that radio chatter. I heard the, I asked the questions on METCOM, which is reflected in there, and then relayed the information that I had of 36 and Park, which was also added into the call. Other than that, I didn't know their locations. Okay. Now, ultimately, um, you said that you were watching this video, and you were still, I mean, you were still watching your rest of your work, right? Correct. I was actively still working. So you look up for a couple seconds, look down, do your work, look up, look down from time to time throughout the course of this incident. You're correct. All right. And so it, it's fair to say that your attention wasn't necessarily focused directly on the cameras and what you were seeing. Correct. And you, but it was concerning enough to you what you did see that you called Sergeant Pluger of the Minneapolis Police Department 3rd Precinct, right? I was concerned, yes, because of the time of the length of the incident had not changed. Okay. So you called, we listened to your um, video, or the audio of your call with Sergeant Pluger, and you called Sergeant Pluger at 8.30 and 44 seconds. Is that the time of the call? Correct. 20, 30, 44. Yes, and that's the first time we spoke. So the first time you spoke was at 8.30 and 44 seconds. And in fact, during that phone call, you were you must have looked back at the camera and saw that they were all gone at that point, right? Correct. Because you're like, you said something to the effect of, oh, wait, they're all gone, right? Correct. And um, your time that you had uh, called into the, the uh, MetLink, was at eight thirty one and twelve seconds. Does that sound right to you? For the Metcom hail? Right. Correct. Then ultimately squad three thirty indicated that they were going out to check on the status and it says AP of the AP that's something that Squad 330 typed into the system. Correct. And that was at 8.55.08, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, again, you were concerned because of the length of the time that you saw this incident un unfolding, right? Correct. And I think you said that at one point you thought maybe the camera had even frozen. Correct. Right? Because it seemed to be kind of prolonged, right? You can't hear anything on that video, could you? No. You had no idea what officers were talking about amongst each other or what they were talking about with others who were present, right? You are correct. And again, um, you not being a Minneapolis police officer uh, are not familiar with the use of force requirements, correct? You are correct. All right. But you are aware that when uses of force are made or used, um, Sometimes you'll hear dispatch the officer call for a sergeant because they need someone to review a use of force, right? Right. And you, at the time you called uh, Officer Pluger or Sergeant Pluger, you hadn't received any sort of a dispatch from Squad 320, Squad 330, or Squad 830, hey, we need uh, a sergeant to review the use of force. You are correct. Now, every single time the Minneapolis Police Department uses force, do they go through the dispatch process? Of over using the radio? Well, to get to the sergeant to report the use of force. As far as I know. Okay. So you don't know whether someone called up Sergeant Pluger on a cell phone and said, hey, we need you down here. Correct. And so because at 8.30, when you called Sergeant Pluger, you had not yet um, heard that dispatch, right? Correct. And sometimes when a use of force occur incident occurs, that call may be to the sergeant to review the use of force, may be fairly quick, and sometimes it may take a few minutes, right? Sure. And yes. it just depends on the circumstances and the situation, right? Correct. All right.
Now you indicated that um, there were these TVs. There are more cameras within the city of Minneapolis than six or nine TVs worth, right? Yes. Are the televisions, like are they split screen where you can see five or six cameras at one time or are they, is it one big TV with one big camera? Uh, it is split screens and then you can go into different camera views. Okay. Looking back through my notes, when you watched um, the video here in court, uh, you said that it was similar to the video that you had watched previously, right? Yes. Um, would you agree with me that the video that we just watched in court seemed to be moving very slowly in terms of kind of choppy? Pace. Pace. Um, yes. Right. Um, so an incident that you watched, you watched it in real time, subject to a few seconds of delay for the signal to get through, right? Correct. So I'm going to see if it makes a difference if we look at it on my computer. We could, uh, this is exhibit 11. Yep, oh, it should be plugged in. Is it, can we put it up? It's day one, Your Honor. So. <laughs> All right. So now when you watch the same video, it seems to be moving in a little faster time. Correct. Because these cameras actually transmit real-time occurrences. Correct. And you said that you um, first kind of took notice based on your estimate at 817, so I'm going to just skip forward here a little. This is 817 and 38 seconds. Back up here a little. So this is 817 and about 30 seconds, and this is when you first sort of took notice of these cameras on the squad car, right? Okay. Or at, at the call center. Now, in terms of the pacing of this, is this more consistent with real time? Yes. And one of the things you ultimately told Agent Peterson was how you noticed how the squad car was rocking back and forth during the struggle. Correct. And if you could just watch this and tell me when you start to see that happen. Well, it's currently shaking. And now currently shaking. And by rocking back and forth, the car is actually going forward, a little backwards, and it's happening over and over and over again, right? Correct. And it's happen happening pretty much consistently during the course of the interaction of the officers, right? Correct. And that, that back door is opening and closing on the officers, right? Correct. Now the other things that you notice when you look at this intersection, this is a pretty busy intersection, right? Correct. 
Lots of cars coming by, lots of people wa wandering about. This was May 25th, pretty nice spring day in the middle of, or not long after being uh, uh, cooped up inside here. Correct. So now ultimately, you observed and, and you saw these officers using force, right? Or what you believe to be force. What, taking him out of the squad? Right, or, put, or putting him in the squad. Yes. And there was, what you observed was a struggle between officers and the person they were arresting, right? Correct. And that the struggle ultimately resulted in that squad shaking back and forth. Correct. And when you ultimately called Sergeant Pluger, you, you said, I don't know if this is a use of force or not, right? Correct. And Sergeant Pluger told you that it could be just a takedown. Correct. And a takedown wouldn't require a supervisor. Correct. Ultimately, you know that Sergeant Pluger responded to the scene, right? And that's, is that a, yes? Yes, sorry. It's okay. And that's confirmed in the computer-aided dispatch or the incident detail report, right? Correct. I have no further questions at this time. Frank, can you redirect? Sure. Just, just a few follow-up questions. Um, I'm going to put 151 back up on the screen for you because I think in the questioning, the council had asked you about Met Link, I think was the term he used. I just want to clarify the two points. So if we could put. And I want to just clarify those times as well. So if we go down to. Um, the time of 2031-12, and if we could just expand that out so we could all see it a little better, please. Uh, I think council asked you about this 2031-12 and that being the METCOM call. Um, having looked at this, you know, what time was your METCOM call? So the information I added was at 2033 for the METCOM. That is our resource that we use radio to radio in the metro so we can be quick and be able to get information back and forth. So that 203302, um, what is the purpose of that entry right there? What are you reflecting? I'm asking basically what is the reason why fire was added? I got on there and asked what it, what do you need fire for? Because there were no additional comments of saying why they were needed code three. And so what you've typed in there via METCOM is, and, and you sent out, mm -hmm. yes? Yes. Is, is to tell what? The information that I got uh, via METCOM was that EMS would like the fire department for patient condition at the requested location of Park and 36th. So that's the answer you got is that fire want, um, that EMS wanted them to go there. Correct. Right. And so that was information you received before 203302, but you sent out at that time. Correct. Okay. There's the time of me typing and putting it in there. When you have referred to your work duties that day, you can take it down, thank you, um, as channel one, um, how does that signify you from other dispatchers? 
We have two other channels. There's channel two, which is in charge of the north side. And then there's channel three, who has downtown in the fifth precinct. And then we have a relief dispatcher who's there to help us when we take our breaks or when we need to get up for any given reason. So when you dispatch over channel one, does that go citywide or just precinct wide? Just on those two precincts. I have my own dedicated channel. Having been questioned by opposing counsel um, about your call, as you sit here today, have you changed your mind about the reasons why you called Sergeant Pleager when you did? No. You were asked about um, the number of screens that you have up looking at all this and still being able to see what was going on in this call from the city camera. That's been your work set up for about seven years, correct? Correct. Something you do on a daily basis is keep track of all these moving parts. Yes. And that video that's up there, when it's not sending out work messages, can put up these city cameras, correct? Correct. But you don't control that. Correct. Do you know who or what office controls that? It can change. Sometimes the supervisors at our center can pull up cameras. Um, like I said, sometimes we put them on there just to see what the weather is. Um, especially if we have inclement weather, if there's storms coming through, we can see actually how severe they are when people are calling in. Uh, sometimes they put them up for incidences if we can see anything. And those cameras can be taken away from us. Uh, to the fact that the base, which is the precinct desk, has control over them and can move them to wherever they need to when they need to. So what you're saying is that those cameras, where they're pointed and when they're available to you, can be controlled by members of the police department? Correct. And in your six years by this date and seven years now, it's rare, it's a rare incident for somebody to put that incident, to put an incident up on the screen like that. Correct. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, Ms. Gary. You may step down. Thank you, sir. Stephen Collins, next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state calls Alicia Euler. sure that uh, we can hear you we're gonna have you take your mask off I'm gonna leave mine on but and before you begin and so we can test out the microphone could you give us your full name spelling each of your names like my whole name yep Alicia Marie Euler A-L-I-S-H-A-M-A-R-I-E-E-O-Y-L-E-R -E 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 and I think I'm gonna have you pull up just a little closer to the microphone perfect thank you Mr. Slisher uh, thank you very much, Your Honor. Um, and Ms. Euler, the, the key I'm going to give you is that when you speak, you should be able to hear your own voice over the speakers, all right? So just lean close enough to the microphone to be able to do that, all right? 
Uh, so first, I'm going to ask you a few questions so we can get to know you a little better. Um, how old are you? 23. 23. And are you originally from Minnesota? No. Where, where did you grow up? No, I'm from Arizona. You can kind of pull back. I'm sorry. This is, I don't like this. Okay. Yeah, I just need to speak towards Okay, can you hear me good? All right. Thank you, thank you. And you can even pretend you're yelling at me if you want to, or make your make your voice hit the back of the room, all right? Okay. So you said that you grew up in Arizona, is that right? Yep. What part of Arizona? Um, just Arizona. The whole state? Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, when did you make your way over uh, to Minnesota? I don't know. A while ago. Okay. Were you still in high school? Yes. Uh, did you attend any schools when you moved to Minnesota? Yeah. Where did you go to school? Red Wing. In, in Red Wing, Minnesota? Where else did you go? St. Paul. St. Paul? Okay. Uh, what's the last grade you completed through high school? 11th. Okay. Can you uh, tell the jury the different um, cities or towns that you've lived in since coming to Minnesota? I guess Minneapolis. Okay. Minneapolis, and I assume Red Wing for yeah, what? Yeah, St. Paul. And St. Paul. Okay. Are you currently employed? No. Can you tell the jury a little bit about the types of jobs that you've that you've held? Um, uh, I used to work at Speedway. Okay. And which uh, Speedway do you recall the location? Thirty eighth in Chicago. What did you do at Speedway at 38th in Chicago? I'm a shift lead. Shift lead? What does that mean? Like a, not like a regular employee, but not a manager, like kind of in the middle. Okay. So um, not a lot of us have had the experience of working as a, as a shift lead uh, at Speedway, so I'd like you to just tell the jury a little bit of what, what's your day-to-day -day job like when you, when you have um, that job? I work at a cash register. I do paperwork. Uh, if a customer has an issue, I handle the issues. Okay. Um, you also work as a cashier? Mm -hmm. uh, do you have to train other people uh, or supervise other cashiers? Um, sometimes. How long did you have that job, Ms. Leila? Mm, about a year. Did you start as a shift lead or did you have a yeah. different position? You started as a shift lead? Um, can you tell me, uh, tell the jury a little bit about the types of hours you would work there? It was a full-time job? Yep, I worked 40 hours a week. Okay. Well, what? I did. You did? Yeah. Okay. When did you typically start your shift? Um, between 2 or 3 to closing, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock was closing? Yep. Was it a pretty busy store? Um, it has its moments. Okay. Well, I'd like to... Uh, See if you recognize the area first. I'd like to show just the witness what's been marked for identification as Exhibit One. Oh, All right, we are hearing from the second witness of the day. Uh, her name is Alicia Euler, um, and she has just started her testimony. Um, it looks like the judge has called another sidebar with the lawyers. Um, that's what you're seeing right now. Um, she, I don't think we have too much clarity. Uh, okay, we're gonna go back and listen. I'm gonna show you, but first I'm gonna offer exhibit one. No objection. One, two, then I'm going to show you exhibit one. If you can take a look at the screen, it just the, the one in front of you. Oh. All right. Uh, do you recognize what's shown in exhibit one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you see the speedway where you used to work? Yeah. 
I'm now to speak up a little bit. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. So, um, do you have uh, something that looks like this in front of you? A little stylus? All right. What I'd like you to do is just take this and see if you can draw a circle around the speedway we're used to. And the name of the store directly across the street, were you familiar with that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. You're, you, and what's the name of that store? Kafut. You, you ever go in that store? Were you a customer there? Not really. Not really? Just the place across the street where you worked? Yeah. Okay. And then do you see what's uh, directly across the street if you cross 38th Street? Uh, from Cup Foods. Yeah. Do you recognize that building? Uh, yeah, I didn't know that's what it was, though. What did you know it was? I never really paid attention to it. Okay. Well, do you recall uh, whether or not you were working on May 25, 2020, Memorial Day. Yeah. And where were you working? At Speedway. At Speedway, all right. And do you recall when you began your shift? About three o'clock. And do you recall specifically what you were doing uh, at the Speedway that day? Ringing up customers. And uh, at the cash register? Yeah. Can you just, uh, again, using your stylus, uh, point or take a, maybe put a little X around the area in front of the store where the cash register would be? Like right here. Okay. Are you able to see the outside across the street from the cash register? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes? And you said you began working at 3. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to a little after 8 o'clock in the evening that day. Do you recall something that caught your attention outside of the speedway? Um, yeah. Can you tell the jury what uh, caught your attention? Um, the uh, police, like in that area, it's always police. When did you first notice, or where did you first notice the police? Um, I would say like on the corner, right, like <laughs> diagonal, like across the street, <laughs> like, like right here. Oops. Okay. And so, for the record, that's across uh, from Cup Foods, across 38th Street, in what is labeled on Exhibit One as Dragon Walk. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Please tell the jury in your own words uh, what it is you saw that caught your attention. Just the police. Um, try not to cuss. <laughs> Just the messing with someone. Okay. And when you say messing with someone, and, and thank you for not cussing, but when you see, say messing with someone, uh, could you please describe what you mean by that? Like, um, I don't really know how to explain it. Just like. Disturbing somebody before we found out who it was. Okay. Now, did you eventually find out who the person, the police were uh, disturbing in your words? Yeah. Who is that? George Floyd. Now, he, had you ever met this person before? No. To your knowledge, he'd never been a customer in the Speedway? No. Okay. Can you please describe for the jury what you saw after you first noticed the police having this interaction with the person you've, you you now know to be Mr. Floyd? Can you say that again? So can you just describe, you know, after you first noticed the police having this interaction with Mr. Floyd, what what did you see happen? In my handcuffs. You saw, in, where was Mr. Floyd when you saw him in handcuffs? Over here, across the street. Okay, in the area where you first indicated by the dragon walk? I believe so, yeah. 
And then what did you see happen after Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs? I don't remember. What's the next thing you do um, remember? This, oh, God. <laughs> Are you a little nervous today? Yeah. Well, that's okay. Just take your time. And uh, we have plenty of time to get through this, okay? Um, and so, just you know, backing up, you'd indicated that Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs. And just think to yourself um, what you next remember uh, seeing after you noticed he was in handcuffs. I think they um, ended up putting him in the, um, the police car thing. In which police car? What, what, where was the police car that you saw? The, um, the one right across from Club Foods. Okay. Now, before you saw that, did you see um, the police take Mr. Floyd across the street? Mm hmm Yeah. Yes? All right. So after you saw him in handcuffs, you saw him being taken across the street and then placed in the car um, right outside of Cup Foods. Is that right? Mm hmm Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. And uh, you owned a cell phone, correct? Yeah. You owned a cell phone at the time. Uh, yes? Yes. And did you do anything with your cell phone as you began to notice uh, uh, this incident involving Mr. Floyd and the police? Well, as you guys seen that um, on the security thing that I had my phone. Mm -hmm. you, you, right, you had your phone. Did you do anything with your phone? Like recording it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what I'd like you to do first, before we get to the point where you start recording, just explain to the jury what you saw after you noticed the police officers putting Mr. Floyd in the car. Um, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> Okay. I can't think right now. Well, um, you indicated that you began recording with your cell phone. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, during the time that you've been uh, preparing, speaking to the police about this, you've provided your cell phone recordings to law enforcement. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 All right. And there were a total of seven cell phone recordings that you personally took, is that correct? Yes. You've reviewed each of those uh, cell phone recordings, correct? Yeah. And those cell phone recordings, uh, do they fairly and accurately depict what you saw on the street that day? Yeah. And, and you know, two of those uh, cell phone recordings were actually made from inside the store, correct? Yes. And then the rest were outside of the store. Yeah. Now, those uh, cell phone recordings, the individual clips, have been marked and disclosed to counsel as exhibits two through eight. You wouldn't know that, but they have. And at this time, I'm going to offer exhibits two through eight. No, Two through eight are received. And then, um, Ms. Euler, you also uh, had an opportunity to review a surveillance video. Is that right? Yes. And uh, the surveillance video for the record is Exhibit 11. Uh, having reviewed that video, did that video, <clears throat> I'm sorry, fairly and accurately capture things that you observed when you were working at Speedway on the 25th? Yes. And then um, you were able to review that surveillance video in, in, a, in a format in which all of your cell phone videos, or I guess I should say six of the seven cell phone videos, had been spliced into or put next to the surveillance video, correct? Yes. And that kind of gives a perspective of when those individual videos were shot, is that correct? Yes. And then the uh, combination of the six videos that we've just received and Exhibit 11, which has been offered and received, um, 
would that composition uh, better help you and assist you in explaining your testimony to the jury? Yes. All right. Uh, and that, for the record, is Exhibit 9. I offer Exhibit 9. Any objection? Nine is received. And at this time, uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and publish Exhibit 9. I ask you to take uh, Exhibit 1 down. And when I, when I say publish, I mean I'm going to play it. And at times, I'm going to stop and pause and have you explain some things. All right? Okay. Okay. All right. If we could begin publishing Exhibit 9, please. I believe we're paused at seven seconds. At this point, you can see, uh, and I'm going to place a circle around some the officers. You see them there? Yes. And uh, are those the people that you saw interacting with the person you now know to be Mr. Floyd? Yep. And your first interaction that you noticed was actually across the street by the Dragon Walk. Is that right? Yes. Now. Uh, as Mr. Floyd's being taken over the car, I think that we will soon hear uh, your first recording. So if we can resume play. Oh, it's some shit going on over there. After you made that short recording, and that was you, uh, I suppose, narrating? Yes. Okay. Uh, after you were narrating that portion, you continued to watch? Yes. Now, at this time, uh, Ms. Oiler, did you notice any bystanders, anybody uh, in the street? No. going to be approaching 8 minute or 8 16 and 30 seconds Ms. Euler were you continuing to watch the events as you were working the, the cash register at Speedway at this time I believe so yes paused at about 8.17, and at some point did you notice some other police officers arrive on the scene? I think so. Well, let's uh, resume play here. Let's pause. Now, uh, at this time, I'm showing you two other individuals who are joining the first two officers that you saw. You notice those? Yeah. And what did you see those two officers do after they arrived? I don't remember. Let's continue.
Uh, from your vantage point inside the speedway, were you able to hear anything outside? No. Let's pause here for a moment, and we're at 8.18 and 10 seconds. Now, as best you can, describe for the jury uh, what you recall seeing the officers do with Mr. Floyd prior to getting to this point. Before this point? Before this point. For example, did you see uh, Mr. Floyd get into a vehicle? Like off of what we just watched? What do you rec what do you recall seeing with Mr. Floyd and the squad car before just before we get to this point? Like when they drag him out. Okay. All right. Let's uh, resume. Now we're paused at about eight, almost eight nineteen. Uh, I asked you previously about bystanders and noticing bystanders. At some point, uh, as you made these observations, did you see a, a crowd of bystanders gather? Um, not till like after. After what? Like after they did the, like the, yeah. Okay. So at this point, you're not seeing a crowd either in the immediate area or across the street at the speedway? I'm trying to remember. I don't remember. Okay. Well, let's resume play. No, you can keep going. I'm going to pause here, and this is at 8.20 and 20 seconds. Can I ask you some questions about some people, again, some bystanders uh, in the area? Uh, do you know who this person in the lower uh, left corner wearing sandals and shorts and a black shirt is? No. Don't recognize him, never seen him before? No. Uh, do you know the person in the dark shirt, uh, hooded sweatshirt, and the blue pants? No. You never met her before either? No. Okay. Or how about the uh, uh, child behind her in the green shirt? No. Not familiar with her either? No. Okay. okay. If you please resume.
uh, pause for a moment here. Uh, do you recognize uh, that person, that officer? Do you recall? No. Do you recall seeing an officer interacting with uh, a group of bystanders who would later gather? Uh, I think so. Can you physically describe that person as best you can remember? I don't really know. It's been so long. Do you recall previously talking about a bald police officer? I think in one of my videos I was talking to a person. Okay. A, a bald officer. Do, yeah. do you recall as you sit here today what the bald officer did? I think he was like yelling at people. Like before or after this. Do you also recall uh, describing a tall officer? Yeah. What did the tall officer do? I think he was like, I don't remember, it is so much. Let's resume play. Pause for a moment. Now, what we heard there uh, that was imposed at the same time as the surveillance video was your second recording. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And again, yes. that was your voice uh, when you said there are always some. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, had you continued to watch these events uh, out the window that entire time? Then I watch it out, like outside. From inside. Um, I think I went outside to smoke a cigarette. All right, I'm going to ask the play to resume and, and ask you to pay particular attention to your video on the right side. Okay. Freeze. Yeah, gonna go a little bit further. Stop. All right. Now, I'm showing you what appears to be a reflection. Mm -hmm. you recognize that? Yeah. Who's that? That's me. Okay. So that's you recording the events uh, reflected in the window, correct? Yep. So based on that. Would you agree that you were inside the speedway at the time this particular recording was made? Yes. Can I resume, please. Now, uh, can you please explain to the jury why did you continue to record what you were seeing here? Um, because I just, I always see the police, they're always messing with people, and it's wrong and it's not right. I'm going to then direct your attention to the right side of the, the screen as well. You say that you briefly, you see that you briefly turned your camera away from the officers in the, in the squad car towards the area that's right by the dragon walk. Is that right? Yeah. And can you uh, tell the, the jury what you see here? Um, I see people standing there, but that's not why I, I shifted the camera. Can you explain why you shifted the camera? Because that's where it started from. Okay, so when you say that's where it started from, I think your description initially was that there were some officers who were, to use your words, messing with Mr. Floyd. Yep. Okay, and this is the area in which they were messing with Mr. Floyd? Yeah, when it started. Uh, I'd like to resume play again, please. All right, let's pause for a moment, and you can see that your, uh, that would have been your second recording has stopped. And at this point, we're continuing to watch the surveillance video. Please resume.
when we get a freeze here. Um, let it go just a little further. Stop. All right. So, uh, again, asking, I've already asked you about some of the people in the crowd, and you said you didn't know them. Uh, I want to add some of the folks. There's a person in a white t shirt. Do you recognize that person? I don't know that person. You've never seen that uh, young woman before? Not before like this. Um, and then I think walking by, I don't know if you noticed, there was a couple with a child. Did you, had you ever seen them before? No. Okay. And, and then there's a gentleman here in a dark hooded sweatshirt. Had you ever seen that person before? No. Okay. Please resume. Now, at some point, you indicated that you'd uh, gone outside of the store to smoke a cigarette. Is that right? Yeah. You continue to watch these events unfold as you uh, were outside of the store? Yep. As you were watching uh, from outside the store, did you see uh, any of the bystanders interact with the uh, police officers? Um, I think they were like yelling at each other. I don't really know what they said. I was kind of too far away. Couldn't make out any specific words? No. Do you recall seeing a, a woman with a, a black shirt and a white headband? No. This is like a year ago, a long time ago. asked you about seeing a woman with a black shirt and a white headband. I'm wondering if now looking, if this refreshes your memory at all about this person. No. Right. From outside then, at your vantage point, outside of the speedway, you began what is now your fourth recording, and I think for the record, that starts at about, uh, uh, was it 825, uh, 26? Please resume. What happened? I don't know. I know that the, the tall dude that's leaning on his feet, they had him in the other side of the car, and then he pulled him out on the ground. You could pause for a moment. <laughs> right. Whose voice was that? That was mine. Okay. And were you describing to uh, someone who was standing next to you what you just witnessed earlier? Yeah. Okay. If you could resume, please.
applause. Uh, it seems that you've spent a lot of time watching this encounter. Yeah. And you were continuing to occasionally record. Yeah. Okay. If you could resume, please. Did you hear that ambulance in the background? Mm -hmm. At some point, do you recall an ambulance actually arriving? I believe so, yeah. Okay. Um, as best you can uh, rem remember, uh, can you describe what you saw after the ambulance got there? Um, I think um, the person uh, was going on a stretcher. If we could uh, resume, please. stop and uh, at this point you can see that the ambulance has arrived and there's a uh, ambulance worker coming out of the passenger side of the vehicle is that right yeah in the time uh, that you've been watching up to this point did you see this individual ever get up from his the first position he was in when he first uh, uh, went down um, I, I, I don't remember Please resume. Stop. All right. So so you mm. see that the street camera has now changed uh, positions, is that right? Yeah. And yes. Do you recognize that person? That's me. That's you. Okay. So that's you and you're holding your cell phone? Yep. And that's uh, you recording so we can give the jury a good idea of where you were at the time you were taking that footage. Okay. And that's when the ambulance arrived. You continued to observe. Uh, please resume. Uh, do you ever see, personally observe, uh, officers get up off of George Floyd? I don't think so. I, I, I don't know. If you could pause, back up about two seconds. I think I was more so like I was recording it, but I was also like trying not to get hit by the cars coming in the gas station. All right, understood. All right, if you could resume that, please. You can see the stretcher is fully out here. Is that right? Yeah. And then I want to draw your attention again to the last officer closest to the to the head of the individual on the ground. Uh, did you see him change position at this point? No. Okay, please resume. Final recording as Mr. Floyd was taken from the ground, loaded onto the stretcher, and placed in the back of the ambulance. A 
if you could pause, please. And then you see that at approximately 8.29 and 29 seconds uh, p.m., Mr. Floyd is fully placed into the back of the ambulance. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, please resume. And at that point, if you would pause, please, at 8.29 and about 52 seconds, I believe, 52, 53 seconds, you stopped uh, recording. Is that right? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, and you can take that down now. But what did you see after uh, the ambulance pulled away? Um, there was just a bunch of people yelling and fighting, and I didn't really understand why, but now, obviously, we know why. What did you do after you stopped? Um, after you stopped watching outside, I went back to work. And that would have been around about, right about eight thirty. I, so. I don't remember. <laughs> do you remember when your shift ended? Uh, ten o'clock. Okay. And so you worked up until till ten o'clock. Yep. Um, do you recall uh, what you saw after you left work that day? Um, tape. There was a bunch of tape everywhere, and. They made me like, instead of going down Chicago to go home, they made me like go around and like down the street, like all the way down, I think like 35th. Because the, uh, the, the scene had crime scene tape around it. Yep. And you weren't able to access it. Did you make another uh, recording uh, of that crime scene tape? I think I did. And at this time, uh, I believe we've already received Exhibit 7. And I'd like to publish Exhibit 7, please. Um, yeah, that would be good. Well, you know what? Um, I'm almost finished here. Go ahead. Yeah. If we could just publish Exhibit 7. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's Exhibit 8. All right. If you could pause, please. And uh, Ms. Euler, you described the scene being taped up with crime scene tape and you weren't able to access it. Mm -hmm. yes. Does it show the area where the crime scene tape was? Yes. All right, if you could resume play, please. And stop. All right, and you can take that down. Uh, what did you do then? Uh, after you made that recording? I went home. Okay. And at some point, uh, you were contacted by police officers, is that right? Yeah. They talked to you about what happened, took a statement from you? Yeah. And you voluntarily provided the, the videos to them, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Council's going to have some questions for you, but I think we're going to take a break first. Mm -hmm. Here, let's take our 20 minute break. Let's reconvene at 325. With that, Gavel, we are now in another break in the trial of Derek Chauvin. I'm Rhonda Colvin, broadcasting live from the newsroom of The Washington Post. With me are my colleagues Eugene Scott and James Homan. Derek Chauvin, a 19-year veteran of the Minneapolis Police Department, is charged with second-degree and third-degree murder and second-degree manslaughter in Floyd's death. If convicted, he faces as many as 40 years in prison, but could serve as few as 10 under state guidelines and the judge discretion. The most serious charge is the second degree murder charge, which does not have to prove intent. Instead, the state's prosecutors will have to show beyond a reasonable doubt that Chauvin caused Floyd's death while assaulting him. This charge carries a presumed sentence of 10 to 15 years, according to state sentencing guidelines. So that's a bit of a rundown and some background on the charges that Chauvin faces. So again, today this is opening statements day as well as uh, the start of hearing from some of these witnesses. 
Uh, James and Eugene, I, I want to talk about the young woman that is on the stand right now. Her name is Alicia uh, Euler. Uh, she was a worker at the gas station across the street from Cup Foods and uh, witnessed the encounter uh, where George Floyd encountered the police. Uh, James, do you have any takeaways from uh, Ms. Euler's uh, testimony there? It seems that uh, the prosecution is trying to get some answers out of her and um, she's not giving many broad answers, but what, what's been your takeaway from her? Yeah, it's a really interesting decision. And the way to think about her is that they have called her up as a vehicle to introduce these seven videos that she recorded on her camera phone. Obviously, she herself is not a particularly compelling narrator of the events, but this is someone who's taking video and has a vantage point across the street from where the famous you know nine plus minute video that we watched earlier that caused all the massive street protests last year. We've seen that video okay. you know over and over. Here is the other side of the street. A woman who doesn't know any of the bystanders who were also watching, who doesn't know the officers, who doesn't know George Floyd. She's a cashier at this gas station. And she was kind of blown away. She said that she sees this all the time. We heard her in one of those videos say, there they go again, as in the police uh, harassing people at this at this intersection. And she goes outside basically on a smoke break and, and records these videos that we saw. So by having her on the stand, that let the prosecutors play her videos and uh, and we saw again the extended sort of the knee on George Floyd's neck, the paramedics arriving, uh, and and the officer still on George Floyd's neck, and her and the people she was talking to being horrified by what was happening. So I think that this sort of deepens the record. It shows that there wasn't just one video, there wasn't just one person who was upset by what was going on. That everyone who was watching was really just taken aback by the the images that we all now can see with our own eyes. And Eugene, uh, your takeaways here. So she's uh, in her early 20s, a gas station attendant across the street. She doesn't seem to be uh, overly enthusiastic about being there, although it's probably very difficult for anyone to take the stand in a case like this. Um, but is there anything that you have heard from her so far that may give us a look at how uh, the community saw what was happening to George Floyd? Well, I think the point that she uh, tried to make about this uh, appearing not to be the first time that she observed uh, law enforcement, quote, messing with people, uh, should give you some type of idea about uh, the relationship between law enforcement and, and citizens in Minneapolis, maybe even beyond uh, some black Americans, at least in that particular area. Uh, she was so concerned about what she was seeing um, and maybe it uh, resembling something she had previously seen that she wanted to videotape it. She used her break to document this with the, with the hope or intention of spreading this beyond uh, just her own phone after the fact. And I think uh, that it's an important thing to remember when uh, defenders of Chauvin or anyone in law enforcement at this point tries to make the case that these are isolated incidents. One of the larger conversations happening right now in the discussion about criminal justice reform uh, is that these issues seem to be uh, systemic and not just uh, individual situations that have caused uh, specific families harm, but are actually uh, perhaps devastating larger communities. Uh, now let's bring in Mary Beth Albright, who is joining us via telephone. Mary Beth, explain to our viewers what information the prosecution was trying to get to uh, from questioning the witness, Alicia Euler. Yeah, hi, Rhonda. Um, it, it's very important to remember that any, any court case, any case that happens in a courtroom has to be built on evidence. And there are very nuanced, complicated rules of evidence in a courtroom, particularly in a criminal case, right? Because you're, you're dealing with somebody's liberty. You're dealing with, a, you know, charging them with a crime. So you see this at every step of the case. You see this um, in, uh, at the very beginning of opening statements, and you see it here with this witness, that it's like a staircase up Mount Everest, and you have to do it step by step. So she is what, what, something that we call a foundational witness. And the reason, the primary reason that a witness like this is called is that it's a basis for admitting evidence. This is what James was talking about earlier. He was 100% right. You can't, you need evidence and you need somebody to verify the evidence. 
And so remember when you saw like the the um, the police tape, the the one that the nine one one operator had been, had been talking about, right next to the one that she had taken, uh, the current witness had taken with um, her camera, her phone, right next to it. And you saw that they were even showing the prosecution was laying the foundation with that. Look, here goes a blue car here. Here goes the same blue car in your video. Can you hear the ambulance? You can hear the ambulance here. Um, is this you standing, you know, showing where she was in relation to the whole to the whole place? So that's why they're doing it. That's why she's there. And, you know, the, the thing about you can't you, you don't choose to witness a crime. Right. Um, or a potential crime or an alleged crime. You're just somebody who happens to be there. And so what I what I see in, in this witness is a foundational witness who may or may not want to be there. She may or may not be reluctant, but she's necessary because she has to she has to be there in the court in order to admit that tape that she took, that video she took. Right, and Mary Beth, this also perhaps can uh, really underscore the fact that there were so many people there that day who are eyewitnesses. You have the people who were walking on the street, you have uh, people who were working there in that area at the gas station who were able to see these uh, events unfold. Um, is that something that can really help the prosecution, the use of all of these witnesses who witnessed the same thing but from different vantage points? Absolutely. And James pointed this out. It was such a great point that they go through and they say, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Because, you know, the, pro the defense could, could say, oh, well, all of you just got together and decided you were all going to say this together. But what, what the prosecution was showing was, no, none of these people know each other. None of these people showed up that day to say that to witness a, a, an alleged crime. Right. None of those people wanted to be a witness anywhere they were just living their lives they were just walking down the street they were just going to the store to get food and so it's it's extremely important although it might to some viewers seem i mean let's be honest a little tedious um it, it's it's it, you you can't have a case without it if we didn't have this witness talking about how she got this video we would not have this video into evidence we would not have these angles of the video into evidence. And because there are so many videos from this, it, you really need all the angles to, to set up either the prosecution or the defense. These videos are critical for the case, either, either side, either way. So it's not like, you know, we see in TV or movies where uh, every witness called to the stand has some sort of bombshell moment. This is actual uh, structure to a case. It's giving, uh, what you're saying, it's giving the prosecution a chance to lay some groundwork and utilize the evidence to their advantage. Oh, Rhonda, it's only the law were as exciting as everything <laughs> you see on TV. I mean, I'm not the first person to say it, but this is what, this is what court cases are like. I mean, if you go through a transcript of any of any court case, there are going to be witnesses like this. There are going to be witnesses who come in just to lay foundation, just to get evidence in. And again, it can seem pretty tedious, but this is the work of the law. You are dealing with a murder charge, right? And so you need to make sure that every single rule of evidence is followed. Because here's the other thing is that any litigator, the prosecution, the defense, any, any lawyer involved in this case is also thinking about the appeal, regardless of which way it goes, right? Because you're thinking to yourself, well, what little points that happen along the way in the case, can I make a case that there was a legal error that happened? That, that maybe this, it, this evidence that was admitted um, wasn't supposed to be admitted. And so that's why this has to be done so methodically. And you're going to see this later in the case, too, with the, with the medical experts, um, the many medical experts that they said that they were going to introduce uh, later on in the case. That's a whole different standard, right, going through and qualifying a medical expert. That's going to be long, too. But remember, we, <laughs> this, is, this is a big case. I mean, I, I don't need to tell everybody this. But this, is, this is something that's important. Everybody's making sure that they're following the rule of law, and, um, and that's, that's what we've got. And is there any strategy, Mary Beth, to having this type of witness who isn't all that perhaps dynamic in terms of, of what she's saying? Is there any strategy of having her on day one versus the last day before closing arguments? The only way that you can ask anybody a question about that video is if you have her in first. Because the video is not admitted into evidence unless you have that person sitting in that chair 
under oath telling that judge and everybody in the world who's watching that, yes, I took this video. Yes, it was me. Yes, here was my angle. And then, and then the prosecution is also verifying that it's the same video happening at the same time. And if you don't have that video, you can't ask anybody any questions about that video. That's why, if you think about it, that's why they brought the 911 operator in first, right? Because they're, okay, so this is the, you know, they're admitting the, um, I don't want to call it official, but they're, they're admitting the 911, the video that was in the 911 room, right? So they, they admit that first. And so they build that, they put that down as a foundation. And then they're going to bring in, keep bringing in people with videos to be able to admit those. So you have to, you have to lay that foundation on day one or else, you know, you don't, you don't even, you can't ask anybody any questions about it. And those videos, as we know, I mean, Rhonda, you and I are both video journalists. Um, we've seen the power of video, particularly in this case, but also in many other ways in the past several years. And, um, the, the requirement, the need to make sure that everything is legally sound with admitting that video is crucial. Uh, I want to go to Eugene for a minute. So Mary Beth has laid out that this is a foundational witness. She's a part of the prosecution setting up their entire argument. She's a part of the fact that they need to bring in certain pieces of evidence and they need a person to establish uh, and verify those pieces of evidence. But I'm noticing too that on social media, a lot of people who are following uh, this proceeding are commenting on this particular witness and thinking, you know, that perhaps um, she's uh, not good for the prosecution. She may not be a strong witness and people are really concerned. So even though this is about uh, the law, really, uh, how is this playing out in uh, public perception that this, this is a witness who is not uh, what many people would deem as enthusiastic? Yeah, I'm, from the reaction I noticed, people were hoping that she, uh, you know, would be more communicative or give more uh, insight or perspective or background on what was actually happening as someone who actually was outside um, and recording uh, the incident. But uh, as was communicated earlier, you know, you have to use the evidence that you have, and her videos are that. Uh, the fact that she perhaps personally is not um, someone who uh, perhaps can answer a lot of the questions that um, are being asked, it's, you know, just a, a reflection of how different some people are in terms of uh, personality. Uh, I think it's also uh, important to realize that there, there could be some real possibilities uh, that you're dealing with some nerves and some anxiety and some trauma to have observed something like this. Uh, the details of the questions uh, uh, always intrigue me, considering how much uh, you know lawyers want to know uh, what uh, those testifying even remember in terms of the outfits of some people standing near them were having and where they were laying and if they moved here first or went there first. And so um, you have some of those um, um, challenges there. Uh, even, she even went to, she even expressed sometimes uh, that she was nervous about making sure she would communicate her idea very clearly without profanity. Uh, and so um, this has not been perhaps um, the, the, the most uh, revealing witness that uh, the prosecutors could have. But what she does have is video recordings, and that's really important. Yeah, yeah, to your point and also Mary Beth's point, it is uh, important that we note that, you know, no one chooses to be at the scene of a crime or, yeah. or to be later called in to give a, a testimony. And she's also fairly young. I think uh, when looking up at the witness documents, she's 23. So uh, it could very well be nerves, but again, she's there to be a foundational witness. Um, Mary Beth, while we have you, you mentioned the other witness today, the 911 dispatch worker. Um, if you followed that, is there anything that stood out to you about what um, that woman's uh, uh, discussed in her uh, testimony? Yeah, I, she was, I thought she was, uh, from my perspective, she seemed like an extremely credible witness. Um, and and that's, that's the thing. I mean, we talked about the point that you don't, you don't, as a prosecutor or as a defense attorney, you don't get to choose who witnesses the alleged crime. Um, that you're trying. And so, um, you know, I, I think the important thing to realize, and I haven't been following social media on this, so I appreciate the perspective okay. of people watching this and thinking, oh my there? gosh, is the prosecution just throwing the case, right? I appreciate that perspective. But um, okay. we also need to remember that there are a diversity of communication styles. 
um, in 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 the world. There are diversity of perspectives, um, and these are people who are. I mean, the 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 woman who came in. I mean, the, let me put it this way: the nine one one operator may or may not have been um, called as a witness in a trial before, because nine one one operators are often brought in as witnesses in trials. I don't know if this particular one was, but they often are. The woman who is currently on the stand, uh, who took the video, um, I, 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 I don't. I don't suspect that uh, that she has ever been in a situation that she was called as a witness, that she had to go through a lot of um, crowds, protests, you know, um, that she had to go through security, that she's waited probably in that room all day just to get up on the stand, and that she's aware that she's on um, international television, right? And so there, I, I think we all need to remember that that's part of what goes into this, that the people are, um, even if they're, even if everybody tells the truth all the time, they can appear really nervous. Uh, and so, but there's nothing you can do. You can't, you can't bring a quote unquote better witness or a quote unquote more credible witness up to talk about that video. Only she can talk about that video. Yeah. And Mary Beth, I'd also like to get your take on the courtroom itself. Um, you know, uh, we're still in a pandemic and that's very visible in this courtroom. Um, you are a lawyer uh, and as well as a journalist. Um, if you can give us your take on how all of this in the, the courtroom, the partitions, the mask, does that change the temperature at all uh, in um, proceeding at all? Would it, do you think it would affect, you know, how, how things are playing out there? Well, it, the, I, I'm so glad you asked that, Rhonda, because the sidebar, the headset sidebars are fascinating to me. Because if you're in a courtroom, usually the sidebars happen, you know, the, the attorneys go up to the bench and the attorneys talk to the judge and the judge is up above the attorneys. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of visual aspect to that. You can see the reactions on the attorneys' faces, if they like what the judge is saying Maybe or if I'm they so don't sorry. like the I'm judge. I'm going to have to interrupt what, you. Thank you yep. so much for your insight. We're going to go back to yep, the courtroom. Thanks, bye. Good afternoon, ma'am. I don't know if that's you or me here. So I'd like to ask you a few follow-up questions, if that's okay. Okay. Um, if the court would, uh, I'm going to show you Exhibit 1, as we had before. And I think that you indicated that you were about right there, right? When yeah. you first observed everything? Yeah. All right. Now... Can you just describe for me generally, like, the inside of the speedway? Like, was was you would you have been facing customers looking out the window to your right? Would you have been standing forward and looking out the window? Um, it would be like to my side. Okay, so if you were in the subway area, or excuse me, the speedway area right here, in this area that you're talking about, like your back would have been facing that way. No. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And so when you observed what happened over in this area, you would have been looking back over your right shoulder. Yes. Okay. And that's when you first observed... Oops. Okay. That's when you first observed uh, the police interacting with Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. And you observed uh, him get handcuffed or put in, ha he was in handcuffs at that point, right? Yes. And you observed them walk him back across the street towards the area here where the squad car was. Yes. Correct? Now, again, you said that you were working, you were taking care of customers, things of that nature, right? Yep. And obviously we know that you didn't film the entirety of the incident from the beginning to the end, right? Right. And that's because you were working. Right? Yeah. In, in part, at least. And I think as we saw from your video, there were cars coming in to get gas, there were people coming into the store, that type of thing was happening, right? Yeah. All right. And <clears throat> you, ultimately, you remember that you gave a statement to a, an agent with the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Yeah. His name was Brent Peterson. 
Would you disagree if I told you that that was on May 28th of 2020? Okay. I, I don't remember that. Sure. Yeah. We have no reason to, it was within a couple of days of this incident, right? Yeah. And do you recall telling uh, Agent Peterson one of the things that you didn't understand was why they took him back out of the car? Yeah. Because based on what you observed, you observed Mr. Floyd get into the car, both doors were shut, correct? Yep. And then all of a sudden, according to your video, the taller uh, officer just pulled him out of the back of the squad car. Yep. All right. Now, you also, um, do you recall testify or telling Agent Peterson that the people in this area here, there was a female cop? I don't remember. Sorry. Um, do you remember a female police officer being there? I don't remember. This was so long ago. Okay. Um, would it refresh your recollection to review? Well, did you ever have an opportunity to review a transcript or an audio recording of your interview with Agent Peterson? Um, say that again? Were, prior to coming in and testifying, were you ever yeah. given a copy of your transcript? Um, I seen it. Heard it. Did you read it? Uh, no. Okay. Would it help refresh your recollection to look at a copy of your transcript? Not really. Okay. So you don't remember ever telling uh, Agent Peterson that there was a female officer on scene? It could have been, yeah. Okay. There's a lot of officers. All right. Now, you testified that you took a first couple, of, the first two videos from inside the speedway. Yeah. And then at some point you went out into kind of in the middle of the parking lot area, right? Yeah. Or the entrance where cars would be coming in to get to the gas pumps. Yeah. You were out there on your break, right? Yeah. And I think we saw, based on your video, that what you did is you sort of zoomed in so you could get a closer camera view, right? Yeah. And you zoomed it to the maximum that your camera would allow you to zoom in? Yep. And from where you were standing, ultimately when you were outside, you had the opportunity to make observations about what the officers were doing with Mr. Floyd, right? Okay. I mean, would you agree with that? Yep. <coughs> and you had the opportunity to make observations about kind of what else was going on, right? Yeah. In fact, I, one of the videos, you actually had a conversation with someone else, right? Yep. So if you were standing across the street from where Mr. Floyd and the police officers were interacting, um, you would have one view, but you would agree that when we look at a camera, that's just kind of one perspective, right? I mean, I guess, but there's multiple cameras, though. Under, I understand. I guess what I'm saying is, is that when you're recording, your camera is only going to capture what's out in front, right? Yeah. But when you're recording, you said you were, you know, looking, making sure you didn't get hit by a car, right? right? So you have the ability to turn your head from left to right. You can look up, you can look down, you can talk to people, and you can look around, right? You can, yeah. But your camera is still in that one fixed position. Yeah. All right. So you were able to make observations. As this incident progressed, would you agree that more and more people started stopping and watching what was going on? Yes. There were some people standing in front of you. There were some people standing to your right. Recall that? Yep. And then obviously there were the people that were closer over by where the officers were as well, right? Yeah. And then even on the, like, kitty corner from where you were, right? there were people standing there watching. Yeah. And if you went to, to your right on the other side, there were people standing there watching, right? I think so. Right. And cars were driving by and buses were driving by, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes cars, according even in, we see in your video, they would stop for quite some period of time and then drive off, right? Yeah. And would you also agree that as you, as this incident progressed, 
the crowd of people started becoming more and more vocal. Like, what do you mean? Like, well, they started yelling more. I, I think so. Right. So, like that first video when you step outside and there's fewer people, there's not as many people yelling, right? Yeah. But by the end, when the ambulance takes Mr. Floyd away, there's a fairly large crowd out there, right? Right. And there's a lot of people yelling. Okay. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah. And those people, some of those people, you could tell were upset, right? Yeah. I think you, you, you said that a lot of people were, were yelling and fighting, right? Yeah. So you get a sense, you can get a sense that people were angry. Okay. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And that feeling of anger is different when you're there and watching it than when it is when you're here talking about it in the courtroom. I don't think so. You don't think I so? I think if you're still upset about the situation, you're still going to be upset about it. I understood. But in that moment, you would, you would agree when there's people yelling and there's people driving by and there's people honking, right? That's a different feeling than you may still be upset here today in court. But it's a much different feeling now than it is then. Okay. Would you agree with that? Yeah. All right. And... <clears throat> Ultimately, again, you took these various cell phone videos, um, you provided them to uh, law enforcement voluntarily, right? Yeah. And then you went back inside, you finished your shift, and then when you left, the scene was taped off because it was a crime scene, right? Yep. No further questions. Any redirect? Yes, sir. Thank you. So when you saw the officers bring Mr. Floyd across the street, did you see Mr. Floyd struggle with or resist the officers? Uh, no. And when uh, the officers first brought Mr. Floyd to the ground and you saw the three officers on top of him, there wasn't a large crowd at that time, was there? I don't think so, no. In fact, that didn't happen until much later, correct? Yeah. And you never saw the officers get up off of Mr. Floyd until after the ambulance arrived, after the stretcher was pulled out, is that right? Uh, yeah, that's what it said in the video, well, shows in the video. All right, nothing further. All right, thank you. You may step down. Mr. Frank. You know, the state would call Donald Williams to the stand. Testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do, sir. Tennessee. Yes, Your Honor. And just to test out the microphone, if you could give us your full name, spelling each of your names. Uh, full name is Donald Wynn Williams II, uh, D O N A L D W Y N N I, or W Y N N, last name W I L L I A M S II. Thank you. Mr. Frank. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Good afternoon. Can you uh, tell the jurors roughly how old are you? Uh, 33. Okay. And what do you do for a living? 
Uh, I'm an entrepreneur um, and a professional fighter. Uh, and a father. <laughs> and a what? And a father. And that takes up probably as much time as all the others. Yes, it does. Um, so you, by entrepreneur, you have some of your own companies that you run. That is correct. Yeah. Doing various businesses. Correct. And um, tell us the jury, if you would, sort of where you live, not your address, but the city or town yeah. where you live. Uh, I'm in a unique situation, but uh, I do have a place in Roseville in South Minneapolis. And your place in South Minneapolis, well, are you familiar with Cup Foods? That is correct. And how far is your place from Cup Foods, roughly? Uh, not too far from Cubs. Good like, enough. Good enough. <laughs> so, like, uh, literally, yeah, like, on the next block, too much, too, yep. not too far down. So, how long have you lived in the Twin Cities area, the Minneapolis area? Uh, Minneapolis, Twin Cities, every year, for 33 years, pretty much, uh, my whole life. Uh, I'm a city kid. Okay. And, um, Mr. Williams, um, well, before I f forget to ask you, You've done some work in the security field. That is correct. Uh, been working in security for over 10 years. And what does that mean? What do you do to work in security? Uh, for security, private security. I uh, worked at the clubs, at Pichu Luches, um, different clubs downtown Minneapolis. I uh, worked at Allied Security for a year uh, before the situation as well. Um, and I've done private security for the Mystic Lake kids as well. Um, so I've been working security for uh, quite a few years. Um, and so that means everything from, I suppose, being what we might think of as a bouncer to yeah. uh, just keeping. Yeah, so from being a bouncer to a private security, like I said, being a door guy uh, to, like, uh, escorting some of the, you know, uh, high-profile athletes as well, too. Uh, some of the comedians that came into Minnesota. Um, and like I said, some of the high-profile kids uh, from Mystic Lake, that families own Mystic Lake, I have done multiple private securities for them as well on different events uh, throughout Minnesota. So for for doing that job, do you have to learn some uh, use of force? Correct. Uh, well, my uniqueness is uh, I, uh, I'm a wrestler uh, from high school that developed into a martial artist. So that's what uh, helped, gave me more of the opportunity to be able to do the private security and things like that. And uh, just started connections from the mixed martial arts world from my previous manager to just different friends and side of my circle and um, when you're doing security do you sometimes have the opportunity to work with Minneapolis police officers that is correct uh, I have worked side by side with Minneapolis police department since uh, Minneapolis police since I was 21 year, 21 years old uh, and again I'm 33 years old right now I work downtown uh, like Peach Luce brought me in a couple years ago when one of the top guys Antonio left to go to Vegas and work out in Vegas uh, Peach Luce reached out to me and put me at the door and I was able to control my city because I have a relationship with both sides of the city, no matter if it's business, streets, uh, friends, you know, different areas. My connection is pretty broad to the Twin Cities. So I'm able to uh, talk certain people out of certain situations downtown um, from there. So, yeah, that's fine. Yep. Okay, so, um, so working security, you sometimes work with Minneapolis police officers officers who are also working security. That is correct, off duty. And sometimes when they're called in as police officers to an incident. That is correct. And since you mentioned the mixed martial arts, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, you mentioned also wrestling. That is correct. And when did you start in the sport of wrestling? Uh, I started in seventh grade, Your Honor, or sir, seventh grade. Yeah, I haven't earned that yet. Yeah, all right. Hey, soon. <laughs> Somebody might be upset if you start calling me. Um, but uh, so you started wrestling at a very young age. Correct. And uh, wrestling as a sport, what kind of things do you got to learn if you want to be a good wrestler? That is correct. What kind of things do you need to learn? Uh, you need to learn, one, uh, ment the mentality of being a wrestler. You know, it's a, it's a hard pace, uh, different grind. It's not really a sports a lifestyle. Um, you got to really learn the technique of wrestling, you know, and then it's different. At, you got to learn the different atmospheres of wrestling as well. Uh, you could be the top guy wrestling in an arena where everyone hates you, and you're wrestling against someone everybody wants you to win. So you got to be able to absorb all that and be able to move forward and, you know, perform. So those th three things, you know. And how about the physical aspects of it? What kind of things do you need to do to be a good wrestler physically? 
to beat your opponent. Yeah, you have to be able to condition your your body. Uh, you have to be able to do different circuits, different workouts, running, um, yeah, just conditioning your body to be able to be an elite wrestler. Is there a lot of uh, using your weight uh, to control the other person? That is right, correct. Uh, you When you first start wrestling, you don't really understand the weight shift, and you're kind of all, like, falling all over the place. But then eventually you learn how to control your weight off of someone else's movement and body movement and things like that. So you know the different pressures and you know different um, just movement. You know, and it's called flow wrestling. You eventually learn how to flow wrestle um, when it comes to that. And it's just like not being so resistant to everything. You know. And so you're saying flow F L O W, not I could yeah, tell like you. flow F L O, yeah flow yeah. W. I wasn't sure if you said float or flow. So flow F L O W. So would you tell the jurors then about your wrestling career? Uh, yeah, I wrestled uh, Minneapolis Edison uh, in high school. Uh, again, I started in seventh grade, so I had to fast track and catch up to all the kids that was already better than me because most kids wrestled started at four years old. Um, so coming into Edison, I uh, there were really good program at the time, probably the best one since 2006. Uh, I was able to transfer in, crack the lineup at Edison, and. Um, I was a multiple time state entrance, a uh, couple times se sections champs, and I went on and wrestled in college as well at uh, DCTC. I wrestled there for one year and then went over and wrestled at RCTC, uh, which is another junior college. Um, so, um, and from there, I've just been growing into wrestling, learning different wrestling. I coach uh, youth programs since I got out of high school, uh, and I currently coach my kids right now. They currently wrestle in different friends. A kid as well, and help them develop their skills and to do different private lessons and things like that with them. So this all started from you know me being a seventh grader, um, playing in the backyard with some friends, and they. Uh, that's fine. He asked me to explain. Uh, yeah, but we're gonna shorten it up a little bit. Because it's best when you can ask him more questions. Yes, sir. It also helps like court reporter who is taking everything down on a stenographic <laughs> machine. Correct. That way she can get a break between. So yes, yes, Your Honor. Thank you. So I'm going to back you up a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, just to ask you a couple specific questions. You mentioned DCTC. Correct. Can you describe for us what that is? What yeah, that Dakota is? County Technical College. Okay, so it's a, like a junior college yes, wrestling. a junior college, correct. And the other was RCTC? Yep, Rochester Community College. Okay. And so you wrestled at the college level? Correct. Then at some point did you take up mixed martial arts? Yes, uh, about... Sophomore year at Rochester, um, I'm in a unique situation. I have my kid with me, <laughs> so uh, we kind of uh, shifted towards uh, getting our grades together and trying to create a plan to finish, be able to wrestle in college eligibility-wise. Um, and I, um, I end up get, finding martial arts from different friends like Marcus Levester, Jack Zusila, Jafari Veneer, and Carey, and things like that that were my coaches that wrestled. And they wrestled and coached me and they ended up jumping into martial arts and I came back to visit and uh, kind of fell into the martial arts world okay. with them. So let me just yeah, cut brought, you off. Yeah. <laughs> so. you, you've done a lot in mixed martial arts. Right? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'm going to try and you know um, walk you through it a little bit. Yeah. But what year was it that you started seriously training in mixed martial arts? About, uh, let's see, 22, 22 like 09-ish. Like oh nine. Have you been involved in it ever since? I've been involved in it ever since, correct. Continue to be involved in it? Yeah, continue to be involved in it as of the last nine months. I have not been training. Okay. And ever uh, ref wrestled, uh, I'm sorry, done the mixed martial arts, what we call it, a fight uh, professionally? Correct. Amateur, I got 10 amateur fights and about close to 20 professional fights. So about 2009 you start, correct. Um, through 2020, correct? Correct. How often during that time period are you in the gym training? Us uh, Monday through Friday. Like I devoted my, my life to uh, mix martial arts and my kids' life to mix martial arts. Uh, so it was, a, it was a 40 hours or more a week job at the Minnesota Martial Arts Academy. Uh, I was in there the majority in the mornings from 10 a.m. to sometimes 3 in the afternoon training for uh, hopefully a fight. So the Mixed Martial Arts Academy, that's the business where you train? That is the gym I train at, correct. Okay. And when you were training there, did you ever um, have the, well, did you ever train with Minneapolis police officers who were there? Correct. Uh, 
Describe that for the jury, please. Um, not everybody, uh, let every, they, they don't always let you know that they're a cop or CIA agent or FBI agent, but we all kind of link together because they're trying to learn how to be able to defend uh, different chokes or be able to detain different people. So um, Greg uh, Nelson, which is the head professor there, he's a unique guy. He's been able to work close with the military and the Army and the Kabatov team. So we get a lot of um, Army Kabatov people coming in and training with us just so they can learn how to, you know, defend yourself in in war, I, I'm taking it. And, um, yeah, so I've been training next to some of them for, like I said, a decade. And, and you know some of them are Minneapolis police officers training them. Yep, that is correct. And they're not all Minneapolis Police Department. They're from all different precincts, all different backgrounds of uh, the law enforcement. So when you're uh, training in mixed martial arts, uh, is part of the ultimate goal to get the other person to submit? Yeah, that's the goal of it. Uh, of it, You know, uh, everybody gets into martial arts for different reasons, you know. Um, as you're rolling and understanding it, yes, your whole thing is to be able to get the person to submit. Um, when you do put a choke or a different submission on them. So let me talk to you about that. So you're trained on what are called choke holds. Correct. And what kind of training do you receive to do a choke hold? Uh, well, you first you go into a basic class. They teach you the basic techniques of jiu-jitsu, uh, how to be able to defend yourself on the back, how to be able to uh, defend off of a choke, and how to be able to put someone in a choke as well. Uh, and those are some of the basics that we learned from there. So if, if we talk about specifically chokeholds involving the neck, Correct. did you also have to learn about the structures in the neck that can lead to a chokehold? Correct. And Different, uh, there's air chokes and there's blood chokes and, and there's limb chokes. There's so explain chokes. the first two. Uh, air choke is more of um, like choking someone they still have air to breathe in there, you know, and they're able to you know, absorb it and fill it, you know, and then you also have a choke where it's a blood choke where um, it specifically attacks the side of the neck and it particularly cuts off the circulation of your arteries and stops the different bleed, uh, blood flowing from body to from top of your head to the bottom of your head. And sometimes you could get in a blood choke and not know you're in a blood choke until you're unconscious. In your training, have there been times when you've been rendered unconscious through a chokehold? Correct. Uh, I have been submitted on a professional level in, in, in live matches, uh, and I have over 30, probably 30 uh, jiu-jitsu submission matches where I have got caught in a submission before on a, on a rear naked choke and a front choke. Um, only I've been only choked out twice in the jiu-jitsu side, but on my martial arts on the fighting side, I've, in a fight, I've been submitted maybe three times on a side choke. So in that training, do they have to teach you uh, what that's like so you know to avoid it? Yes, correct. Uh, so it's a uniqueness. You have to kind of like be acceptable to being choked. You know, you can't just like be, you can't, uh, it's not normal people can just really get choked. You got to relax. You got to be able to breathe. You got to be able to let the choke happen. And you got to be able to know when to actually tap, tap out on the choke because you're, you're in practice, you're not trying to put this person to sleep, but you're trying to get them to understand how it feels to be choked. So we do go back and forth choking each other. Sometimes you'll see white stars when you get choked and it kind of like helps you understand, you know, when you went too far, you know, and uh, some people choke tolerance is higher than normal. You know, some are really low, where when you do put a little choke, they're tapping right away and some people will be able to absorb it and actually meditate there because they want to be able to be comfortable in a choke and be able to get out of it in a live action. So you use the term tap out. And what does that mean? Uh, so tap out would be, for instance, uh, so if I have you in a submission and I feel like it's getting to a certain point where it's not comfortable for me, I just tap my, uh, my opponent and my opponent releases his choke and then we're back to grappling again. And you know, I catch him in a submission and if he's not comfortable, he taps. And this goes for the neck, limbs and all that so you don't harm each other doing practice. What what can happen, have you learned through your training and experience, if you don't tap out, if a choke goes too far? Uh, if you don't tap out, you can lose consciousness and you can uh, develop different, uh, I, I'm not a doctor, but somnies from your brain to your body because of lack of oxygen and things like that. So we talked about that a lot, but I appreciate you sharing that with us. Correct. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Yes, sir. 
I want to take your attention back to May 25th of 2020. You remember that day? Correct, I do. And um, on that day, uh, at some point, did you go to Cup Foods? Correct. And um, prior to going to Cup Foods that day, had you done any activities with, for instance, your son? Correct. Yeah, so uh, earlier that day, I just went finish fishing with uh, some wrestling friends, wrestling family, uh, me and my son. And uh, yeah, we came, uh, caught maybe three bass. Uh, after, throughout that whole day of fishing, it was a beautiful day during the day, so everybody was out in the lake. So we went fishing and uh, caught three bass. Uh, after we got done fishing, rolled around a little bit, had to fish in a little bowl on the side, you know, the, uh, the boat swimming around the water, uncomfortableness. Um, and once we got done fishing, we had to, you know, drain the water, take our fish, and find somewhere to, to actually transport our fish back home on a you know, safe way, I guess, to, to their death. Um, so we put them uh, in a bag and tied them up and we pretty much suffocated them on our way home for our ride. So that you could enjoy them later. Yeah, so we can actually cut them up, eat them, and freeze them, which are still in the freezer. For and uh, so at some point then you decided to go to Cup Foods. Why did you decide to go there that day? Um, so I went to Cup Foods because I haven't cut a fish up in about like, since I was about like 23 working at a butcher at Solo grocery store. Uh, so me and the fish had it like, we were like going through some <laughs> things of watching this fish actually die. And, watching him lose his ear and watching his eyes actually roll back in the back of his head. Um, so after we got done cutting him up, me and my son was actually watching on a YouTube channel trying to figure out how to actually cut the fish the proper way and make sure that we're doing it right, cutting the fins off, chopping the side of the head off, you know, filleting the fish. Uh, so after I got doing, done doing that, I just needed air for myself. So I went to the store to go get something to drink at the time and I kind of just snuck out from the family once I got done cutting the fish. So did you drive there? That is correct, I did drive. Okay, I'm going to show you something we've already uh, received as Exhibit 1 on the screen. Can you show Exhibit 1, please? Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Uh, correct. All right. And this is the intersection of 38th and Chicago where Cup Foods is, correct? Correct. And you will notice on the bench in front of you uh, one of these little styluses, hopefully. Correct. And you can draw on this, and I'd ask you just to show the jurors where you drove up and where you parked. Uh, is it showing up? Do I got it? Is it showing up on there or no? I don't see it yet. I don't see it either. Oh, there it goes. Came from that angle. So, wow, I parked somewhere in here. All right. So, for the record, you, you drove. Um, down 38th Street towards Cup Foods and parked on 38th next to Cup Foods. That is correct. All right. Okay. And I'm going to show you uh, some photographs to sort of help illustrate what you did that day. All right. And I'm going to first your Honor, offer Exhibit 18. No objection. 18 is received. Okay, can you put 18 up, please? Now, do you recognize this photograph? Correct. This is something we had shown to you before? That is correct. And who is that in the photograph? Uh, that is Donald Wynn Williams II, which is me. Okay. And is that uh, you parked the area where you parked on 38th? That is correct. And that's you walking up? That is correct. And uh, can you describe for us what you're wearing, the sweatshirt that you're wearing? Uh, Northside Boxing Club. Okay. So that's not the academy where you train, that's just another club? No, that is not. It's a youth uh, gym for boxing. And so when you decided to go to Cup Foods, did you, you know, get all dressed up and, and get ready for going out? No, not at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is just an outfit you threw on? That is correct. All right. When you were um, on your way to Cup Foods, did you grab your cell phone and take it with you? That is correct. You had it with you? Yeah, that is correct. All right. And um, 
So after you got out of your car, as you walked up towards Cup Foods, um, did you notice any police cars in the area? That is correct, I did. Okay, and describe for the jurors and kind of what you saw as you're walking up. Well, as you can tell by my face expression, um, I was kind of like, oh, the police is here. And I noticed that there was uh, two police squad cars out there. And I just had a look on my face like, oh, we're in the city, something else is going on. Uh, should I get back in my car or not? Okay. And what did you decide to do? Uh, my energy just kept p pushing me forward and I kept walking. Okay. And so you kept walking towards the store? That is correct. I started walking towards Cub Foods entrance. And did you end up going into Cub Foods? Uh, no, I did not make it into Cub Foods. Why not? What stopped you? Uh, my energy stopped me, uh, the surroundings stopped me, the energy of the air, just me as a person, if people know me personally. Uh, it was just the energy was off. I couldn't like get in the door for some reason. And then once I realized why. So when you came around, so Cup Food sits on the corner, correct? That is correct. So 18 shows you walking up on the 38th Street side. Correct. When you get around the corner, what is it that starts to you know, affect your energy and, and your decision to go in the store or not? Yeah, so I <laughs> was just sitting at the door just like, man, there's so much going over here. Do I involve myself? Because I'm used to, I'm usually, you know, I, I pay attention to my city. So I was contemplating with myself, do I involve myself or do I go inside the store? Um, I started hearing different um, voices from people that I didn't know, you know, telling someone that they just calm down, everything's going to be okay. And then uh, I heard, you know, some people saying that, you know, I'm looking for or some point for their mother. And I heard another voice just saying that, you know, you should let them up and they're not resisting arrest. And it was just certain things that just kept boop, 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 hitting me while I was standing there, like, should I go in the door or not? And, and did you go into the store then? I did not go into the store. All right. So now I'm going to show you, uh, well, first I will offer Exhibit 19. Any objection? No. Anything is received. Put 19 up, please. And do you recognize what's depicted in this photograph? That is correct. And is that you then walking um, along Chicago? That is correct, walking on Chicago. All right. So when you get into this area, is this, well, what are you experiencing right here where you're walking along? Uh, again, like I said, uh, I was just hearing different emotions, different comments, and uh, at this point, I just was kind of like deserving, so I kind of like slowly trotted over there. And we can see in Exhibit 19, there's a couple other people on the sidewalk here. Did you know any of those people as you walked up? No, I did not know no one out there at all. Um, the first people that you see while you're there... Um, well, you stayed at that area for quite a while, correct? That is correct. So the people that you first see as you're walking up, uh, can you kind of describe how they looked or how they appeared to you, what who they were? Correct. Uh, again, um, I didn't, uh, I don't know none of them. Um, I just remember off of certain visualization that it was three people uh, outside. It was an older guy, a younger lady, and uh, maybe one more other gentleman out there. And yeah. And then uh, this photograph also shows uh, in front of you a person with a green shirt. Do you remember seeing that person? Not at all. Okay. Like she wasn't like, in, you know, she was there, but I didn't see her. Okay. And so you, um, well, from where you are in this photograph, where did you go? What did you end up doing? Mom, I believe I ended up probably standing next to this little spot right here where she's standing at uh, like a point. I probably was standing somewhere in here after I came from this way, and I just sat there and chilled right in this area for a second, observing like security officers do. I observed the scene first before I spoke. And as you observed it, um, what are you seeing and hearing? Uh, well, once I get there, I hear an older guy saying, it's going to be okay, quiz this and the rest. Uh, they're going to get you up and put you in the car. And uh, just hearing people, uh, different people actually vocalizing their concerns to the officer and um, hearing George uh, on the ground pretty much pleading for his life, saying he's sorry, I can't breathe, I want my mom, uh, just please let me up, and things like that. So, you know, while we still have um, Exhibit 19 up, can you show the jury after you 
got done observing. Where did you go from there? Uh, my per me, I ended up somewhere in this vicinity <laughs> throughout the whole time. Okay. And so when you went over uh, by the curb area there, um, what did you see happening on the ground behind the squad car? Uh, well, before I walked up, I, I noticed that it was an officer standing right here, kind of um, pretty much dictating the crowd from only standing on this curb right here where they're at. Noticed that part right away. And then I finally noticed, uh, it's going to be on the opposite side, but I noticed uh, George's head was kind of sticking out from the side of the car. And then I noticed uh, Officer uh, Chavez right here with his, his knee um, circulated on um, George's neck. But this is all happening on this side of the car. All right. We'll get to that in just a second while we're still on this photograph. Correct. Um, when you went over there uh, initially, did you leave the curb and go onto the street? Uh, there is a possibility that I was battling with myself to stay on the curb and throughout the time, correct. We know later you went into the street area, but when you Correct. first got there, did you stay on the curb? Yeah, when I first got there, I, I stayed right here. I didn't move too much right there. I stayed here, and I might have stepped down once or twice back and forth, but I can 100% remember. And you saw an officer standing in that area you showed us before. Did yeah, you, he was about like some weird... Did you area. learn later that officer's name? Uh, yeah, I read his badge. His, uh, um, I read his badge. Can I say his name right now? No. But at the time, I think uh, I called him by his name from his badge, just from visualization, reading his badge. Was it Officer Tao? Correct. All right. And you were able to read that from his badge on his uniform? That's how much respect I tried to give him at the beginning. And so you saw him there? Correct. And um, what did you understand his role to be when you were observing? He was a dictator. You know, he dictate what went on on the curb. He controlled the, the people, he controlled me, and he uh, he was the guy that let it go on while it went on. Now, um, you mentioned Mr. Floyd. Is, Correct. Where was this individual you referred to as Mr. Floyd? Can you please repeat that? Sure. Where was this individual that you re you have referred to as Mr. Floyd? Uh, Mr. Floyd, again, was on this side of the car, angled down at the, by the tire area in this area, but on this side of the car. And at this time, uh, well, prior to coming into court, did we show you a photograph uh, of the officer with Mr. Floyd on the ground. Can you please repeat that? Yeah, prior to court today, did we show you a photograph of that officer with Mr. Floyd on the ground? That is correct. And that, uh, that photograph, did it fairly depict what you saw when you got there first? That is correct. Okay. Your Honor, to that extent, I would offer Exhibit 17. Any objection? 17. Now, I'm going to show Exhibit 17 on the screen, and I, okay. And, um, so this is what you saw when you uh, came to that area on the curb there? Yeah, this is what I saw, and the only reason why he's looking at me right now is because uh, I told him it was a blood choke. Okay. We will come back to that in a, in a little bit. Um, when you um, were there, was Mr. Floyd able to speak? That is correctly. Um, he was speaking in a distress way. And uh, what kinds of things led you to believe he was distressed? Uh, he was vocalizing it to the officer. He said, my stomach hurt. I can't breathe. My head hurts. I want my mom. Uh, and um, yeah, those are the things that he repeatedly said. He wanted to get out the car. He said he's sorry for what he did. He pleaded with my mans and told him, like, I'm sorry. I shouldn't pretty much have to die. And so did you feel like you could have walked closer from this vantage point on the curb? I could have. I felt that way in, in, in a way, but it's a, um, a, a fear factor as well. And at this time, so you had seen Officer Tao. And you had seen this officer in Exhibit 17 Correct. on Mr. Floyd. 
Did you see any, any other officers at the scene at that time? No, I did not. All right. Were you, and so this in Exhibit 17 shows the vantage point you had, the view you had from where you were standing. Correct. I only had that side view of the two officers in the, the shoulder length of George Floyd's head, nothing mm -hmm. else. And um, when you were in this location, can you describe uh, for the jurors what you saw about Mr. Floyd, how he appeared? Well, let me back up just for a second. You've used Mr. Floyd's name. You, did you know him at the time? I did not know Mr. Floyd at all. No real connection. So you're using his name because you've learned since then who he is. Correct. I uh, can't go to many places without not knowing his name or seeing his face. And so. so when you're in this location, you first come up and you're seeing him, he's able to speak. Correct. Can you describe what you saw of Mr. Floyd's condition as time progressed here? Um, as time progressed, so when I first, like I said, when I first arrived on the scene, Mr. Floyd was vocalizing his, uh, his sorriness and his pain and his uh, distress that he was going through. Um, the more that his the knee was blockly uh, on his neck uh, and shimmies were going on, the more you seen Floyd fade away and slowly fade away and like the fish in the bag, you seen his eyes slowly, you know, pale out and again slowly roll to the back of his eyes. And he, um, so this is what I seen, this is what I heard and that's how, you know, what it was. Like he was going through distress because of the knee and he vocalized it that I can't breathe. I need to get up and I'm sorry. And his eyes slowly rolled to the back of his head. You seen the blood coming out of his nose. You heard him tell him, tell him before he stopped speaking that my stomach hurts. And those most of the times is the last bowel movement of your life. So from there on, he was lifeless. He didn't move, he didn't speak. He didn't have no life in him, no more on his body movements. During that time period, did you notice anything about his breathing? That was significant to you. Yes, uh, just like in MMA, you could tell when someone gets tired, or you could tell when someone's getting choked out, or things like that. His breathing was getting tremendously heavy and tremendously harder for him to breathe, and you actually could hear him. You could see him struggling to actually gasp for air um, while he was trying to breathe, and I mean, he barely could move while he was trying to get air. As you were. Um, standing there, um, did others gather around? Correct. Uh, at the moment, I was the most vocalist person out there pleading for Floyd's life because I felt like it was definitely in a room. And um, there was, at one point in time, a medic came on scene and she spoke on checking pulse, what made me even go even more harder because I heard it and then I registered in it like, oh, you do need to check his pulse oh, he is not moving, like, oh, you just killed this man, you know? And so her expertise was like, look, he's fading away. You need to check his pulse. She's asking him multiple times. I'm asking him multiple times. No one checked his pulse. Do you remember Officer Tao saying anything um, uh, during this time period? Yeah, he, um, he did what an American does, and he blamed it on drugs for being a black man on the ground. Uh, let, me, let me just tell you. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. What, what did he say about drugs? He said, this is what drugs do to you. And I replied, this is not what drugs do to you. So did that Officer Tao saying that help the situation? No, it didn't. I, I, if I'll be honest with you, it pissed me off more because that wasn't the case, you know what I mean? So, um, when you were um, there, um, seeing this, did you draw on your training and experience in wrestling and mixed martial arts to draw some conclusion about what this officer in Exhibit 17 was doing? Can you go ahead and repeat that? Yep, it's kind of a long question. Yes, it was. As you're standing there, seeing what you've described to the jury, did you draw on your training and experience in wrestling and mixed martial arts to get an idea of what this officer was doing physically there? Correct. Yeah, so like as I'm standing there and observing everything, uh, before I even spoke, if you've seen the video, um, 
I watched what was going on, and as he, he's positioned here before I even spoke to uh, the officer, I watched the position one of where the position of the neck or the knee was on the neck. You know, two what body movements was going on while he while the knee was on the neck, and then three what was the condition of George Floyd while he was going through the the through this uh, torture. Uh, one was that the neck was diagonal across the throat, which on a, a blood choke, you would tack the side of the neck, you know, and which you're in a camorra or um, or side chokes or things like that. You want to tack the side of the neck to cut the circulation of the breathing from your person. And then to get the choke tighter, you hit different shimmies, which I felt the officer on top was shimmying to actually get the final choke in while he was on top to get the kill choke because a side choke or a blood choke can ultimately turn into death and that's what we've seen here. And so sure is to disregard the last uh, statement by the witness. And just for the record, the last statement about okay. leading to the, the last statement. Proceed. And, sorry. And so did you think you know, based on your training experience, that this looked like a blood choke. That is correct. And did you say that to the officer? That's correct. And how did he respond when you said that to him? Uh, he looked at me right here. It's the only time he looked at me. When I said it was a blood choke, it's the only time he looked up. We looked each other dead in our eyes. Yeah, and when I said it, he acknowledged it. And? Um, like we're looking at each other right here. Okay. Last statement is uh, sustained as non-responsive. And so when, question. I'm sorry. And um, Mr. Williams, from that vantage point depicted in Exhibit 17, that officer, do you see that person present in the courtroom today? That's correct. He's standing right there. You already asked the record to reflect he's identified the defendant? Mm -hmm. It will still reflect. When you were there at the scene, uh, did you at one point tell the officers that you were trained at the academy? That is correct. And what did you mean by academy? Uh, a short name for the Meach Martial Arts Academy. As this was happening, um, did you, or I'm sorry, did other people eventually come to the scene? That is correct. And I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as Exhibit 184. Before we put that up, uh, Your Honor, I would offer Exhibit 184. Okay. It's not on there. All right, we'll come back to that later. Um, when this crowd was uh, there, do you recall roughly how many people were there? No, I do not. All right. um, at uh, any time, did you hear anybody threaten to harm the officers? No. Um, well, I want to say harm. I mean, some kid came, the kid that might have call the police or I'm not sure exactly from when I talked to him after the situation but he did come out once he realized what was going on and he tried he almost like tried to rile the crowd back up and I just kind of like nah just chill out it's too late you can't do that just go back inside inside so that was the only incident that I recall of and when you did that to him did he go back inside yeah he went back inside crying he was a younger kid okay. now earlier you mentioned the term shimmy correct I've just been spelling S H I M M Y. Good enough. Yeah, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> you never, you never gave the spelling of it, but yeah, yeah shimmy. <laughs> and so that's a move that you learn in your uh, training for mixed martial arts holds. That is correct. And what's the purpose of doing a shimmy? To get the the choke tighter, to close the gap of the air between your arm and the neck. And were there times that you saw things that you thought? You recognized as a shimmy by this officer on uh, Mr. Floyd. That is definitely correct.
Your Honor, just for the record, we are going to show a portion of a video uh, that I think Council will stipulate to its admissibility. We'll lay full foundation for it tomorrow, and I'm only going to show a portion of it for this witness today. And that's okay. Exhibit 15. Any, any objection to the partial? No, Exhibit 15 it will be received subject to later foundation. Now, Mr. Williams, um, you did not take any video at the scene yourself. That is correct. No video. Um, and uh, we had an opportunity to show you a video earlier. And did that video fairly and accurately depict what you were seeing there? From a live angle, yes. From myself, yes. All right. What I'm going to do is play a portion of Exhibit 15. And it's the time period roughly when you are there. And while we play it, I would just ask that you explain to the jury the things that you saw um, you would consider a shimmy and just sort of explain how, uh, what it is that you're seeing to make you think that. Correct. That, all right? Yes. All right. So we'll do exhibit 15 starting at 44 seconds. Let me breathe, please. Man. I've been trying to tell you about it. He just did it right there. You'll see his foot is on the, his toe is pointed down, and you will see a small gesture in his back foot, like this. And that's just the pressure you push more down between his knee, George's head, and the concrete and cut it off circulation. All right, and we'll continue on that, please. Yeah, he just did it again. And we saw that movement there that moves Correct. the knee on his foot. This time his foot came up off the ground, so no foot on the, on, the, on the ground, so all the pressure is on his neck. And you're talking about the same, the foot on the same leg as the knee. Yep, so, correct. So the same foot on the knee, so it's like this, it's a choke here, so. This is, for instance, my neck here, and then for me to close this, I shimmy, I shimmy, I shimmy, I shimmy, I shimmy, I shimmy, and now I close the choke from the side of me. And just for so the I record, like shimmy. sorry, yeah. just for the record, you're demonstrating with your arms. Yeah, I'm doing. demonstrating with my arms, so um, uh, that's choke, you know, from neck here, and for instance, my neck would be from here, so I would have this across from here, and then I'm closing it off here, pretty much the angle of this his knee and then every time I'm shimmying I'm getting this right here to close the gap closer within my neck and it's the same way that you can do without having the neck across here. So we'll continue on with the video then. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you want? I can breathe. So you just did it again. You did it again. You did it again. Bro, get up get in the car man. I will. Get up get in the car. It's just a small gestures and then you'll see his shoulders Slowly sweat. Sorry. Okay. So. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yeah. So we'll what we'll do is we'll wait. Now uh, we've um, stopped the video at this portion, and if you could just explain what you're seeing here, correct. That uh, leads you to believe this is a shimmy type move. Correct. So explain now. Correct. Okay. Cool. So um, the gestures and the movements is from his shoulders and the top, and this is he's just doing it with his knees. Not you know it's not an actual choke on with the hand sound. He's actually puts putting the same pressure as you would with your neck. And like I said, every time his shoulder is moving, he's pushing that pressure down on his neck from the shoulders to the, to the knees, all the way from his ankle. And you will see his shoulder shift, and then you'll see the bottom of his knee shift and his foot come off. Some t the one time he took his foot off the ground and put multiple pressure. Now his foot's not on the ground. He's driving off his far foot. And, you know, as you're seeing this, are you also seeing things on Mr. Floyd's face that you testified to earlier? Correct. All right. So let's continue with the video then. Get up and get in the car. Mama. Get up and get Mama. in the car right. I can't. Get up there, y'all have to do it get in, bro. I told you, you can't win. My knee. You can't My win, neck. man. I'm through. I know you're the nephew. You listen. Uh, my breath is moving. Just my stomach hurts. Uh -huh. My neck hurts. Everything hurts. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Yep. 
Okay, it looks like we've lost the signal for uh, temporarily, hopefully, uh, of the trial. But what we've seen so far is uh, this last witness, Mr. Williams. He is a mixed martial art uh, artist. Uh, he has a background in uh, understanding use of force. He also works as a security guard and happened to be on the scene in front of the store where uh, George Floyd encountered the uh, Minneapolis officers. Uh, James Homan is with me still. James, uh, out of the last few things that we've heard from this particular witness, what's standing out to you? Well, this is really just incredibly compelling testimony. Rhonda, this is a, a guy that we've established has trained with Minneapolis police officers in mixed martial arts. He understands uh, exactly what Officer Chauvin is doing. He sees it. Uh, what we just saw momentary a moment ago was him identifying three different shimmies, uh, where you you know he said you could see the the heel on his shoe pointing up, uh, and and so this is someone who sort of understands exactly what's happening, who has experienced it himself in the, the martial arts training setting. And, and why it's so significant, Rhonda, is that he recognized in real time how bad this was, how wrong it was, and he felt compelled to say something. He was there to go get a drink at this Cup Foods. He never went in because he was kind of caught off guard by what he saw, and he was engaging with the officers. He said, you know, he was yelling at, at Officer Chauvin, that's a blood chokehold, a, a blood choke, and that, that was why Chauvin looked up at him. And then he engaged with Officer Tao, who will face a separate trial, and, and was, was yelling, stop this. And Tao said, this is what happens when you uh, do drugs. And he said, no, this isn't drugs. This is what happens when you put someone in a blood chokehold. So just someone who understands what was happening physically, who was a witness in real time, who was speaking up because he recognized it was wrong. Uh, by far the most sort of damning of the three witnesses uh, for Officer Chauvin. Right, and at one point we heard the defense object to him uh, bringing in this sort of expertise on the style of chokeholds and how dangerous they can be. Um, so it is interesting that he was a bystander, yet he does have an expertise, almost like an expert witness, who can discuss the, the different holds, the, the shimmy technique where, they, where it closes the gap uh, between the air passage, so uh, to, re to put on even more pressure. On, on a neck, so uh, that's really been interesting. And I think we have a clip actually of some of him, uh, uh, Mr. Williams, detailing uh, what he witnessed. So uh, let's take a, a listen. Okay, maybe that tape is not ready yet. <laughs> yeah, but if but I, yeah, so the, could, you know what was striking is during voir dire uh, with jury selection, uh, you know, they, the, the Eric Nelson, the defense attorney, struck uh, one of the potential jurors, a Hispanic man, uh, who also said that he was into mixed martial arts uh, and that he was, you know, he, he was uh, practiced martial arts. So it, it clearly defense recognizes this is a potential problem. That's why they struck him off the jury. Uh, they don't want people to see that, you know, the connection between uh, martial arts training and law enforcement training. They'll try to draw that distinction. And, and certainly we're going to get to hear, uh, you know, either in a few minutes or tomorrow morning, the defense attorney cross uh, examine this, this witness. Right, and we also heard uh, some very human uh, <laughs> anecdotes to uh, this whole story. You, they spent the first few minutes talking to him about what he was doing that day. He talked about how he was fishing with his son and, and some uh, wrestling uh, partners and how they were enjoying the Memorial Day weekend. And he had taken a break to go to Cup Foods uh, after trying to, um, to uh, I guess, cut up his fish or something like that. But you see uh, the prosecution try to show the jury that these people were very human, they're relatable. Um, and I, I thought that was also notable too because they spent a lot of time talking about what he was doing that day, his background, his, his college wrestling days, um, and, and all of that. So I think our clip may be ready. So uh, a key part of the trial today was witness Donald Williams who had training in mixed martial arts and he used that vocabulary to describe what he witnessed. Did you think, you know, based on your training experience, that this looked like a blood choke? That is correct. And did you say that to the officer? That's correct. And how did he respond when you said that to him? Uh, he looked at me right here. It's the only time he looked at me. When I said it was a blood choke, it's the only time he looked up. We looked each other dead in our eyes. Yeah, and 
when I said it, he acknowledged it. So he's talking about uh, a scene that we've now seen evidence of where Chauvin is looking at a camera directly at uh, what we believe is Williams, and he's describing that. Uh, James, one of the other things that stood out to me is that um, after they sort of go through, you know, the easy talk of what he was doing that day, he was fishing, and they go into that encounter um, that he had with uh, Officer Tao, he, he looked a little shaken, um, Mr. Williams did, and, and he also was shaken when he was detailing some of the, the um, what he remembered about Chauvin. So, you know, this is reminding us too that these witnesses, they're average people, and going back through this can be traumatic. Yeah, and, and you know, he, a couple things off that round, I couldn't agree more. And it was striking, you know, he's someone who lives in this neighborhood. He didn't know George Floyd. He said he had never met him before. Uh, but, you know, he referred to him as George, not Mr. Floyd or the victim, uh, because it's just been such a huge impact uh, on that local community. And he said, you can't go anywhere without seeing murals of George Floyd. And the thing I'll say about the humanizing part, that, that observation you made is, uh, fishing with your son and your buddies on Memorial Day is literally the most Minnesota thing you could possibly do. Uh, they call us the land of 10,000 lakes, my home state. Uh, really, there are actually close to 15,000 lakes. And, and I thought the most powerful moment from his testimony, and you're right, he did choke up. There've been a lot of powerful moments, was when he had described, you know, catching these three bass uh, with his son and bringing them home, uh, trying to cut them so they could freeze them and eat them. Uh, and then a few minutes later, he was talking about watching uh, Chauvin on top of George Floyd with his knee. And he said, and, and he didn't intend to draw this parallelism, but you could watch his eyes bulge out like a fish, like the fish I had just been uh, cutting. And, and that uh, really just was, it was gutting, uh, that, that uh, metaphor. Uh, and, it, and it really was not just humanizing for George Floyd, but it, it captured, I think, why this was so affecting, to your point. Uh, he's, he watched a man die, uh, and, and he is, is reliving that experience on the witness stand. Right, and I believe we have Mary Beth Albright with us as well. Mary Beth, um, when this witness also spoke on not only Chauvin, but he also spoke on uh, one of the other officers who was there, Officer Tao, uh, that man and the others will uh, see trial in August separately. Um, you know, is that any part of a, a tactic for the prosecution to also bring in um, the remembrance that other officers were there uh, and were part of this and perhaps complicit? I, absolutely, Rhonda. And I, I, I do want to also take a minute, though, just to pause and think about how unreal it is that okay. a person with this kind of a background in chokeholds and martial arts now actually witness this i mean this person is coming in and giving expert type testimony he can't give expert testimony because he hasn't been admitted as an expert but he can be admitted oh, as Beth, i'm so sorry i'm going to have to interrupt you they yep. uh we've got the feedback from the courtroom let's take a listen we're going to beg Mr. Williams' patience and have him come back tomorrow to finish his testimony. But for you, let's uh, get back here. Hopefully, follow the uh, sheriff's deputy's instructions regarding reporting, and we will see tomorrow where we'll start up again with testimony at 930. So have a good night. Don't watch the news, and uh, do what you can not to talk to people about the case. And thank you so much. All right, that gavel marks the end of the day for this jury and this case. You are watching a Washington Post special report. I'm Rhonda Colvin. With me now, Eugene Scott, reporter for The Fix, and James Homan, Washington Post columnist. So, uh, James, as uh, we left off with Mary Beth a, a little bit ago, um, she talked about the fact that there was this last witness of the day and how he sort of has this uh, dual ability to be a, a somewhat expert witness, but also just a bystander watching this all play out. Why is he a good witness for uh, the prosecution's case? He, he's a really good witness because he was there. He was horrified by what was happening. He actually spoke up in real time and called out the officer, told him to stop. Uh, which does get to intent that, you know, you, the off, it m becomes much harder for Chauvin's defense team to argue that, uh, you know, he didn't know he was hurting him or that he just was doing standard thing, that you had this guy yelling, you're doing a blood choke and, and Chauvin acknowledging it. And we'll see that full video uh, tomorrow. Uh, and, and so one of the reasons you did see the defense try to object 
uh, to him talking about the, the martial arts element of this and what exactly was happening is because this is, is very damning evidence for Chauvin. And it was, I think, one of the most striking things that we learned about the defense strategy today is that they're going to argue, and we didn't know this before today, that uh, it was the size of the crowd. It was the anger of the crowd that this man we just heard from, It was okay. he was so angry that Chauvin had to uh, keep his knee on George Floyd uh, so that the, the crowd would stay under control. Uh, and, and that is going to be central to the defense argument. But we also are then hearing from Williams saying there really weren't people. We were respecting the boundaries. We were keeping a, a safe distance. Uh, so th that is going to be part of the defense strategy is that this guy was was yelling uh, at the police. And so they couldn't focus on detaining George Floyd. They had to focus on the crowd control. So w one of the reasons it's important for the prosecution to establish him as this reasonable uh, human guy is to undercut the, the argument the defense has said that they're going to make. Okay, let's watch uh, prosecution witness Donald Williams explain what he witnessed. First arriving the scene, Mr. Floyd was vocalizing his uh, his sorriness and his pain and his uh, distress that he was going through. Um, the more that his the knee was blockly uh, on his neck uh, and shimmies were going on, the more you seen Floyd fade away and slowly fade away and like the fish in the bag, you seen his eyes slowly, you know, pale out and again, slowly roll to the back of his eyes. And he, um, so this is what I seen, this is what I heard and that's how, you know, what it was. Like he was going to distress because of the knee and he vocalized it that I can't breathe, I need to get up and I'm sorry. And his eyes slowly rolled to the back of his head. You seen the blood coming out of his nose. You heard him tell him, tell him before he stopped speaking that my stomach hurts and those most of the time is the last bowel movement of your life. So from there on, he was lifeless. He didn't move, he didn't speak. He didn't have no life in him, no more on his body movements. All right, Mary Beth Albright is back with us. Mary Beth, I want you to continue what you were telling us before we knew we were uh, gaveling out for the day. Uh, you were talking about your takeaways from uh, Mr. Williams, that last witness today. Sure, thanks, Rhonda. You know, I, I was just marveling over, the, as we talked about earlier um, in the show, you don't choose to witness an alleged crime, right? The fact that this person who has, who trains according to his sworn testimony from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day at a gym there in the kinds of tech, techniques um, like blood choke or uh, like choke holds, I mean, that is extraordinary because this person is allowed to get on the stand and talk about what he knows and what he knows in terms of what he experienced when he saw George Floyd uh, and, and Derek Chauvin. And, you know, tomorrow we're, we'll hear the, uh, the defense attorneys um, cross-examining him, and I'm sure that they will go over his, his expertise and whether he actually knows a, a different chokeholds and that kind of thing. But for right now, you know, if you think about this is day one, and if you think about this is what the jury is going home with today. Um, this is what they're thinking about all night, right? This last testimony of Donald Williams, um, it, 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 it's an interesting place to end a, a day one of a trial. Yeah, that's a, a great thought that the jury is going home with this uh, last witness's testimony about um, the shimmying technique, about closing off the air passages. And uh, as we heard from uh, the judge, Peter Cahill, he told them, you know, don't talk to anybody, don't listen to the news overnight, and be back here tomorrow morning. Um, Eugene, I'd like to bring you in on this. So this last witness, um, he seemed uh, visibly upset, or at least going back through that day uh, and some of the upsetting points. Um, did that stand out to you at all, especially when he talked about Officer Tao, I believe, telling him this is what drugs will do to you? Yeah, I imagine uh, it was very frustrating for him for a few reasons. One, as you noted before, he actually seems to know what he's talking about quite a bit. 
And if you look back at the video, there were moments where it was uh, clear that the officers heard him, uh, but maybe were staring him down or uh, perhaps trying to send him the message that uh, ultimately they were going to do whatever they wanted to do. They were in control. And that was really frustrating and disappointing, obviously, for Donald, who uh, was seeing this situation happen that reminded him of so many different uh, but similar encounters uh, that he'd seen probably in uh, his neighborhoods or on the news um, or just throughout history involving law enforcement and, uh, you know, black men. Uh, it was really interesting also seeing um, them, the, the prosecutors tried to communicate uh, that this was someone uh, who was an established uh, citizen of his community. He wasn't just some violent uh, bystander who was causing trouble for law enforcement, which is one of the dominant narratives uh, that defenders of Blue Lives Matter, or should I say supporters of Blue Lives Matter, try to push against uh, those who critique police for uh, their interactions with uh, law enforcement. He established himself as a college alum and a father, um, a, a Minnesotan, as James would say, in terms of enjoying fishing, uh, also an athlete, uh, and just someone at, ultimately in this situation is a concerned citizen. Um, and his, his concern is what made him so angry. And you saw in this situation that he revisited that anger as he was having to recap the story. And Eugene, one of the things that stood out to me is that he, having a background of uh, being a security officer, said when he got there, he just hung out on uh, one portion of the sidewalk just to watch and observe, he said. And he also mentioned that there was a young kid who was there trying to perhaps rile up the crowd a little bit, and he told that child to go back inside to the store that's, that's mm. not going to help at this point. So mm. uh, to your point about how the prosecution wanted to humanize him, they also kind of brought out uh, that he was not there to be a rabble rouser or anything. He uh, was somebody that was uh, really, really deeply concerned right, uh, with what he was witnessing. Yeah, and I mean, you know, obviously as a security guard, he's not a police officer, but he's certainly within the space of public safety. And one of the main concerns and criticisms you have from him and other bystanders is that uh, George Floyd was not in threat in that moment, threatening any uh, anyone in the public's safety. Uh, everything that law enforcement needed um, uh, to keep him from doing, they were able to with the handcuffs. Uh, his argument, Donald's, is that that knee uh, was without question excessive, and that's why you heard the anger and the profanity in his voice, and the fear also, and the frustration, um, and the disappointment that this is something that um, he knew more about, but law enforcement was not uh, listening to him and giving him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get both of you on uh, something that I just read. Um, today over at the White House, there was a White House briefing with Jen Psaki, the president's uh, press secretary, and she was asked uh, what uh, Biden was thinking about with the George Floyd uh, trial, or the Chauvin trial, rather, and um, asked if he would be watching it and if he had even spoken to the family. And what she said was he'll be watching it closely and he'll certainly be provided updates. And she also went on to say that um, Congress does need to move forward with uh, some sort of reform. Um, and, and this highlights that reform is important. So uh, James, I know at the beginning of the day I asked this question, should Biden mention anything? Um, but Given that his press secretary is saying that he will be provided updates about this case, uh, is that striking in any way that the president will be briefed on uh, a local, essentially a local state case? Yeah, Rhonda, it is significant. And it is a reflection of the fact that uh, the Biden White House recognizes that this really could be a galvanizing moment. Uh, that, that this is a, a terrible tragedy. There is a, a man who has died. Uh, but, but as President Biden has said, George Floyd changed the world. That's what he told his daughter when he went to Houston uh, for the memorial service last year. And I, I think that, that the president does not want this tragedy to, to go to waste. He wants more than just justice for the Floyd family. He wants uh, actual overhaul of the law. Uh, as Eugene noted earlier, this is not currently a White House priority. Uh, you know, infrastructure is next on their list. Uh, they, they, they're even taking some criticism from uh, gun safety groups because they're not pushing for, for new gun laws. Uh, and, and so while criminal justice isn't high on the list, it's, I think the administration sees that it's important to show that they're taking this very seriously and that they do want to act. All right, let's go back to Minneapolis where political reporter Joyce Coe is standing by. 
Joyce, you've spoken to the Floyd family and heard them speak this morning. What is the message uh, as this trial is underway? That's right. The Floyd family was here just this morning and they had the message uh, of, of wanting justice. They are calling for justice in this case. And what justice looks like to the Floyd, Floyd family is a murder conviction of Derek Chauvin. We also spoke to um, Philonis uh, Floyd yesterday after the protest that took place here in downtown Minneapolis uh, about what his thoughts were uh, just before the um, opening arguments in this trial. And what he had to say was that he came here for a conviction and that he remains hopeful uh, for the best outcome in this case. One thing that has really um, stuck with me throughout the course of the day in watching this trial is something that George Floyd's other brother, Terrence Floyd, had to say uh, during that press conference this morning. He talked about um, a really personal recollection of watching that video that we had to see numerous times today in trial, that he had watched it over and over and over again to hear his brother, George's voice, um, one last time. He likened it to how people listen to a voicemail uh, of a loved one after they have passed so that they can hear the voice of their loved one lo one last time. And he said he listened to that video and watched that video not to re-traumatize himself, but to hear his voice, to remember his brother uh, as they continue this fight for justice. Uh, and he said that he listened to the last words as as his brother's neck was under the knee of Derek Chauvin and, and how his brother called out for his mom. And I think it just uh, emphasizes that, you know, although this this case and, and George Floyd's death has really gone on to influence communities across the country and really uh, ac across the wor world. Um, it, I think it really just highlighted that ultimately there is still a family that is grieving here uh, and that they are just asking for the outcome to be one that reflects the gravity of what happened that day. Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Joyce, you've also spoken to protesters around Minneapolis as well. What has been the tone there in the community? You know, I think some would call it this cautious optimism, but the people that I spoke to went even one step further. Um, they wouldn't call themselves optimistic of an outcome in this case. They are reluctant to even be hopeful that, uh, that Chauvin will be convicted. Um, of murder in this case and 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 you know sort of a, a battle within themselves to want to hold on to some hope uh, that they will see the outcome that they want uh, but understanding that there has been a history of that not happening in these types of cases so I, I would say that the tone has has more so been this sort of reluctance to be hopeful uh, we were talking to um, one uh, activist out here the other day who said that the difference now is that there has been an increased attention around this case with the, uh, you know, cameras in the courtroom and people are watching this. Uh, in addition to all of the protests that are happening, that it puts eyes on this trial. And, and she said that she hoped that that would increase uh, the outcome in, in their favor. And I also wanted to mention, you know, this is not uh, the group of protesters that we were with yesterday. And there will be another uh, protest here um, really any any moment now around five o'clock. But, uh, you know, this is not an abstract um, fight in any way. We, we were talking to uh, an activist yesterday. Uh, his name was Brendan uh, Tullock, and he said that he grew up in the same um, or he was living in the same neighborhood as Derek Chauvin when this uh, incident happened. And he also went to the same high school as Derek Chauvin. And he said, you know, he personalized it and said this could be this could have been me. Um, this, this, you know, I could have crossed paths with this person. And he really emphasized just how personal this is for him. He's, he went on to say that he wants to correct the wrongs that he sees um, that have come out of this. Uh, and so just to, you know, bring that home, that, that the people here in the city of Minneapolis, uh, not just the protesters, but those that are living in this city are really feeling, uh, you know, the personal weight of this trial. Rhonda? Thanks a lot for that, Joyce. Uh, Joyce Co. there in Minneapolis. Um, Eugene and James, we have a few minutes left, and I want to get your uh, last thoughts in. Uh, Eugene, we'll start with you. What were your takeaways from the day, and what will you uh, be looking for tomorrow? 
Well, it was notable today just how different uh, the individuals testifying were, that they came from uh, different uh, walks of life, different professional backgrounds, and uh, had different perspectives, but all concluded that what they saw uh, was concerning, uh, was in uh, need of attention, and, and should have been elevated even beyond uh, the community and the city that they are a part of, uh, which is why they try to get the message uh, forward uh, to other people that this was a topic that they believe is of high concern. Um, it'll be interesting to see what other uh, witnesses that are, are brought forward um, in support of the prosecutor's case, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what they will add to this conversation that we haven't already considered. And James, we have about less than a minute right now. Uh, what are you going to be looking for tomorrow? Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, for them to finish building the foundation of this trial, Rhonda, there was so much video. There is so much video. Uh, the, the cashier at the gas station, uh, the overhead surveillance camera that the 911 operator saw, uh, the video tomorrow we'll hear from the, the woman who recorded it. Uh, it, it. It is remarkable because, you know, if this happened 20 years ago, none of that video would exist and it would just be the word of the officers versus the word of these witnesses who were standing on the street. And it really has totally changed the dynamic. As the prosecutor said in his opening statement this afternoon, or I guess this morning, uh, you, you can believe what you see with your own eyes. And we're seeing with our own eyes uh, really a, a horrifying picture. Mm. Well, I want to thank my colleagues for their reporting and analysis today. I also want to thank you, our viewers. The trial resumes tomorrow. We are broadcasting gavel to gavel coverage, so you can find it on the Washington Post website and on our YouTube channel. I will also be back here for key moments in the trial with breaking news. Until then, good night. Sometimes you have to see to believe. Sometimes waiting isn't an option. When the news is breaking, watch with the newsroom of The Washington Post. We explain what's happening and why it matters. Thank you for choosing to watch the headlines as they're being written with our journalists. You can subscribe with a special offer, an entire year of The Washington Post for $29. Go to WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing through that link lets everyone here from the front lines to the control room know that you care about our continued efforts to inform the public protect the First Amendment, and foster a healthy democracy. We could not do this without you.